What is the diameter of your graph, Mukesh? All right, yes. All right. Mukesh, you use uh, the fiber tape also. Yeah, I'm using the fiber tape. Okay. Routinely you don't do it. Routinely you don't do it, na? No? Yeah, it's visible. Yeah, yeah clear. I think it's Can you clear the flow? Use your label item number if you just want to poke in, do not come in through the light source and you just palpate it to see whether there is any hidden ramp lesions or not. Is it visible or not? Yes. Okay. So this is a routine diagnostic uh, uh, yeah, routine uh, diagnostic uh, way I routinely search for it. Hmm. And nothing looks like it's all clear here in the middle compartment. Even the cartilage looks to be all right. That's the ACL complete thing. I have degraded the stump. And there you see a sorry, something going wrong. 
Can you press it a bit? Can you reduce the height of table a bit so that we get some? So you can see a small white white bucket and yes. tear on the lateral meniscus. Yes. This is not repairable. So I will, I will do a meniscectomy. So meniscectomy is not out. So I always try to cut the anterior horn, anterior part of the tear first. As you see there, just a sec, and then go in and cut the posterior half and then shave a place. So you just remove that piece, be careful near the root and just shave the edges so that you balance the meniscus. So that's the Lateral like meniscus after partial meniscectomy. Clear? Yeah. Can you just probe it and see? Yeah. Okay. This is the upper surface. That's the under surface. All right. All right. So now I will just show you the footprint of the ACL. Give me the probe and. Uh, if you see the table side footprint here, so this is the posterior aspect of the footprint, the stump. Yes. That's the anterior horn of lateral meniscus. That's the anterior horn of medial meniscus over there. So ACL on tibia is bigger anterior posteriorly and smaller medial laterally. So it's not circular. The same here is this is your you may say the bifurcate ridge and this is the whole area where your ACL is there. So what I do routinely, I make a trans patellar portal for this technique, a small disadvantage of this technique initially, later you may not need it. So use your routine number needle and take a sharp cut just below the inferior pole of the patella. Use your hemostat to just expand your portal. And then once I enter this, you can clearly see the footprint of femur, which is clearly defined now. So use your shovel. You can, if you are doing routine conventional, try to preserve the stump so that you know exactly where to enter in the footprint. Your trans patellar portal is now the young portal, yes. It's now my young portal for my femoral tunnel. So I use the offset guide here. I use 6 mm offset guides which goes and hooks on the posterior femur. Flex the knee and then the guard wire goes in. Your drill place, your second cortex. I always use offset guide so that there should not be a posterior blot. And as you see down through this transpatellar portal, you see there is enough bone posterior in it. Is it visible? Yeah, yeah. that is the advantage of being through the transpatellar portal. Transpatellar portal. Now I use a 4.5 mm, and as you see, I am quite away from my medial femoral cartilage, condyle cartilage. So now I draw it 4.5 and the assistant knows the far lateral cortex, so we judge the length of the tunnel through this step only, or else you can remove it, your drill place, and use your depth gauge to know the depth of the femoral tunnel. So here it's how much? 20, 25. Is the lateral cortex there? 30, 30. Yeah, going. So it's almost around 35. 35 is the total length. So now 
in routine circular tunnel anatomical single bundle we drill with the same size as the graph that is 8 which we got but here i am going to drill with 7 by 20 mm because i have to keep 20 mm graft in the femur so i keep about 22 drill because i want 2 millimeters adjustment area for final tightening in the adjustable loop so instead of 8 i will be drilling with 7 mm here because i have to convert that 8 mm graft into 7 by 9 so ritesh get 7 mm drill please what's the problem some issue with the drill it seems what's wrong what? Sir, uh, how much flexion do you keep? Uh, it's almost your... 110 to 100, 100, 110. Can you show the external view to them? Yes, we can see here. Huh. Sir, is it like, yes. I just want to ask uh, the other panelists, like they keep in the same position or they keep it yeah. more flexible? Yes, please go ahead. Normally, yes, we try 20, to keep it as much as possible. More flexion. Yeah, go, go up to 20. 15, go up to 20. I do it in supine position. So that is very easy for the assistant. Yes, yes, 22 only. Go a bit, a bit, a bit, a bit, a bit. What do you think, sir, what will make a difference while you do in the more flexion position? What is the difference between these? Yes, remove the head button. 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 You would like me to go on the posterior lateral aspect if you are a little less flexed. So now I just clear the mug. Okay, please go ahead. So it's a 7 millimeter tunnel you made. 7 millimeter tunnel. So now I'll show you. So even if you make 8 millimeter now, mm. give me the probe please. The footprint which is covered with this single bundle, see we are unable to cover this aspect of the footprint. Yes, sir. Or sometimes we are below and we are unable to cover the anterior medial or we are unable to cover anterior posterior lateral and we are in the middle. So with single bundle we mainly aim to have anterior medial bundle more compared to posterior lateral bundle. So now you see I have almost enough 2 to 3 mm bone posteriorly also. Now with my specially designed rectangular tunnel dilators, I will convert this 7 into 9 in this direction, superior inferior 9 and medial lateral it will be still 7. So I will try to get more tunnel in this part of the footprint so that we have more footprint coverage and more collagen to that. So if I want to show you, this is the kind of, can you show it? Are you able to see that? Oh, this is your dilator. Yeah, yeah just hold on. So this is a dilator, little long with a firm base so that you can mallet it well, uh, holder, so that you can hold it well. There are markings with 5 mm distance so that you know how much you want to go in. As, you, as I have shown you, I have drilled 22, the reason being, I will punch it with 20, some amount of bone gets stuck at the distal end of the tunnel. So if you drill 20, in, invariably will end with 17 or 18. So I have done it with till 22. And now I will start punching with the viewing total. Just a minute. With the viewing total, again, the trans Taylor total and the knee is flexed by the assistant. And as you see, I am able to see the posterior part there. And so this is your non-cannulated instrument. It's yeah. a non-cannulated. Right so I'm just holding it firmly and as you see, I'm trying to punch the interior aspect of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. Shall please go in. Tap. So it goes smoothly, 5 mm. Tap, tap, 10 mm. Just a minute. Go in. So that's the 15 mm. You have to really hold it firmly so that you don't go much posterior and damage the posterior cortex. Just hold on. Uh, go. Go, go, go. So it's up to 20. That's all. Come out. Come out. Come out. Uh, so you see the cortex is still intact and slowly that round shape will be converting into a rectangular round shape so the dilators are in 5 mm increment, 
सेवन बाय सेवन पॉइंट फाइव सेवन बाय एट सेवन बाय एट पॉइंट फाइव एंड सेवन बाय नाइन सो यू सी वी आर गेटिंग द टनल शिफ्टिंग मोर इंफीरियरली यस नाउ द नेक्स्ट डायलेटर इज सेवन बाय एट एम एम साइज प्लीज गो इन रितेश टैप फाइव टेन इनफ इनफ कम ऑफ कम ऑफ रितेश लिटिन जेंटल प्लीज द ओनली थिंग दैट आफ्टर एवरी पंच यू नीड टू शेव इट टू क्लियर द डेब्रीज एंड ऑल्सो टू से दैट यू आर नॉट वायलेटिंग द पोस्टर कॉटेक्स If you feel that you are in little danger zone, you can change the direction of it. See, the suction is not working. So, as you see now, so sequential dilatation is the key here. Huh. Seven by eight, six point five now. Seven by eight, we have done. Seven by eight point five, and then seven by nine. Let's sit. Flex the knee again, and then just go in. Yeah. So how do you decide? Okay. So one second. Vertical. One second. Yeah. yeah. Let's just stop. Yeah, please. Yeah. How do you decide about the vertical and horizontal diameter? So it will be nine by seven or eight by seven, depending. Because on see, this is the uh, bifurcate ridge. You can't come anterior to it. All right. You have to go no superior inferiorly only. so you can decide that on the footprint pre op you can intra op you can measure also right. with the help of your scale and then you can decide what kind of dilatation you need to do so yes you are doing go. only vertical dilatation yeah, yeah. only vertical All because right. anterior posterior is i don't have space there yeah got it ha huh. yeah. go one second i'm going tap 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 that's fine come out for a bit more yeah that's fine come out So it's 8.5, and last we go with 7 by 9 now. Artery, please. To dilate the portal again. Sorry. So there is no. Eight by seven by nine one. Chalo, please go in. Yeah, yeah. One second. Yeah, that five, ten, fifteen, and that's twenty. That's fine. Come out. Yeah. Shiver, please. So you see the. Uh, quite intact posteriorly there is no posterior canal blowout posterior tunnel blowout and then now you see the shape of the tunnel it has been converted to an oval tunnel covering more posterior lateral aspect of the footprint are you able to recognize that hello am i audible hello yes yes you yeah. are audible Oh, so can you uh, yeah, yeah. can uh, can you show this through the medial portal yeah this is through the posterior medial portal now so give me a probe please so now if i probe from trans patellar portal this is the bifurcate ridge all you right have to be below behind that and that's the residence you have to be below so you have to be in this quadrant of the femur for your acl tunnel so now this part has been much covered and we have converted it into a oval shape tunnel now you can see that yes and we have still and we have not done any posterior wall blowout or any lateral wall blowout so that's all about femoral tunnel now we go in and do the same on the tibial side tibial tunnel also you are planning a normal round tibial tunnel or a quadrangular no quadra angular tunnel only because the same punches can be used on both the sides so there are some papers in the literature where they have done the rectangular femoral tunnel to increase the footprint coverage but they have kept round on the tibial tunnel 
the reason in that article is not much properly been mentioned. So I feel the tibial footprint is much bigger than the femoral footprint for ACL. Yes. So here you see the bird's eye view for femoral tibial footprint. Is it visible? Clearly? Yes, yes, you can see. So I'll be using a footprint jig, which I'll keep it almost in the center. Okay? Yes. The angle of the jig is around 50, 55. And the guide wire will come between the patella tendon and the anterior half of the MCL, anterior border of MCL. So your assistant should make it clear that you are not damaging the anterior fibers of the MCL. So no medial tunnel will damage that. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. So you see the guide wire coming in. We'll remove it. Please. Oh, 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 right where came out, Ritesh. Come here, Anna. That's your. Please do it again. Or use the same thing. Give me an artery forceps to hold that guide wire now. Please put it again. Please put it again, the whole jig. Put the bullet in a proper place. Lock it there. Mm, go ahead. Go ahead. Same hole. Okay, please come, come, come in. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yes. It's little anterior, I think. Sir. You should give me artery forcep. So, Mukesh, you use always a footprint jig. No body. Uh, I usually use a tape hammer jib from yeah. Acufix. So, so, what are your landmarks for that? For the benefit so, of audience? If I'm using a tip hammer, I see the footprint and put my tip exactly in the center of the footprint. So as you see, is it acceptable? A bit anterior, I think. I think yes, you can do. Yeah, at this dilation. stage only, just extend your knee and check for impingement as well. There's nothing now? Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Okay. So we'll take this. I think it's little medially. So I'll use a 4.5 mm drill first. To do a little eccentric drilling, you see it's little medial yes, here. Yes, yes. And so I'll use a 4.5 mm drill. I won't change the guide wire, but I'll trick it there and do an eccentric rimming. Yes. So you can go for 2 mm anterior, posterior, medial. Yeah, I can shift it there. Yes. Okay, please go ahead. Okay, out. Leave it. And just come out. Okay, going, going, going a bit. Okay. Leave, leave, leave. Oh. So now I can shift it back a bit here. Sorry, hold, just hold on. Oh. Okay, fine. Now I'm shifting it a bit laterally. So it is going with eight. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we can use a needle holder as well. That has probably a better grip. Yeah, go in. Yeah. The wing got is a cup, sir. What did you tell? Yeah, out please. Uh, rather than uh, hemostat, uh -huh. rather than you can take the help of needle holder. Yeah, we can do that also. Uh -huh. so now I'll just clear the mouth here. So the whole anterior horn is intact now. So, anteriorly, we have made uh, the tunnel as much as any rope, please. So, this is the anterior half of the ACL, but still posteriorly, it's up to here. So we need to shift it little posterior. So, mediolateral is fine. There's no more space now. So, I'll convert this 8 into 8 by 10, because the graph size is 9 mm diameter. So, here, what we need to do, this probe, please. 
this so, part of the tibia is really very hard. So use your acromionizer or burr to clear it bit. Otherwise, with the help of punches, there are chances that you may microfracture in this area. So I'm using an acromionizer. Just a second. Let me clear the tibial entry point. Come on. Here is my channel, entry on the tibial side, anteromedial tibia, mop it, mop it. Can you zoom the camera a little? Zoom yeah. in. Camera please zoom in. I'm clearing the mouth at the entry level. so that I have a clear passage for my dilators to go in. Okay. Can you see that? Yes. Now I'll go in and use my acromionizer first to clear some bone on the posterior tibia, part of the tibial tunnel. Somehow that tunnel already looks rectangular to me. <laughs> <laughs> you can argue on that because there is always an obliquity. It's not a straight um, yeah, thing. It's, it's never right. perpendicular. So yeah, it's, it's never obliquity. perpendicular. So I'm just clearing bit amount of bone there. Now again, I'll come with 8 by 8.5. For the benefit of the audience, what is your graph size again? 9 mm diameter graph size. On both sides? Above it was 8. Okay. So here, come on Ritesh, tap in. Tap slowly, come in, come in, come in. Come in. Come in. Again, this is also non cannulated, yes? Yeah. yeah. Just a minute. That's one, hold it properly. Yeah. Just a minute. Okay. Apply the shaver, please, there. Okay. Make it straight a bit. We'll make an entry. Make an entry in the straight one. And just clear. Okay. Give me 8 by 8.5. Okay. You see that you don't keep it much vertical, otherwise you will damage your anterior cortex of the tibia. Yes. Just flex it now. Flex it. And check. Tap it. Yeah, please come in, come in, come in, come in, come in. Come in. Okay. Shall out. Give me shaver. Let me clear the neck. Okay. Now eight by nine. As you see, it's going to take out the bone from the posterior aspect. Yes, yes. Go in. One second. Just hold on. Huh? Go in. Go in. Yes. Hmm. Okay. Last. It's a sequential image. Yeah, uh, it's sequential dilation. here. Come on, go. Now it has been dilated as well. 
So now, as you see, the whole. Yes. So that is covering your anterior yeah, posterior. Yeah, and that's also. the femoral tunnel. So we use the same implants what we use for our routine ACL tunnel uh, fixation. Sorry. So now I'll pass my guide wire with a loop. Flex the knee, Darsha. Flex it. Okay. Pull it up, pull it up. Up, 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 yes. Please apply artery. Leave the leg. See the artery is holding both the wires. So I'll take it down from the anterior and the tibial tunnel now. Hold the artery, please. Ah. Now, hold the camera. So the graft is ready with the marking on it. So I am using tight rope here, adjustable loop. So the whole length of the tunnel we have is 35. Hold this graph. So I will be whole marking it to the 35 mm on the tight rope loop. And we have done up to 20 on the femoral side as we have good length of the graft. So I am marking it up to 20 on the femoral side. Now being a 8 mm graft, we have converted it 8 by 10 with the concept that being a soft tissue, it will squeeze from one side and it will expand from other side. So I will pull the fiber wire in. Okay. Just hold the graph properly and that's the way you see the, the medial portal, you can see actually the button flipping. So pull the graph, pull the button, that's the button going in and that's the mark we have reached. The button has flipped on the lateral cortex and that's our marking of the tunnel, 35 mm. So now we'll pull the graph in. and see the graft easily engages the tunnel. And uh, if you see, there is no mismatch. Just hold, just be stable, be stable. Don't move the knee. As you see, it's covering the whole tunnel. You can see this? Yes. So there is no graft tunnel mismatch as such. And the, you can see the posterior part of the graft will go laterally, forming a posterior lateral kind of bundle and the anterior half will go medially. So this will form more of an anterior medial bundle and the posterior part will form more of a posterior lateral bundle. Now we view from the anterior lateral portal. You can see that now? Yes. So it's covering the hole. Please extend the knee and there is no impingement at all. You can see this full extension. Yes. So that we have fixed on the femoral side have you changed it completely? Okay, just hold on. Just relax. Flex the knee, guys. So, pull the graft. If you want to pull. Final, light, little tight. Okay. So, that's complete in. Now, I'll use a screw on the tibial side. The size of the screw will be 10 mm screw. Because we have done it 8 by 10. Being a cantalus bone, only the initial entry of the screw is little tough. Ma'am, no, no, please, just give me some space. Retract it properly. Give me a guide wire. Let's see. Yeah, it goes. So I prefer to, you know, I am holding it tight with a posterior drawer. Screw please. Hold it in neutral rotation. Huh. 9 by 23 size screw. Sorry, sorry, 10 by 23. So posterior drawer and uh, pull the graph firmly.
the question, how to decide the length of this room? Yeah. Okay. I usually keep it 25 because the tibial tunnel is usually around 30, 35. And we all know that the healing of the graft is at the upper chest. So I want my screw to be 5 mm below the subcondyl bone at the entry level on the intra-articular. So I don't want it to be sitting next to the graft and we see it through our portal and we see it intra-articular. Just pull the graft somewhere and needs little pressure. As you see, it's going easily. Can you see that? Yes. So you don't have to use much pressure. It goes in easily and you will hear the crick crick sound also. Okay? Yes. There's the screw sitting there at the cortex. Out. And that's the anterior drawer, sorry, Lechman. Now we'll again have a look to our graft before we wind off. Just hold on. Hold on. Now we do final tightening by pulling onto the graft. Being adjustable look. See, it's now tightened up well. Yes. Give me an artery, sorry, no artery, probe please. Leave, 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 just leave it. So you can see the graft well taut and you can see it's covering the posterior lateral part of the bundle and that's the whole ACL. So you don't see any tunnel dilating, uh, sorry, graft tunnel mismatch here. And even on full extension, there is no impingement. Okay. Yes, excellent. So that's all about my rectangular ACL tunnel. Any queries? We yeah. are almost done. Dr. Jagat wants to ask. Uh, Mukesh. Yeah, sir. Uh, how do you ensure that the, your screw uh, doesn't uh, damage the graft? Any tips or tricks? Doesn't damage the graft in the TBL tunnel. When you, you are putting the screw, how you ensure that the guide wire is uh, uh, in the interface between the graft and the tunnel? No, I, as I, as you see, uh, the type, I put the screw posteriorly, yeah, so I pull yeah. the graft anteriorly. Yeah. However tight I keep, it spins sometimes. Yeah. But now if you see, there are ethibone threads in the tibial tunnel, which yeah. gives some protection to your graft. And a bio screws, they are known to be less damaged to the graft. So no yeah, metal screw in soft tissue, soft yeah, tissue yeah, graft. Yeah. You don't see the exit of the guide wire from posterior aspect intra-articularly? Uh, I don't think you need to see that see because that. you can feel it and it's a very so atraumatic guide wire. wire. It won't yeah. damage anything. Yeah, but it is uh, likely to go in the substance of the graph sometimes. It may happen. It may happen. I agree with you. For that, uh, you just need to pull the graph firmly and okay. see that uh, while putting the guide wire, you are flushed with the borders of the tunnel. Yes. Okay. You can feel the borders of the tunnel yes. while pushing. You have the that tactile feel. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Very nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. everyone. Thank you, Mukesh. I think now we will go to the thermal next session, Meniscus Preservation Session. Yeah, I'll be there in 10 minutes. So just before that, yeah. uh, thanks, Mukesh. Thanks, Navet Bhai. Please, please come back soon. I'll be there in 15 minutes. Yeah. So, uh, on behalf of uh, IAS and uh, Arthroscopy Society, Master, I welcome you all to this 360 degree knee restoration symposium. And uh, uh, we are having our IAS Hello. president, Dr. Tapaswi. Secretary Dr. Sundar here. It's a privilege to have them. We have Dr. Rajiv Raman here, Dr. Shriyas Gajar, and Dr. Sandeep Bidaras. Namit Bhai, may I interfere for a while? Yes, sure. I would like to thank Dr. Kole, sir, our anesthetist, for excellent work. My assistant, Ritesh, my fellows, Darshan, Atul, and uh, Prakhar, Dr. Neha, and Ninan for the excellent OT, and of course, Last but not the least, the whole staff of Grace Hospital. I am extremely thankful to all of you, including IS and ASN, for giving me opportunity to show the life cycle.
Great. Great. Thank you. Uh, so we uh, start the day with uh, a welcome note from uh, the founder of Arthroscopy Society of Nagpur, is Dr. Marwa, Marwa sir. Uh, he is in Canada, and uh, to introduce you to him, I would like Dr. Jagtap to do that. Good morning, everybody. Welcome, you all. Uh, it is a great uh, privilege to uh, tell you about uh, Dr. Sanjay Marwa, who uh, was the, the first person to start uh, arthroscopy in uh, Nagpur. After coming back from England in uh, 1991, he started his arthroscopy center in Nagpur. Then he went uh, uh, to Germany, got training there, and uh, again uh, uh, he was a very close friend of Dr. Alan Gokhi Ulam, arthroscopy there, and started his uh, arthroscopy and post medical clinic. Can you hear us, Dr. Marwa? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, barely, barely, but, but I can hear, can hear now. now. Can you hear, can me? hear me? Yes, sir, we can. Okay. okay. Good morning, good morning everyone. everyone. Hope you had a, you had a good, good breakfast. breakfast. I had I my had dinner an hour back, back, but, but uh, uh, the better, the better treat, treat was excellent demonstration, demonstration of... of uh, Arthroscopic reconstruction with rectangular femoral tunnel by, by our swave, Dr. Dr. Mukesh. Mukesh. Um, um, I'm, really I'm really happy, happy to, to be part, be part of, of this, this uh, workshop, workshop, which is which happening, happening in person, in person after after about two years. Two years and, and but unfortunately, but unfortunately I'm only a part, part in, in, in spirits. In spirits. And, uh, and, My father, My father always, always emphasized, emphasized on, on team building, team building because, because team, team, a proper, proper cohesive functioning, functioning team, team always, always gives, gives good academic, academic results, results, research, research is, better, is better, and, and positive, positive patient, patient outcome, outcome is, always is always better, better with, the with the team. team. I noticed and that, that in Canada, Canada also, also where, where uh, uh, team, team building, building and, and maintenance is uh, pretty uh, much the norm. With that, With that in that mind, mind, me and, and Satyajit formed this Arthroscopic Society of Nagpur many years, many years back, back. And, and, and I'm really I'm happy, happy to see, to see it, it, grow it grow with younger, younger and more dynamic, more dynamic person, person joining, joining and, and doing, doing great, great job, job and international and publications, publications and, and academic, academic excellence, excellence recognized, recognized in world, world as well as, as well in India. India. Another, Another example, example of, of good team, team was, was about two, about two decades, decades back, back in a, in a hall, hall full of, of orthopedic surgeons, including Dr. Dr. Katie, Katie Dolkia. They were dazzled by, by a couple of young surgeons. They had they a team going, going and, and their approach, approach to shoulder, shoulder problems, problem, pathologies, pathologies, diagnosis, clinical examination, examination and surgery and, and post-op post rehab. rehab Really, really was appreciated, was appreciated by, by all surgeons. surgeons. And, and I'm happy, happy to note, to note that, that one of the surgeons of, surgeon of that team, team is, is now president of the Indian Arthroscopy Society. Society. Uh, I'd, I'd like, like to, welcome to welcome Dr. 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 Sachin, Sachin Tapaswi to Nagpur, to Nagpur as, faculty. as faculty. Also, also Dr. Dr. Sundar Rajan, Rajan Secretary of IAS, Dr. Rajiv Raman, Raman, Raman from Kolkata, Dr. 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 Shea Kajar from Mumbai, and Dr. Sanjeev Birari from Mumbai. I welcome, I welcome them, all. them all. I also, I also welcome the, the effort, effort of the ASN, ASN to, to 
make this, make this uh, workshop, workshop possible. possible. And I and welcome, I welcome all, the all the delegates. And, and with that, with that my best, best wishes, wishes, let the let program, the program continue. continue further. further. Good, luck. Good luck. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your words of motivation. Uh, so we now start with the second session. Second session is on Minister's Preservation. For that, I call the chairpersons, Dr. Kundeep Deshpande, Dr. Ishan Bhusay, and Dr. Amol Patel. So we can start the second session, which is focused primarily on meniscus preservation. Uh, may I invite Nave? Start okay, so uh, my talk uh, is on managing bucket handle tears. So bucket handle tears are vertical or oblique longitudinal tears with an attached fragment displaced away from the periphery of the meniscus. Uh, they comprise about 8.2% of all meniscus tear patterns and some studies have suggested that there, there are 19.2% of ACL injuries have a bucket handle meniscus tear. So the clinical presentation is usually a young uh, guy who had a twisting injury and he complains of locking and when you uh, examine him, he has a restricted terminal extension. On the MRI, most signs are seen on the sedital view where you have an absent bow tie sign. You have a very the common which we see is a double PCL sign. Sometimes you can see a double ACL sign when the fragment is anterior. Sometimes you see a double delta sign. Sometimes you see a double anterior horn sign when the anterior part is flipped over. And on the coronal sections, uh, you can see a meniscal fragment. Uh, there are a couple of cases reported wherein they were treated conservatively, but that is kind of miraculous for me. So what do we do in surgery for bucket handle tear? We can either do a meniscus repair or we can do a partial meniscus tear. So now the world is changing over to meniscus repair uh, because uh, we all know that a partial meniscectomy, if you remove over 15 to 30 percent of the meniscus, the contact pressure increases by 350 percent. And the relative risk of developing osteoarthritis after a partial meniscectomy is 3.6 and after total meniscectomy is 7.1. But you need to be very careful. You need to know which meniscus needs to be repaired and which has to be uh, undergoing a partial meniscectomy. So, tears in the white white zone or the zone 3, they should undergo a partial meniscectomy because there is hardly any blood supply over there. So, a tear something like this and the one which Mukesh had in the morning. So, this is actually a, a bucket handle tear uh, in the third zone, the white white zone and you can see in the posterior part, in the remnant, there are some tears. So it is a complex kind of tear. I do not want to uh, repair something which does not have a good biology to heal. So such tears should undergo a partial meniscus. Now, uh, how late can you repair a bucket handle tear? So higher success rates have been demonstrated in meniscal tears repaired within six weeks of injury compared with late repair. Uh, and unsuccessful meniscus repair carries morbidity in the form of articular damage, tear extension, loose body and requirement for resurgery. So, and this study in 2010 KSST has showed that successful results were associated with younger age, so younger population, and this guy healed well, earlier repair, as we just noted, and with using the inside-out technique. And the increased success was also seen in meniscus repairs which were performed with ACL reconstruction. So if you have a concomitant ACL tear, the chances that the meniscus heals is more. So, for doing a meniscus repair in a bucket handle tear, you have uh, four ways of doing it. I have not included the fourth one, which is an open one. We don't do open meniscus repairs anymore. So, for the anterior part, you have the outside-in technique. For the middle part, you have the inside-out technique. And for the posterior part, you have the all-inside devices. So, this is our index case. It's uh, the right knee. 
So looking from the anterolateral portal, looking from the anteromedial portal, so you go inside, be very careful not to damage the bucket handle. So there's the ACL tear along with the bucket handle. So as soon as you see that, what I do is I just reduce it to the blunt end of a single rod and just keep it that way. I go ahead and do my ACL first. I, not the complete ACL, but just the femoral tunnel first. Then I come back again. I resubluxate that uh, meniscus. Try see what is the extent of it. Is it repairable or is it not repairable? If I know that I'm going to repair it, I start <coughs> rasping the edges, rasping the synovium to increase the biology for healing. I, uh, and then I use a shaver just to remove that one millimeter of debris, whatever is there. Be very careful with the shaver and go back, see the posterior exit, extent. Here you can see that <coughs> it's going up to the root there. And a very important tip is use uh, an all inside device, uh, uh, an inside out device for the middle uh, part first, so that you have a stay suture which allows the meniscus to be in place and not uh, come out or re subluxate into, into the notch. So I use these as stay sutures. So this is my repair. I use vertical sutures because they have higher initial fixation strength and pull out strength. So now two or three of these, when these are there, I know that my meniscus is not going to come inside again. So then I can deal with the posterior and the anterior one. And why you should do this? Because this is what happened to me once long back. This is, this is another patient has a bucket handle tear and instead of using the uh, inside out I use the <laughs> fix it again we managed it but this is not something which we don't want in our cases so if you have a uh, meniscus tear uh, which has a peripheral rim of about four to five millimeters, you can also use some other devices like this is the uh, Arthrix wiper, uh, which you can use. Uh, it's very cost effective. You just need to have a suture and it gives you a very robust fixation and it, you get a cinch uh, knot over there, just like that. And there. You can also use the knee scorpion or the uh, any other such devices in the same uh, in the same meniscus tears. So uh, you get a claw-like fixation or a horseshoe-like fixation. So on the right there is a knot which we have taken from the meniscus viper, and on the left is the arthritic scorpion. So now this is our index case again. We have done the inside out for the middle part. Now we start with the uh, fixation of the posterior part with the all inside devices. Uh, so you have to check your angles in which angle you want to come. You can change your portals if required. So now I've just changed my portal because the trajectory wasn't right. And you can see there is a longitudinal tear in the anterior part also. So there's two tears. So what I, what I do is I use the same uh, uh, device for fixing both the tears. The first bite goes through the capsule and the second bite goes anterior to the uh, second tear. And whichever device, whichever company device you use, it's okay. You need to know how to use it. How, and you should always reduce the tear in an anatomical position and then pull the, pull the sutures so that when it's done, you have an anatomical repair, just like that. And I'll show you what happens when you uh, just use the device without reducing the tear. So this is my first bite, same patient, portals changed. And again, that longitudinal tear, I'm repairing it with one device. But in this case, I did not reduce the meniscus with a probe or any such uh, instrument. And this is what happens, it just curls up. So what has happened is there is a gap formation in the inferior part. And what we need to do is this. So then what we can do is we can put devices on the inferior surface, which will reduce that gap. So this is the another device going inside. So that's the first trick, that's the second bite. And then you, when you just, <coughs> when you just pull traction on those sutures, that meniscus which had gone up, 
that gap form gap is reduced and your meniscus is anatomical again so after doing that you if you're happy with the posterior part you put more sutures uh, in the anterior part and the middle part so there should be a distance of about 3 to 4 mm between each suture so that it doesn't matter how many sutures you use because it depends on the uh, amount of tear you have and uh, so the, that's how you do a uh, repair of the bucket handle so my rehab is very straightforward uh, i start the range of motion from day 1 but it is restricted to 90 degrees for the first 4 weeks and then we go ahead with full range of motion and there's strict non weight bearing for 6 weeks thank you thank you navid we will have question after each at the end of session at the end of session all right so now we would like to invite dr s r sundarajan sir who is secretary of indian arthroscopy society also he will be talking on simplifying root repair good morning everyone at the outset i would uh, thank uh, nagpur arthroscopy society for uh, giving platform for ias con ias indian arthroscopy society to come over here and uh, share our knowledge with you with all other faculty and uh, i thank uh, dr mukesh for specifically for arranging yesterday jungle safari where we could see two tigers and enjoyed our trip most and um, i thank um, our uh, president and secretary of navad and sadhya sir for uh, arranging this uh, coordinating with mukesh and uh, coordinating with the uh, indian arthroscopy society and also i request all of you if you are not member of indian arthroscopy society please be a member just goes to the just go to the website of indian arthroscopy society just is an online just you can upload your certificate within a two weeks you will get your membership so we have a discount for your ias con registrations in sense fourth year after you are eligible to vote in the elections you can access around 400 350 teaching videos in the website along with all the webinars which were conducted last covid the almost hundreds of webinars are there so any subject you want learn some tips and tricks everything is available in indian arthroscopy society website so i request you all of you to be member of indian arthroscopy society if you are not okay okay with this um, i will start with uh, my talk is on meniscus uh, root tears we know that meniscus root tears uh, it's are uh, very very important if the root uh, if the root tear is not addressed it can cause increased peak contact pressure in the middle compartment and can lead to degenerative arthritis and uh, it can also can cause meniscal extrusion that also resulting in it impairs the hoop stress force transmission leading to accelerate the degenerative articular wear resulting in arthritis we know that, that the root tear is not addressed again it is almost like a subtotal meniscectomy so it, it is important that you recognize this condition when you treat any uh, uh, meniscal uh, pathology in your patients along with acl or without acl so root tear can be an acute or a chronic or a degenerative so acute tears often associated with anterior cruciate ligament and uh, multi ligament injuries most often there are lateral meniscus root tears and uh, we know that laparada classif classified these root tears into different types in that type 2 is the most common where you have a complete radial tear at the level of 3 mm and 6 mm which we see most often in our day to day uh, practice so sometimes you can have a bony avulsions or you can have that other uh, tear which were described here this is the acl tear patient is a young patient sorry young patient you can have that uh, uh, lateral meniscus root tear so this is very common scenario which you see in acl patients so there is a controversy whether to do a repair of the lateral meniscus root along with the acl which was which can be debated because you have the menisco uh, capsular attachment for this lateral meniscus so this will be an unstable can result in anterior more anterior translation which is mechanical study has shown so in the young patients this kind of uh, displaced lateral roots better to be addressed and repaired to restore the anatomy Uh, you uh, repair this uh, uh, condition as like a, you are in a chronic condition where you do a medial meniscus root repair 
you can any acl jig can be used to address that close to the root attachment you make that entry point through the tibial side to make a drill hole and you take this any anti grade device take your bites you can use your lasso also you can come through the posteromedial portal also or you can go directly through the lateral portal take this um, um, anti grade device bites you can use this uh, number 2 fiber wire or you can use any suture tapes for its uh, uh, purchase then you take through the your tibial uh, hold and you attach with your uh, uh, endo button in the tibial side like this so this is a common scenario which you see in acute cases that not much, not much controversy and repairing that roots are also not very difficult uh, sometimes rarely you see the bony avulsions this is the one of the case with the pcl tear with the bony avulsion again you can have the same kind of like type 2 this is the type 5 of the labradae you acquire a repair of these cases. When you come to the degenerative condition, the chronic, this is the one most debatable whether to do a repair or not. So these conditions usually present in a middle-aged females, usually they're present with the sudden onset of pain, with the travel trauma, sometimes even with the trauma, and these patients should not have any pre-existing pain. Then that means these patients have an uh, uh, root tear, which is uh, causing the symptomatic. When you do an MRI, these are the coronal view which shows the classical uh, root avulsion which you see here like this. Or you can see that the sagittal view, you see the ghost sign where the absence of this meniscus, which is a classical of your medial meniscus root tear. And also you see the extrusions, but extrusions can happen even with the root intact, so we should not uh, take it as a diagnostic point, but there is another point which can give you a clue. So when you do treat conservatively, conservatively when you identify a root tear, so any patient comes with pre-existing pain, with the sudden onset of pain, but these patients have pain for two years, three years before that, then that patient may have an acute degenerative, I mean more degenerative changes. And also if the patient had a multiple comorbidities and not fit for surgery, or in a very old age, 75, 8 years old patients, very advanced age, you can treat conservatively. So when you treat this root repair, Whenever it's a symptomatic root redress, which I say that it's a sudden onset of the pain in the middle-aged females with no significant pre-existing arthritis or no significant virus, then root repair alone can do good for these patients. So you have a different type of repair which we can do. The one is the most commonly done is the transiesal suture repair with a single tunnel or two tunnel which you can do it. You can do a suture anchor repair also, especially when you are dealing with multi-ligament situations with the ACL or a PCL with the uh, repairs where you are worried about the tunnel collision, then suture repair technique can help you well. In the very degenerative conditions, there are uh, uh, reports of gracefully autographed reconstruction with the root, which I have not done. This is a typical 53 years old female patient presented with the pain in for three months time when she started pain while getting up from the floor and this patient had no significant virus and this can see that that is a coronal axial view shows that complete root, oval, uh, root tear, complete radial tear. So this is the intraoperative view. You can see the cartilage is very good, not even a grade one or two. Up to grade two are ideal for these patients. If it goes more grade three or four, better not to touch it. So these are the cases which you do the uh, root repair most often. So the pie crusting is one of the um, uh, gifted uh, technique for us now to open up the medial joint space so that you don't do any cuffing or damage to the cartilage. Then this is how it's open up, as you see in the second video. And then you prepare the bed by removing the cartilage for the have a, to have a better biology and allow the uh, meniscus to heal with the bone so that you will get a good healing at the end. You make a tibial tunnel, as I discussed, like lateral meniscus, you do the same with the anti grade device with the take two bites. Here I'm using the suture tape, then you shuttle through your uh, tibial tunnel. Uh, there are many ways you can take directly through the 4 mm tunnel or you can use the 2.7, you can use the shuttling technique for uh, removing that, then that you do the complete repair. Again, the controversies in the root repair is, does it heal or can extrusion can be halted is the question in all of us mind, especially when you are treating with a degenerative condition in a 45 or 50 years old female patients. And this is our paper which published uh, in Archives of Orthopedic and Trauma Surgery last year where we could analyze uh, that uh, factors which is affecting the root repair. And uh, we could assess from 54 patients after excluding the uh, uh, exclusion criteria. And the mean average age was around 48.5 years and majority were females. You can see around 90% all female patients. 
and uh, what we could see is a patient who have got less than 50 years if the varus angle is less than 2.5 degree and low icrs grade had a significant correction of the extrusion and also they have a better post op scores in the less than 50 years age group this is one of the example of showing this healed meniscus we had this is the mri study we did on all, for all the patients and we could get the good correction that patient is the less than 50 years old this is the same same kind of patients but he had a healed meniscus but he had an increased extrusion in a older patients so it's very difficult to correlate this healing and again extrusion so we could see that in the out of 54 patients 34 patients had a good correction of the extrusion and 20 patients there was no correction and in some cases there was more extrusions too so this is the age of uh, this is a patient with a 42 years old female patient is a root tear on the right knee which you see can see here he had a 3 years old this patient presented to me again for the pain on the opposite side opposite side for the same with the root tear so this i had an opportunity to just put a scope on the yeah, the side which was I operated, which had a significant variance at that time, I didn't do even osteotomy, did a just microfracture. So that was the healing of the microfracture of that same patient. And also I could see that uh, root has healed well. Of course, I don't put arthroscopy or second look arthroscopy for all the patients because this patient had come for the other's opposite side. I could see the, uh, there is a good healing of the microfracture. At the same time, I could see the uh, healing of the uh, root. So the, even with the significant virus, there is a possibility that the root test can heal, that microfractures can also help. Even this patient had almost grade 3 to 4, but opposite side was a grade 1 to 2. So still they have a chances of healing. So we should give a chance for them to have a repair before do a total knee arthroplasty. So to conclude, acute root tears, of course, yes, we can do a root repairs in all the lateral meniscus with the ACL or the multiligament injuries or with the PCL. In chronic cases, most of them, they are degenerative, degenerative conditions. So you have to be careful that that choose the patients that are younger than 50 years, low uh, uh, low grade cartilage damages like ICRS one or two. If alignment is less than 2.5 degree, virus have a better here. Uh, we have a, a stars of international faculty to covering all the field of knee, shoulder, and all the small joints like ankle, wrist, elbow, and hip. We have a faculty for all the separate uh, joints. Uh, make sure that if you have some work to sub to be submitted, please submit. We have a May 30th is the last date, but we may extend for another 15 days. So if still you have a time to submit your arthroscopic work, there are five medals to be won for each subspecialty, like knee, shoulder, and small joints, and best video technique and everything. And there are a lot of fellowships offered for this if you are getting that. So I welcome you all for Quaim Tour in September 15, 16, 17 in Hotel Lee Median. And also, you'll be experienced to see you'll be experienced to see that all the basic surgeries of uh, knee, shoulder, and small joints with more than 25 life surgeries, and you have a master classes for the beginners, and you have a good entertainment program from Temple Arts on the first day, and some other enter entertainment program on the second day. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the nice talk. Uh, may I invite Dr. Anshu Shekhar from Raipur? He would be speaking on ramp. A uh, very good morning to all the delegates and a big thank you to uh, Dr. Mukesh Ladda, Dr. Naved and Dr. Jagtap for inviting me and giving me this opportunity. So I will be talking about uh, solving the ramp uh, mystery. Now ramp lesions are something which uh, we don't know a lot about and which tends to scare uh, arthroscopy surgeons, especially who are not very proficient with uh, repairing the menisci. So solving any mystery involves understanding, you know, the what, where, who, why and the when. We will uh, understand sequentially what the ramp lesion is all about. So a ramp has been defined by Jorge Chala and De Filipino's group as a longitudinal vertical tear, which affects the peripheral meniscus in the meniscal capsular area less than two centimeters in length, and it typically affects the menisco capsular and menisco tibial ligaments. So when we look at it from the back, we see a separation at the menisco capsular junction. And when seen from the posteromedial portal, it is even better appreciated. So where does a ramp occur basically? A ramp occurs in the meniscocapsular ligament, which is the superior connection of the posterior horn of the medial meniscus with the capsule, and the meniscotibial ligament, which is the inferior connection of the posterior horn of the medial meniscus 
Now, both these structures are very closely related to the semitendinosus uh, attachment, and which is the uh, and which is why uh, this area is especially prone for tears. Now, uh, the Santi group from France has described meniscal tears into five groups. The type one tear is the menisco capsular tear, which is a superiorly based tear. The type two tear is basically a peripheral meniscus uh, tear, which does not necessarily uh, involve the menisco capsular ligament, but does cause functional a uh, loss of that structure a type 3 tear is an inferior based tear uh, this is uh, typically what is known as the hidden lesion now this classification was uh, later modified by grave et al again from france where they described the disruption only of the menisco tibial ligament and not the meniscal body per se a type 4 tear is again a peripheral uh, peripheral tear of the posterior meniscus a 4b again described by grave et al is basically complete disruption superiorly of the menisco capsular and inferiorly of the menisco tibial ligaments and a type 5 tear is what is uh, more commonly called as a double bucket so there is disruption not just of the menisco capsular junction and the menisco tibial junction but also a tear of the meniscus body more anterior to it now uh, just this year the same santi group has again published their study which involves almost 200 uh, 2000 acls and they found that of the all the la ramp lesions that they inquired, almost half of them, 47.9% were type 1 tears. Almost a third of them, that is uh, complete disruption of the menisco tibial and menisco capsular junctions were seen. And the menisco tibial, which is the typical hidden lesion, inferior based tear, was seen in just about 11.4% patients. So now once we've understood what it is, we have to know who is at risk of developing a meniscus ramp lesion. The most single most significant predictor of developing a ramp lesion is a patient who has a steep medial meniscus and a steep medial meniscus slope. So this is an anatomic factor which is non-modifiable. These patients, when they do have an ACL tear, they are highly likely to end up with a, a ramp lesion also. Chronic ACL tears, again, repeated episodes of instability causing traction on the semimembranosus attachment, which lies in close relationship to the ramp area, can cause a tear. Bone marrow edema in the postromedial tibia. We are so uh, obsessed about looking at bone marrow edema in the postrolateral tibia seen with uh, ACL tears, but it is the postromedial tibia which is a greater predictor of ramp lesions. Male gender and age less than 30 years. Again, these are not significant predictors, but they are important ones. And presence of concomitant lateral meniscus tears. So these patients, and this data is from a recent meta-analysis, these group of patients are at very high risk of developing a meniscus ramp lesion. So why should we be talking about it and why should we be talking about repairing the ramp lesions? There is phenomenal amount of biomechanical and biological evidence now. Biomechanically, we know for almost like four or five years now that ramp lesions are especially important for controlling pivot laxity. So an ACL reconstruction with, uh, in the presence of a ramp lesion can restore anteroposterior and rotary laxity, but not the anterolateral rotary instability. That can be restored only if the ramp lesion is repaired. That is myomechanical data. Now more recently, just this year, uh, this another study has, uh, which studied two years outcomes of patients in whom ACL with ramp lesions and ramp lesions not repaired as to what was happening at the end of the two years, MRI wise. So they found on cartilage mapping that the cartilage degeneration of the medial compartment, both on the femur and the tibia had progressed in patients in whom the ramp were not treated. Now why, uh, when should you look for ramp lesions? Always, but especially in patients who have high grade pivot shifts and when the MRI suggests a tear. So that is the area, that is the triangular area where you should drive your scope in, go at the back and always try to probe the meniscus. Probing is best performed when associated with a performance of a MCL pie crusting. That gives you enough space to uh, drive the meniscus anteriorly and check for it. How do we diagnose ramp tears? Well, MRI is a good tool, not a great tool. Presence of fluid signals in the posterior peripheral area of the meniscus on PD fat sat images and axial sections are highly predictive. But we have to understand that the MRI is a very specific tool. It is not very sensitive at all. Sensitivity of just about 70%, which means 30% of the times it is missed on MRIs. 
if you have access to a three tesla mri and you do subject a patient to an mri always try to get this done irregularity of the posterior margins and fluid filling are the most important predictors on the mri now how do we repair these tears uh, this is again from uh, the santi group we can go posterior to anterior anterior to posterior now when we look at these three basic types of tears the menisco capsular disruption the menisco tibial and the combined disruptions the menisco capsular superior base disruption uh, disruptions are better repaired from the back the hidden lesions the inferior base menisco tibial separations are better repaired from the front because it becomes difficult uh, repairing them from the back you most of the times cannot see them but the complete disruptions invariably require a combined approach to repair the menisco capsular uh, repairs from the posterior and the menisco tibial repair from the anterior using all inside devices so that is uh, the video of a posterior uh, repair that that's a menisco capsular and menisco tibial disruption you put in a needle probe then go ahead by an outside in technique perform a postero middle portal then you bring in these uh, suture passage hook devices a 25 degree hook device is most preferred you can go in from the meniscus to the capsule or from the capsule to the meniscus get your chia wire your passing suture out so this is a single portal technique wherein the chia wire is then drawn anteriorly this entire visualization is from the trans notch view then you pass in a high strength suture and a fiber wire or ultra braid make sure that both the suture loops are then retrieved from the same portal at the back so that there is no uh, fat tissue and then you can use whatever technique you prefer for performing sliding knots and then a couple of half hitches after that and you see the entire menisco capsular junction which had fallen down gets raised up and repaired now this is again a type 5 this is a type 4 tear there is complete disruption seen from the front this can be repaired uh at times using the all inside devices from the front itself the first device should deploy on the capsular junction the second device should deploy on the meniscus body and similar on the inferior side the first device deploys outside the menisco tibial ligament the second one on the meniscus body so inferior and superior sutures and the repair gets completed so the mystery uh, basically is sort of solved as of today we we should know that always drive the scope behind the medial femoral combine uh, uh, condyle to look for the ramp lesion always probe with the needle from behind when in doubt always repair if you encounter these tears because we know the biological consequence now is not good even if they appear stable uh, to you uh, while probing always when you are trying to probe from anterior or try to repo, repair from anterior you have opportunity to invite all of you to the pune knee course which is uh, happening in a few weeks time please register and participate and we'll see uh, a great um, ramp repairs uh, being performed there as well and then after 6 weeks after that we have the ias con please register and participate thank you thank you anshu uh, the session is now open for discussion may i invite all the three speakers on the dais please dr sundar rajan sir navid anshu any question from floor on repairing the bucket handle tear for dr navid yes sachin sir yeah uh, navid excellent talk on bucket handle repairs in your opinion what would be the time zone after which you should not repair a bucket handle tear one second question is that when you repair a bucket handle tear many a times when the tissue is uh, of Uh, you know at the level of the tear is of not good quality we tend to debride that tissue and while debriding we feel that there are additional tears like a double bucket which anshu showed in his presentation what is your strategy do you include both the buckets or you trim out the inner margin and only repair the periphery so your uh, first question uh, was how late would you uh, repair a bucket so there are studies which i showed that 6 uh, weeks is the time uh, after which they would say that the chances of healing start reducing but i have had uh, instances of uh, doing them at 2 months as well uh, you have to say overall 
and uh, you have to see how reducible is it is and how uh, stout or it becomes knobby you know the tissue becomes knobby and is it reducible so all those things but yeah six weeks to two months i've done them and they've healed well so that is my experience and the second question is uh, if uh, there are two longitudinal tears so if that longitudinal tear is the the first one is in the second zone and the uh, the second one is in the peripheral zone then i would try and repair it in a athlete and again a patient profile is very important but if it is in the white white zone i would definitely uh, debride it thank you anshu a question for you when would you not repair ramp mukesh here when would you not repair a ramp uh maybe a type 1 tear which is you know just like on needling there is some amount of uh, disruption seen but you are really not sure that it is still a tear maybe that is the only time i would not repair and it if it's a uh, complete in the capsular zone say about 1 cm definitely repair it? repair it because it's complete vascular area is there a chance to heal it still repair it because uh, like i quoted in my study there was so similar patients were not treated some similar ramp lesions were uh, left but untreated but at the end of 2 years cartilage changes in the medial compartment was seen have so, they seen the size of the lesions anything in that they have ramp? they have done a cartilage mapping because no, see again M- the mri the length of the ramp lesion tear what mm, i mean to say no, if no. it's less than 1 cm or more than a cm so uh, it depends on the stability one mm-hmm. but stability is something which is very subjective you know for example inferiorly based tears if you don't perform a pike crusting and you try to probe you feel that they are stable enough the moment you perform a pike crusting and probe they come all the way anterior so it also depends on whether you really inclined to repair it if you don't want to repair it you feel that nahi <laughs> nahi it's stable so <laughs> i totally agree yeah but Anything? always repair yeah. so do you want to add something to it no as I, as i said that most of the st- stable stability of the ramp is the most important in my opinion so i do try to pull the you are depending upon the size of the lesion mm-hmm. so i try to put a probe do a pike crusting put the probe in the back of the meniscus try to pull if it doesn't move i don't do a repair because literature also has shown that the, the table stable repairs without doing any repair of that particular uh, uh, lesions stable with uh, stable tears yes gives almost equal results of the uh, 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 without tear that i mean un- without the ins- without instability all the stable stable tears has given a very good result with completed conservatively without doing any repair but there is no randomized study to show how many cases i mean with between the stability stable and unstable repairs we don't have studies so far what we are also doing study but as i said that all the stable repairs we don't do repair just you put a probe and see if there is any mobility of the meniscus if there is no mobility depending even it is a 2 cm extension of the uh, ramp i don't do repair okay. and regarding the first question like sachin like uh, yes, i think as yes, i says that 2 months is the uh, limit which we are done so we are done up to 6 months 8 months 9 months duration of the bicranial tear if it is in a menisco capsular junction or the red red zone The, the, the meniscus quality is very good in a younger patients we counsel the patients of course as i uh, ramit said that definitely the healing and so said uh, ramit said that the healing potential is going to come down it depends upon the chronicity of the lesion actually we explained that you do a 70% chance of healing or 80% chance of healing if there is it's in a meniscus capsular junction or a red red zone if the meniscus quality is good which is reducible we know that quality you know when it is an irreducible or a rolled out meniscus that definitely we don't do a repair we just do a meniscectomy to add to that point so you will put more number of sutures if it's chronic it is it, it's not like that it is not like you know it's not going to make a huge difference but of course the stability wise it is going to improve it naturally you take care that you do a lot of inside out and both up superior surface and inferior surface especially when back and i mean acute back and handle tear you just you in a first stage i have reduced some meniscus back from the back and handle to the stable position mm-hmm. you stabilize with external fixator like a kd4 mm. when you come back and operate after two months or two and a half months the considering the swelling and this thing i have not repaired that meniscus also but they all, i had seen i had some videos of that meniscus heal very nicely so if the stability is good in acute situation they have a very potential especially lateral meniscus heals very nicely like in a chronic uh, in the medial side we know that healing is little bit less than the lateral meniscus naturally i will add a uh, more sutures but uh, not like 30 40 like that but uh, you know like at least a 5 mm gap 
each suture between at least 5 mm gap should be there. So I, I don't strangle the meniscus too much, but I add more stability for the chronic meniscus. Same the double bacterial tear we don't see very often in acute situation. So that is because Same. happens because of the repeated instability. The patient comes with late, so mostly they will be very chronic. I, I have not repaired many double double bacterial uh, tears, but some sometimes as Sachin said, we see sometimes the second bacterial tear. There usually it'll be very small thin layer. No. The in, inner one will be between the red white zone. So then on that case we can take a chance and do a repair. My question to Dr. Sundar. In case of chronic uh, root tear with extrusion of the meniscus, what's your stand? Would you prefer to put a centralization uh, reduction sutures, trans to reduce the meniscus, extruded meniscus, and then repair or like only you go with repair of the root? Uh, really, because it's very difficult to say because centralization itself is very controversy because they say that because you do your centralization, you are reducing the mobility of the meniscus. Yeah. So that is a that is a debating uh, question, uh, but I had done some centralization for a younger patients like a ACL patients. We know that sometimes in chronic recurrent instability they can have a medial meniscus root tear. Yeah. So you know that acute ACLs are al always commonly associated with the lateral meniscus root tear. Okay. But when the patient comes in a chronic conditions with repeated instability, they can have a medial meniscus root tear with extrusion. So on that patients considering the age. I take, a, I take a consideration of centralization. So I do a repair, I do a centralization. Okay. Regarding your first question for the chronic conditions, always it's debatable. I am also, I'm doing a randomized study on the centralization with centralization without centralization. Hopefully maybe in another two years I can get results. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I would like all the three faculty to come here because we will have case-based discussion now. So we'll invite Dr. Tapaswi, Dr. Sandeep, Dr. Sundar, Dr. Naved, Anshu, everyone to be there on the sofa for as a panelist for case-based discussion. Oh. So, first case will be presented by Dr. Satyajit Jaktap, sir. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is slightly not uh, related, I mean, not meniscal injury, but related to and very close to meniscus. Uh, as you can see, uh, this is a 14 year male, has pain swelling uh, following trauma and uh, a positive Latchman test. As you can all see, this is a, a TBL sided ACL avulsion injury. So, uh, I, I think no one would disagree that it requires fixation, it is a grossly displaced one and the goal of uh, treatment would be like uh, you go for anatomical reduction, rigid fixation and uh, to eliminate any extension block or impingement that can happen with, the, with, with this bony displaced fragments. So, uh, my question to the faculties is, uh, how do you go about uh, managing such case in a skeletally immature fellow? Dr. Sundar, please. So, we, so we, I, I do the suture pull-out technique. Sometimes yeah. I use uh, staples. Um, I have the, the threaded staple which I have used uh, uh, for, I mean, before the suture pull out technique, um, I used to use the staple which was, that paper also published in, in uh, IOA journal long back, around 8, 10 years before. So mostly I try to use that staple so it doesn't cross the physis. Okay. So most of the, uh, all the immature child, I used to use the staple now. I stopped using staples for the adult patients because a lot of lot of backouts because you know that because it's a metaphyseal bone the staple yeah. can back out sometimes yeah. especially in a comminuted ACL avulsion fractures so I stopped using for the adult but in younger chaps uh, young ch like like a 14 years 15 years in adolescence uh, uh, the physis is still is there intact I use a staple still now or you do pull out now you go for pull out 
Now you, I'm still I'm using staple. You are using staple. So there cases. is a need to remove those staples. I don't remove it unless okay. it's a back out. It has backed out. In adult cases, I had done back out. Uh, removal of the staple because of the back out. Yeah. That's why I stopped using in uh, adult okay. patient okay. because most often they are all comminuted fracture. So the yeah. hold may not be good. Sometimes when we put it, it looks good. But you yeah. see after four months, one screw may have backed out. Yeah. So in that cases, I had removed that uh, screw, so I stopped it. But in, in pediatric cases, I never seen any comminuted fracture. Usually it will be a simple, uh, single yeah. bony avulsion. Yeah. So, so far I'm using a staple. Yeah, anything different? Uh, so for uh, this 14 year old child, yeah. maybe I would not do two tunnels. I would do a single tunnel. Uh, stay as center as possible, as vertical as possible. And then take also uh, sutures through the intermeniscal ligament. Okay. Pass it deep without okay. tunneling and then okay. use it uh, and tie it to a suture post. That is okay. like an additional fixation. In the metaphysis, yes. lower down. Okay. Navid, please. So, so at 14 years, I would not be very uh, unhappy to drill two tunnels. Uh, okay. And I'll just okay. keep the angle uh, a lot more so that the uh, amount of uh, uh, tunnel uh, diameter is uh, more circular rather than oval. And uh, for the beaking, what I do is I, I take a bite uh, of a fiber tape and use a lateral row anchor okay. on the anterior aspect and okay. put it into the metaphysis. So okay. That okay. helps with the uh, using the anterior beak, beak, as well. beak as well. And the tunnel you create is 4.5 or? So I, I just uh, use the guide wire and yeah. then I use a spinal needle. Spinal needle. Number. Yeah, so that that reduces, reduces the, the size of the tunnel. Right. It's uh, around 2 mm. Sachin, please. So I think it all depends upon the tanner stage. If it is tanner stage 5, okay. then obviously a lot of us, if there was a mid-substance rupture of the ACL, we would do a standard ACL reconstruction. Yeah. So if it is, if the if the maturity, skeletal maturity is tanner stage 5, I would just put a simple single screw and finish it off. Single screw. And if it is a little bit less for that matter, if if you younger, have a and there is, open 5 There is growth left. If yeah. stage 3 is 3 or 4. Yeah. This young boy, 10, 11, 12, in those cases, I'll do two tunnels and pull out switcher. And tunnel size is? Tunnel size four, is 3.5. 3. Okay. Yes. Sandeep? Uh, minimum two tunnels, but only with the bead pin. I use okay, the same okay, bead so pin, make it ultra, uh, and shuttle the ethylon. So two minimum. So there is a... Yeah. Add one or two more. Okay. Dr. Rajiv? Yes, uh, I think in 14 so, years, the second growth has, part, has already occurred. So occurred. I will go for transosseous suture repair technique with two tunnels. So uh, I think the all, most of the faculties agree with the pull-out uh, suture uh, technique that gives uh, uh, that may not damage the physis uh, uh, in a uh, more way or a little bit centralized physial damage. So there is no angular deformity in the end. Uh, uh, what I would like to present is uh, my technique of doing an all inside ACL avulsion repair where you need not do a uh, not a single tunnel through the physis. So for that uh, what you need is a few uh, shoulder uh, implants and instruments, a double row uh, sort of method. These are the lateral row knotless anchor, one uh, 5 mm uh, anchor, passport cannula and suture sh shuttle devices. I will uh, play a very uh, short video. This technique is already accepted in arthroscopy technique. And uh, it is published last year. So uh, uh, we start with uh, probing of the ACL avulsion to see whether there is some combination or not. Once you have uh, confirmed that uh, it is a single or multiple pieces, you uh, clear the crater and put a double loaded anchor either titanium or uh, uh, peak anchor in the posterior part 5 mm and uh, pull out all the four threads and then shuttle these threads from posterior to anterior from the base of the ACL stump very close to the ACL fragment. You can use this uh, self retrieving uh, shuttle or a lasso and you drive all the four threads from posterior to anterior. You can tie uh, two central threads here, but uh, modification is we are not, now not tying them to avoid strangulation of the ACL. Now I take the help of the intra-articular portion of upper end of tibia and pass the threads through a lateral row anchor 
and get a fi final stable and a very secure fixation for uh, the ACL avulsion repair without any beaking and without going transosseous. This is a intraoperative uh, video showing uh, avulsed ACL fragment doing the probing. Uh, then this is the intraarticular portion of the upper end of tibia just behind the patellar tendon. We clear this and we take the help of this for lateral row fixation after creating a pilot hole here. All the threads are they are passed through the base of the ACL stump and through a lateral row anchor. You put it as you uh, are familiar with this technique uh, in shoulder surgery. You put the lateral row anchor, knotless anchor and screw it home so that you get a very solid and a stable fix fixation of this ACL avulsion stump. The advantage of this is that it is all intra-articular. Uh, intra the method uh, you all know most of you are doing sh shoulder surgery. This is the knot I used to make previously but not now. I am passing only the threads through the base of the ACL stump. See how nicely it is securely fixed with the method. So this is the pre-op x-ray, this is the post-op. You see this, uh, I use the titanium anchor in the epiphysis. The physis is completely spread and this is the lateral hole of the lateral anchor. It is in the metaphysis. It has given almost near complete normal and anatomical reduction. And so the if the anatomy is good and perfect, the physiology comes automatically and he has given a very good result to this child and he is uh, doing all activities. So this is the modification now I have made. Uh, this is a, only a diagrammatic representation. These are supposed to be AC, the ACL fibers. Three threads I passed through the base of the ACL stump and the fourth one through the uh, posterior border of anterior horn of lateral meniscus and the ACL stump. So these four, they form a sort of suture bridge which are tied to the lateral row knotless anchor to get a very secure fixation. Thank you. So any uh, comments, critical comments? Not, uh, I don't know. Because it is uh, there for only uh, working for two months or so, I think. Because it is a bony fragment, it sticks nicely. We have to just hold it for a few weeks or so. So no doubt a nice technique, but is there over reduction of the fragment and more pulling of the ACL fibers? Uh, you can, yeah, I, uh, I got your point. Sometimes uh, there is over reduction. So what uh, sometimes I do if I feel that by pulling the threads, the fragment is coming more anteriorly, then I try to temporarily fix with a K wire at uh, anatomical position and then tie the lateral row anchor. Good morning, yes, sir. Satish. Ah, sir. Uh, while uh, inserting the medial row anchor, so do you feel, uh, uh, means, uh, how is the purchase? Because most of the time Surprising is, uh, the, uh, because these are all young patients, the purchase is uh, not bad, means it is good. And I always try to uh, pull out the switches, but uh, till now it has not pulled off or uh, anything like that. So it stays you, there. You, you take out those sutures through that uh, bone tendon junction of the... Uh, uh, the yeah. Jagtap sir, whether you use the CM while putting your anchor, uh, metal anchor, no? Not uh, really required because there is a small crater, small area and it goes there only. Uh, you no, mean no, to say in this case, in yeah. the posterior scale, scale, No, it never pierces as such. In skeletally immature, you can take the help of CM to avoid uh, damage to the... you are doing in both the skeletally immature and skeletally mature. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, the, I think this is the best technique uh, as of now what I feel in skeletal immature. It doesn't uh, violate the physis by a single drill. Thank you. Dr. Vikram Sapde to present his next case. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> yeah. 
So, uh, we'll discuss uh, regarding lateral meniscus uh, repair. <coughs> Coming to the clinical. So, this was a 30 year old male patient. He had a road traffic accident some six weeks ago. He had instability and pain. He had a flexion deformity of around 10 degree. Lachman's was positive. Uh, <coughs> and PCL and PLC tests were negative. I will show the MRI also. So, <clears throat> that's the MRI showing a lateral meniscus tear with PCL and a log medial meniscus tear. On the coronal and axial images, you can see the medial side lock, bucket handle tear, lateral tear. So, this, these are the pictures. You can see in the <coughs> sagittal section, axial view lateral side, medial side. So, uh, these were the presenting problems. Uh, logged middle meniscus tear, lateral meniscus tear, and ACL tear. So, uh, uh, Sundar sir, if I can ask, uh, what MRI and uh, clinical findings that you would like to see before planning, or what are the specific things uh, in clinical and uh, MRI, what you would like to see before you plan for a meniscus surgery? Like, how will your repair be and all? Or you might have to do a meniscectomy. Yeah. Yeah. Say, so it is very difficult to decide whether to do a meniscectomy or a meniscus repair. Whether in a, even very because MRI cannot give an exact zone of your uh, tear in most of the situations, even though it's a six weeks old. Uh, sometimes it's in a white white zone. We may do a. Uh, uh, partial meniscectomy or if it is in a red red zone you do a repair. There are some situations where you do a, some meniscectomy and also repair. So the, situ the, yeah. the situation has gone where you do only meniscectomy or a meniscus repair. Right. Now we are uh, transitioned into the another zone where you do a repair and meniscectomy for the same meniscus. We had seen many times we yeah. do that like in a horizontal tires mm -hmm. or in a complex tire. So we do a repair of red red zone, red white zone, we trim that uh, um, white zone, like uh, what you see in the lateral meniscus tear, and like in this case, like a complex tears. So we, I try to do a repair of the uh, red red zone or the red white zone, and the white white zone I just trim it off when you do a radial tear repairs. So always I counsel the patients before I go in, so the possibility of repair is there. So if you could do, you see intraoperatively assess, and I do a repair. So it is not, I cannot guarantee that I do the uh, repair or a meniscectomy okay. before. And even after seeing the clinical condition or MRI, so I counsel for both. I, t I talk to them, um, uh, talk to them about the cost of the surgery is going to be whether do a repair or a physical. Yeah. Again, <clears> you <throat> cannot give again the say how yeah. much you are going to say. That always you give a always variation around fifty thousand, sixty thousand here and there. So yeah. it's very important that uh, you counsel all the patient yeah. before you go in. Yeah. That you take give the uh, maximum cost for that patient that you may do a bucket handle repair here, yeah. you may repair a lateral meniscus repairs. It's acute case. Yeah. So you have to counsel that patients. Yeah. So uh, coming to it, how do you plan your, uh, Dr. Anshu, uh, how do you plan for your uh, meniscus repair? Uh, okay, and what all instruments and implants do you keep? Or what are the, uh, what is the toolbox for your meniscus repair, considering all scenarios? Uh, so for biological enhancement, Meniscus rasp is absolutely necessary. Uh, you need uh, slotted cannulas. You need zone-specific cannulas uh, for inside-out and all-inside repairs. Should always be prepared for even uh, augmenting repairs. Uh, it is better if you have something like uh, PRP in your OT or uh, facility to prepare a fibrin clot. Uh, for outside-in repair, you can either use the commercial kits or even spinal needles. So basically, whenever a meniscus tear is suspected or even not suspected, uh, I think uh, all three techniques of meniscus repair and biological augmentation should be there as part of your backup plan each and every time. Right, correct. So we need to have everything, whether there is a meniscus tear or not. Right, correct. So this is, this is the intro finding, arthroscopy of the patient. A log bucket handle tear was there. 
I'll focus more on the lateral side tear. I think uh, the medial side tear has been discussed very well. <clears throat> so this was the lateral meniscus tear, a posterior horn tear extending till the popliteus tendon. And uh, this was a six weeks old tear. So, uh, Navid, uh, how would you plan for this lateral meniscus tear? Yeah, so, uh, I think it's a peripheral tear and the ACL is stone, so I'm very happy. I know that my uh, meniscus will heal very well. For these, since uh, it's on the posterior aspect, especially posterior to the uh, popliteus, I would use uh, all inside devices on this. Right. Okay. Uh, Sachin, uh, what are the precautions uh, would you like to take when uh, doing a posterior horn repair of lateral meniscus uh, as far as neuroscular injury is concerned? Okay, so three things are important. One is adequate visualization of the lateral side. So you, if you are preempting a lateral meniscus repair, first check if the hip is mobile. If the hip is stiff, then your exposure with a figure of four can be bit compromised. Okay. So try and push a sandbag underneath the buttock so that you get adequate space after you make a figure of four position or get a mute trolley at the foot end of the table from the opposite side so that you have adequate opening of the lateral compartment. One. Second, always use a depth probe which is uh, supplied with uh, most of the commercially available all inside devices that you use. Measure the distance, adjust it on your all inside device so that you don't over penetrate. Third, your sutures ideally should pass from the medial portal so that you do not go directly in line with the neurovascular bundle which is just behind the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus at a distance of approximately 3.2 millimeters. If you have to pass sutures through the lateral portal and use that line of attack then I would suggest that you can use a device which allows you to suture the meniscus some form of a suture hook or some form of a direct suture passing device which would then prevent or decrease the incidence of having a neurovascular injury. If you have to use an all-inside device, limit the depth probe and pass it very slowly under vision in a controlled manner so that you don't have these problems. Thank you, sir. So, <clears throat> this is uh, the medial meniscus part we did. I'll skip this. We did inside out as well as. So, <clears throat> Rajiv sir, uh, what are your preferable stitch patterns? Uh, in this scenario, would you prefer uh, circumferential uh, compression stitches? Vertical or horizontal? What kind of stitches would you prefer? So, if you think all these uh, three suture techniques has been described, but best cinching is with the vertical mattress suture because what happens in the vertical suture you have a good cinching effect and the horizontal uh, suture the advantage is that you can just save your anchor you can put a broader area so that yeah, yeah you can save you can repair a big area with the two anchor only by increasing the horizontal thickness but for good cinching and good approximation of the capsular part and the uh, meniscal part I think vertical stitch is the best okay so what about uh, sir uh, circumferential compression stitch if we have to take yeah i can take with uh, yeah you can take with your uh, suture passing device and yeah. that is also good you have very good uh, uh, because, you can take uh, it with a uh, knee scorpion also yeah. or with a suture lasso also yeah. right so because if we took take a vertical it can be only on superior surface and yeah. we might have to add one more on inferior surface inferior surface while yes. circumferential stitches will be added so in this case we did was uh, <coughs> Uh, circumferential stitches with uh, knee scorpion we took. Uh, we have already used uh, all inside uh, on the medial side. So this side we have to do it with uh, uh, scorpion. So I took, uh, I created additional portal. First I took all the bites, parked the sutures uh, on the more lateral side. This is uh, very medially. As I said, here we can use uh, circumferential stitches. Shuttling through the inferior part of uh, the meniscus, 
the sutures and then uh, placing the knot. Take a uh, couple of uh, stitches here and uh, we'll add one more here. For so, the complete reconstruction of uh, popliteal hiatus also. So, three all inside uh, stitches uh, been taken. So, uh, as uh, said, there was one article uh, where they have said all inside lateral meniscus repair via anterolateral portal uh, increases the risk of vascular injury. So, one should avoid uh, putting it directly from the lateral side, anterolateral side. And the uh, effect of knee flexion, as uh, told, uh, all inside meniscus repair is safer at around 90 degree of knee flexion. <clears throat> Sandeep sir, if we can, uh, when would you prefer a fibrin clot or a PRP? Uh, I do not have any experience with this fibrin clot and PRP. PRP okay. I don't use, okay. uh, not for the meniscus repair or any of the uh, arthroscopic procedures. Okay, okay. Vikram, may I ask one? Yeah. You have done medial meniscus repair first yeah. and then you went to lateral. Yeah. Would it have been a little better to just hold a reduction suture of the medial meniscus, do the... Because you have to put figure of four and sometimes do some flexion may add to your repair site on the medial meniscus. So just holding a reduction suture on the medial meniscus, doing, going in and again doing the medial meniscus because that may cause less damage. Less damage too? Already repaired because in figure of four there are chance that the posterior lateral, posterior medial aspect of the yeah. repair may get, the sutures may come out. Yeah, yeah. I do that but ideally you have to check your repair with cycling. Means I, you I should, know. you should have, uh, do flexion and then check. Uh, whether it's a repair is stable or not. So I think uh, this will not hurt if you have done a proper repair out there. Actually, Mukesh, it is good. He has tested his repair. Yeah. So that it is not going to fail. Yeah. Few, few, author, <laughs> few authors have mentioned in the textbook. So okay, you have to check it. Uh, thank you. So, yes, sir, I have, uh, sir, can I ask one question to you? Sir, what would be your rehab um, with the meniscus repair? Sir, Gajar, sir. When it's a bucket handle tear uh, and a large bucket, I put my patient non-weight bearing for six weeks. Uh, for, so, if predominantly they are with ACL tears. So, the rehab uh, is along the line of ACL reconstruction. So, a long knee brace for two weeks non-weight bearing for six weeks and at two weeks, uh, you know, start knee flexion. Um, no squats for at least three months or deep squats uh, for that matter. If it is a, a small bucket handle, then depending on the location, generally it's the posterior part. So I would uh, restrict uh, deep flexion at least for three months. Okay. And just the word on the fibrin clot and the PRB. Yeah. So for isolated uh, meniscal tears, uh, I think biological augmentation would uh, help. Uh, yeah. One should not forget the basic principles of debriding the edges and trying to oppose it without uh, inadvertently uh, taking away uh, good tissue. Uh, so those principles are mandatory and in addition, uh, augmenting it with some sort of a biological uh, method would help. Uh, fibrin clot generally would do well for horizontal cleavage tears and radial tears. Um, it's a very easy technique and uh, if you just uh, go through the arthroscopic technique uh, uh, in journal, there, there are ways and simple methods, you don't need too much equipment. Uh, so yes, bi biological augmentation does help uh, in isolated or uh, chronic tears. Okay, thank you sir. Thank you Vikram. I think Dr. Mukesh Ladda will present the third case. Good morning everyone. So this is a case of intrameniscal cyst. Uh, he's a 24 year old farmer by occupation, pain in the knee since six months. No obvious history of trauma, but rigorous work in the farm. He used to squat and sit cross leg and do a lot of work in that position. 
he just noticed pain one fine day which was mild and gradually increasing and mm -hmm. contacted me and I was given him some conservative treatment for long almost four to six months but he says that the pain is not going and that is affecting his farming work and other things last six months activities of daily living clinically there was medial joint line tenderness especially in the posterior medial aspect macmurris was positive ligaments were normal the alignment was normal the range of motion was full that's the x-ray showing no obvious signs anything i went ahead and did mri which showed an intrameniscal cyst there was no obvious tear communicating either with the femur or the tibia but clinically the tenderness and this cyst was there and was not getting results so he was having difficulty in doing his farm works also so what should be the plan uh, first of all what should be the reason in a 24 year old guy with this kind of cyst suppose we say would you add some throw some light on it this is a difficult problem to treat surgically uh, hmm. the reason is probably some form of congenital or developmental abnormality with the quality of meniscus tissue okay I would try and not touch him surgically as far as possible because inside that meniscus, everything is just mushy stuff and um, you feel good when you repair it. But when they come back after two years and three years, that whole thing has fallen apart. And I'm not too happy. So if you don't do, he will come again three, three years with the tear? He'll probably come back with a horizontal cleavage tear with hardly any meniscal tissue. If you look at a lot of literature on these, these are being treated now with uh, limited segmental meniscus transplants. Okay. So, uh, the best way to treat them is to ask them to stop squatting and not bend their knee beyond 90 because the knee gets loaded. Of course, his social situation is such that he is going to do that 110 times. Yeah. So, probably he is not the best patient for you to have in your clinic with uh, his social issues and his pathology. So I would definitely go in the same order that you've done. I would do conservative treatment. I would try in these case orthobiologics. And if he still comes back and has a problem, I would try and repair him when he has a tear and use circumferential compression sutures with a fibrin clot and uh, you know ask him not to flex beyond 90 for at least about three to six months. Okay. Uh, Shres, your thoughts on this? No, I think it's similar to what uh, Sachin has said. This, this, this is like the intra interstitial rotator cuff tear, you know, whether you really need to do something about it. Try and treat it conservatively and uh, if it doesn't... So what's your cutoff line now? As sir told, he will not touch it. So he keeps coming you six months, eight months. The pain is there. I'm not able to do. So one can offer... So after a second line of treatment would be an injection, uh, a local injection. Try and see if... Uh, you know, that would give him pain relief. If that is confirmed and it uh, does not recur, then problem solved. But if it recurs, then diagnostic arthroscopy and proceed accordingly. Yes, Navid. So, uh, why do you say it's a cyst? Uh, it's just a signal on the MRI or the, it has been reported as a cyst? This, I searched literature with a similar case. One case report is there which they have reported this as an intrameniscal cyst. Or you may say a signal changes also. So what difference it will make in management? A cyst is something filled with fluid. So, so this has to be something fluid signal changes, no? It could be just some interstitial edema also. Not a cyst, not a proper cyst. Okay, might be edema. Sundar? <laughs> how often do you see this in practice and how often do we do conservative so and how often do we... Treat this as a, like a horizontal tear. So, okay. uh, so whenever you see an horizontal tear in the younger patient, you don't see very often. As he said, it's a very rare situation. You see uh, often in a, but with the normal cartilage situations, even in the middle age group, we mm. see sometimes they are very symptomatic. But most of them, they are associated with the paramenisical cyst. Yeah, that's more so that common. Is, that is paramenisical the, that is the cyst more common. common. So this yeah. is a 24 years old. As I said, it's very very rare. So I will go with the same line which already you discussed. So I don't want to waste time. So. So I tried to give him conservative management, but due to some reason, he was like, he do something. So this was the video when I entered it. The whole normal looking meniscus. There was nothing as such, no tear, nothing. All the cartilage ligaments were absolutely pristine. So I just trimmed, say, a one or two millimeter in the white-white zone. 
very gently just trimming minimum and as soon as I used my probe it opened up as if there is a complete hollowness in the meniscus. So at this age some collagen problem is there or some degenerative tear we should call it as or what should we call this? Anything? No, it's asymptomatic on the other side. I have not done MRI. Maybe some horizontal tear was there. The Nothing. inner lip. No, I will just show you the. Sorry. So you sorry. can see that video. Mm -hmm. There is no tear. This is after prior casting, of course. You see this kind of like a mucoid. Mucoid meniscus or mucoid AC. See, in younger patients very, mm. very often, sometimes. In a younger, emotionally, I see in the females. Uh, this is like a, the pre stage of the horizontal tear. Maybe the next stage will be the horizontal tear yes. for this patient. So that's what I like Sachin Tri said that Same. there is no, no obvious tear, even the MRI. It was mm -hmm. only a single changes for the pre stage of horizontal tear. So that's why we try to uh, preserve this meniscus conservatively as far as possible. By giving another so injection. There is no cutoff line, six months, one year, yeah. nothing. Or any repeat MRI after any period of time, six months. So this is what I offered, and I just opened the mouth with the small meniscus biter. So the lesion was extending really more posteriorly. So it was like as if I am opening a book. It was all then using your shaver with no suction mode so to prevent it's like an envelope. <laughs> yeah. Using your shaver, your meniscus rash to enhance the healing over there, using vesc creating vascular channels, trephination. So now we'll just close or put something else in. Anshu. This is stable. This is uh, an nitrogenic tear in a way. <laughs> we cannot leave it like this. <laughs> if if at all we have gone ahead and you know opened the Pandora's box, we might as well shut it up. Shut it up. Otherwise, this is likely to become a cyst. Then he'll come back with a cyst. Okay. Because he'll keep squatting, and he probably will, it is will. his deep squatting activities why it is present in this case. Why yeah. it is so? This type of lesions are so common in females. Mm -hmm. Deep loaded squatting. No, it was not opening that. I just opened whichever with opening without any pressure, just easily. So no fluid came out, na? like in cyst, nothing. Nothing, no, nothing looked like. like it was all like a air balloon, which I just opened it. And then I filled the fibrin clot to enhance the healing of that meniscus. So it's like a sandwich one just to fill it in that box. Fibrin clot. What do you use to prepare the clot? Uh, simple blood from vein, the anesthetist gives 30 ml of blood, we just tear it for 5 minutes, then we get the clot, we dry it up on the gauze piece, so that you remove maximum amount of fluid from it, and then cut it into small pieces, and just deliver with minimum fluid in the joint. So how do you deliver it? Do you use some device? What instrument do you use? No, I just use a, I just open it, and I use a simple artifosip, we just Shavati. put it there and see that the fluid is minimum in the joint and then just close it as sir told he will come again to me now <laughs> it's like four months only pain is gone movements are full but i have not allowed him squatting yet <laughs> <Life member now. laughs> so to this kind of patients we don't know the pain is because of this. That is also there. Because he is a former. No other reason was there for his pain. So you see many inactive patients. Sometimes we see with quadriceps weakness or any petalofungal symptoms, other medial sided pains. That's why we are you now very cautious to touch yeah. this patient first of I all. Agree, as, I agree. As Sachin said. So uh, that's why we try to uh, you know, touch this patient as far as possible. So because you see like it's like a work compensation from the uh, you know, like uh, in the Western countries. <laughs> So our guys, they don't have any work compensation, no. but we have get, get these kind of patients, many patients. I come, come with pain, pain, they go to the 10 doctors, 11 doctors, 
But when you see an MRI, you will have some kind of finding that somebody might have advised surgery. Whenever you see a signal, somebody might have advised meniscectomy. If so if repeat, you go and if, do it, you, 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 then you will be your patient for your life. I, I, it, he may you be. are responsible he may for be. this. <laughs> you, are, you are responsible for be. this. At least if you don't touch them, at least you can escape. But that's okay. what I'm saying. Mm. It's fine. It's six months, nine months. But sometimes, he's only 24. Even if he's a horizontal tear comes to you, you will do the same thing with the same risk. Again, after a year or two. So better to refer to Anshu there. That's what, that's, what I'm, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. <laughs> so I'll repeat MRI after a year and if it heals, because I've seen one case by Dinsha presenting the same in one of our meetings. He told that the meniscus on MRI healed and there was no signal changes. So a one year MRI with no signal changes, still there will be a high chance of free tear? Did you take a biopsy? That there would have been very useful actually. Uh, to take a biopsy and send out you know, mm -hmm. all the granulation or whatever material was there inside with a okay. fine curette, that would have told us whether Why it was abnormal, I mean, just out of academic interest. No, I have not so, done uh, I feel it's just your mucoid. If you send a biopsy, it will get a mucoid. Because you see the mucoid meniscus many times. With the horizontal tear, you see these, these things, have, even the normal meniscus will have that mucoid material, that yellowish tinge along right the meniscus. Now, his most medial suture, the most medial suture, the meniscus next to it appears yellowish. Yeah. You tend to see some younger patients get this, this kind of degeneration very common. You see, all these patients are inactive. You do, I don't know, this patient is selling farmer working in the farms. But we see more of mucoid in you know, younger mm -hmm. females, which, which are they are physically inactive. inactive. That comes with the mucoid degeneration of the ACL also later on. So I'll update you after one year on this. Sir. Right, thank you. Sir, I just want yeah. Uh, so what is the consensus at the end of the discussion? Don't touch it. <laughs> and if it becomes horizontal tear, then? Then touch it and pray. Yeah. <laughs> if there is a horizontal tear, then you have a good indication of doing a repair. Because there is a tear now. Here there was no tear, which is why we did not want to touch it. So once you have a tear, then tear is an indication to repair it. With Prognosis a will, may remain the same. With some orthopology. So till that time, how do we counsel the patient? You have to tell them that no matter what you do, you should not squat and you should not flex beyond 120. Even after doing a repair for a horizontal cleavage tear, you will tell them do not squat for at least six to nine months till there is healing in that area. Even the horizontal tear with the paramenisclus cyst are a more symptomatic one. So yes. sometimes you see a lot of incidental horizontal tear which is degenerative in a by a fourth decade or a fifth decade. It's very common. So most of them, they are not symptomatic. That's why the choosing the patient is very, very important. So that pain may be due to wear and tear of that patient. In the 45 years old, 50 years old, we have to be careful that this patient have an early medial joint osteoarthritis, can have a horizontal tearing also. So that patient, if you go and do a repair, it will not, that patient will have a five degrees of, seven degrees of varus deformity, grade two, 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 uh, varus, uh, osteoarthritic changes. Horizontal tear is very common. So you should not go and do repair that kind of patients. Uh, Mukesh, one just uh, comment on the technique, especially when we discuss that this mm -hmm. may be an unhealthy tissue. Uh, would be perhaps a better option to try and go towards the capsular area. It was all intact. No, circumferential suture. And the other thing that is... That would have compressed it more, I think. No, no you, I mean... From the uh, capsule to completely... Yeah, this, it would have correct. The other advantage is that when the post is on the capsular side, Although it does not happen every suture, but the knot tends to be more in the periphery rather but than... But as it was the... complete hollow, I thought that, but then being hollow, it may compress the <laughs> meniscus more, so I just thought to... Just like this. a horizontal, degenerate horizontal cleavage tears with paramenisical cyst, when we decompress and we put a circumferential... But there you remove significant part of white-white zone, and then the meniscus left is small one. That was the whole thought process, but we can do that as well. You think because this tear is not open into the capsule, that is the problem. Huh. He has not opened the posterior, even the hydrogenic, what you have discussed also, <laughs> you have not done the posterior <laughs> capsule opening. So, uh, many a times uh, uh, in MRA reports using uh, 1.5 Tesla machine, they mention type 2 signal changes in the uh, meniscus. They don't mention there is any tear. So, what to do in that situation? Type 2 meniscus tears are only an MRI classification. So for any surgical indication, the signal should communicate either with the tibial side or on the femoral side, which is type 3 tears. 
or it's an horizontal where you see the complete cut in the meniscus, that are the indications where sh you should advise surgery. Type 1 and type 2 tears are conservatively managed and they are not practical tears on arthroscopy. This is a typical case here. Same. <laughs> yeah, agree? I agree. So you see any degenerative, you see the signals, that is a degeneration. This is, this is just a degeneration which they mention as a type 1 or type 2, don't bother about it. As I said, Mukesh said rightly, if it is not communicating with the superior or inferior articular surface, then it is not a tear. It's just to take it as a mucoid degeneration of that particular meniscus. That's why we try to treat conservatively as far as possible. Okay. Uh, so, thank you everyone. Before we go to the next session, I would request uh, Dr. Sundar to please come forward and uh, just uh, present uh, Dr. Anchu Shekhar with a, a memento for his uh, participation. I would also like to call uh, Dr. Kuldeep. Kuldeep. Dr. Ishan. So they were the chairpersons for the first session. I think Ishan isn't here. So it's okay. Yeah, Ishan, please come. Thank you, sir. So uh, we move on to the next session, which is on uh, multi-ligament reconstruction. And I'd like to call upon the chairpersons, Dr. Abhinav Bhatnagar, Dr. Dheeraj Gupta, and Dr. Kiran Belsare. Good morning, everyone. So after a wonderful meniscus preservation session, we would now move to our third session that is on multi-ligament reconstruction. May I now invite uh, Dr. Shreyash Gajah, sir, for his talk on uh, medial knee injuries. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you, uh, Indian Arthroscopy Society and the Arthroscopy Society of Nagpur for the invitation. Um, the topic is simplifying medial uh, knee injuries. Uh, I work at Kokila Bain Dhirubhai Ambani Hospital in Mumbai. So uh, recent uh, evidence has highlighted uh, more attention towards the uh, extra articular part of the knee joint, uh, especially the, uh, the collaterals. And uh, that has shown uh, to have more uh, importance or impact in uh, outcomes for our ligament surgeries. So there has been more to just uh, the MCL or the superficial MCL uh, as we understand these uh, uh, anatomical structures and their biomechanics better. Also, uh, we have realized that they would contribute uh, in addition to uh, knee stability and that if these are unaddressed or uh, overseed, then it would result subsequently in poor functional outcomes. So when we deal with medial-sided knee injuries, uh, from a uh, bony anatomy point of view on the femoral side, there are three important landmarks, the medial epicondyle, uh, the uh, adductor tubercle, and the, uh, the gastroc tubercle. And on the tibial side, it's the uh, medial tibial crest. Now, uh, when we talk about medial-sided knee injuries, uh, because it's no longer just the superficial MCL, the entire uh, soft tissue envelope in that area is now re referred to as the medial soft tissue complex, which comprises of the superficial MCL, the deep MCL, and the posterior medial corner, which has five components, the posterior oblique ligament, the posterior horn of medial meniscus, semimembranosus distal tendon, the oblique popliteal ligament, and the articular capsule. All these st structures uh, comprising the posterior medial corner are equally important uh, especially when it comes to rotatory uh, instability. So the medial layers, just like the lateral side, have been described uh, or can be looked at topographically into three uh, zones or three layers. The layer one or the superficial is the uh, deep fascia and the sartorius. 
Two is the superficial MCL, uh, the MPFL, and the uh, posterior oblique ligament. And the deep layer or the layer three is the capsule along with the deep MCL. Um, coming to the superficial MCL, uh, it has a uh, you know femoral attachment. Again, th there are two schools of thought. The Laprade uh, study and publication showed that uh, the uh, point is on a little proximal and posterior on the medial epicondyle. But some recent evidence from the Imperial College London shows that it is at the center of the medial epicondyle. Now, it is important to try and get the, the correct uh, point when uh, you know, uh, repairing or augmenting the, the, the superficial MCL. Otherwise, it would alter the joint biomechanics. On the tibial side, there is consensus that there are two attachments. The more proximal is a soft tissue attachment, approximately two centimeters uh, distal to the joint line and a more distal uh, attachment, which is six centimeters. The deep MCL uh, on the femoral side uh, is a centimeter distal to the superficial MCL. And on the tibial side, especially the Imperial College London group has shown that it's a fan-shaped uh, broad attachment, as you can see on the cadaveric dissection on the right side. And uh, there is a, a strong uh, reinforcement uh, in the form of a meniscofemoral and the meniscotibial component. The posterior oblique ligament can be looked at as a thickening of the uh, posterior medial capsule. The femoral attachment is just distal and anterior to the gastroc tubercle. The tibial attachment is uh, the distal aspect of the semimembranosus tendon. And the adductor magnus serves as a very useful landmark uh, for the femoral attachment of the posterior oblique ligament and the superficial MCL. Now, why are these structures important? So, because they contribute uh, to varying degrees or in, in, as a team for medial-sided stability. So if you look at valgus stability, uh, predominantly it's the superficial MCL in 30 degrees of knee flexion and uh, some component of the deep MCL, the meniscofemoral and the meniscotibial. Uh, external rotation stability is predominantly by the deep MCL, which is in extension. And you see these in uh, footballers or, you know, sports uh, personnel involved uh, in, in these pivoting type of sports. The superficial MCL provides the uh, external rotation stability in 0 to 90 degrees of flexion. Uh, predominantly, it's the femoral uh, uh, femur to the distal tibial attachment, uh, which plays a role. And the posterior oblique also, to some degree, contributes in this range. The internal ro rotation stability, on the other hand, uh, is uh, offered by the posterior oblique ligament in, in uh, near extension and the deep MCL in 0 to 90 degrees, uh, and so also the tibial side of the superficial MCL. And the load sharing response, predominantly the superficial MCL helps in valgus and external rotation uh, uh, restriction, and the posterior oblique uh, helps in internal rotation torque, especially near uh, full extension. So uh, when we encounter patients with medial-sided knee injuries, uh, they either occur in isolation or in combination, usually seen in young people engaged in sporting activities. The mechanism is a valgus uh, knee load with the tibia in external rotation uh, or a combined force vector. And there are a number of sports uh, which uh, predominantly risk the knee in these positions. Clinically, uh, in an isolated patient or in combination with uh, associated injuries, one could see uh, localized swelling, ecchymosis, or pain. Uh, it's important in the scenario of a multi-ligament injury or a knee dislocation to also look at other aspects and uh, prioritize accordingly. Uh, generally speaking, medial-sided knee injuries can be uh, classified uh, depending on their presentation into acute, subacute, and the chronic. Although you know, one uh, still these time frames are debatable. Uh, coming to examination, uh, increased laxity in 30 degrees of flexion is predominantly uh, the uh, due to superficial MCL injury whereas that near extension is uh, generally the deep MCL and the uh, posterior medial corner. The positive anterior medial drawers test, so you keep the knee in 80 degrees of flexion with the foot in 10 to 50 degrees uh, external rotation, and you do a rotatory movement. And if there is an anterior medial subluxation of the tibia, that is called anterior medial rotatory instability, which signifies that the medial soft tissue complex uh, is involved. And again, where dial tests, uh, in, in, especially in chronic situations, well, we tend to think that it is more due to the lateral uh, or the posterior lateral corner uh, problem, but one needs to make sure that the med there's no medial-sided injury. And one way to 
uh, identify that is that there is an anterior medial subluxation of the tibia with the dial test uh, when it's a, a medial sided injury. Uh, looking at imaging, radiographs would help us rule out any bony avulsions or dislocations, although we want to reduce the knee before we take an x-ray. Leg alignment views are really mandatory in chronic situations. And again, stress views uh, are uh, quite um, helpful. And there is a classification to help us determine whether it's just a superficial uh, MCL injury or uh, you know, uh, additional components, especially in the chronic scenario. MRIs would pick up a femoral or a tibial sided injury. Incarceration of the MCL uh, in, into the joint is again an emergency indication uh, to operate. Uh, there is classification, as I mentioned, to grade one, two, and three, uh, and also stress view classifications. Now, when we uh, manage these uh, uh, patients, uh, one needs to uh, kind of uh, divide them into whether it's an isolated superficial MCL injury or it's involving the medial soft tissue complex, and with or without any association of uh, 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 the uh, intra-articular structures. So the surgical options are either a direct repair, repair with augmentation, or reconstruction. Uh, conventionally, grade two and one injuries of the MCL uh, were treated non-operatively. Uh, and um, the idea was to restore quads function, knee range of motion, and minimize swelling. Stiffness does remain a concern. So within six weeks, one needs to get uh, near terminal flexion. Uh, and in association with ACL injuries, generally, the, the thought was to delay any MCL intervention, treat the ACL first, uh, because there was a risk of stiffness. So, you know, you get the range of motion first, deal with the ACL, and then, uh, you know, the MCL evaluation would determine intraoperatively after doing the ACL reconstruction whether or not it needs to be addressed. And subsequently, the, you know, range of motion, brace, immobilization, uh, with uh, without uh, certain weight-bearing restriction, either partial or non-weight-bearing, uh, as appropriate by the surgeon was advocated. Now, uh, the, the, these, uh, these lines of management are evolving as we understand uh, uh, you know, patient outcomes over the years. And currently, um, in short, uh, it, is, uh, it is advocated, although we don't have uh, a number of high-level studies to support it, that you know, grade two injuries in association with ligaments, uh, especially the ACL, need to be addressed surgically. Otherwise, uh, in the long run, the, it puts a lot of force on the ACL uh, graft, and it tends to fail. So one of the causes, as we understand, failures following AC, primary ACL reconstruction is a grade two uh, neglected MCL injury. And it is quite an unforgiving injury as what the current evidence uh, seems to suggest. So uh, grade three injuries, uh, I don't think there is any uh, doubt that in the present day, we would treat it surgically, depending on whether it's tibial or femoral sided. Combined injuries, uh, grade two remains controversial till date, but uh, currently there is a low threshold to treat these surgically. And uh, again, uh, MCL injuries or medial soft tissue complex injuries in association with knee dislocation or multiligament have to be treated surgically. In the chronic situation, uh, one needs to assess alignment and because most times just an osteotomy uh, would, uh, would provide the stability. So the options available are to uh, augment the uh, MCL repair with uh, some sort of a strong suture like the internal brace. This is generally advocated in the acute and the subacute situations. In the chronic situations, you can add a, 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 a internal brace to a, a graft rather than to just repair. Because in the chronic situation, the, the tissue quality of the, uh, M, the medial structures tends to be poor because of scarring. And also, one may not be able to identify them because of uh, the uh, distorted tissue planes. Uh, so this is a patient of mine. As I said, the threshold to do uh, MCL um, repair with augmentation uh, in, in alongside ACL reconstruction um, is reducing. So this is a patient of mine where uh, femoral side um, uh, MCL in association with ACL and I repaired it. Uh, now, one of the concerns with MCL surgery or MCL injury is stiffness. So we need to make sure that uh, there is no arthrofibrosis uh, during our rehab program. And we need to, at the same time, we can't be overtly aggressive in the early phase because we need to ensure that the medial sided knee stability is restored. Uh, repair and augmentation can be done uh, either for both the components, the 
uh, the uh, medial uh, soft tissue structures and the superficial MCL as seen here. And also in the chronic situation, generally one sh should use grafts because they would add to more biology than just repairing tissues or augmenting it with a strong suture. Post-operative rehab, uh, it's important to communicate with the therapist uh, as to what would be a safe zone. In, in the early healing phase of the medial structures, uh, we need to avoid um, uh, or minimize weight bearing. So there are some studies which say partial weight bearing. I tend to put my patient non-weight bearing for six weeks when there's an ACL with a grade two or more MCL. Uh, and the goal is to achieve uh, you know, terminal flexion in the first six weeks to minimize the risk of arthrofibrosis. And subsequently, close kinetic chain exercises can be um, advocated. So this is a, a, a multi-ligament situation, a three-ligament injury, uh, as you can see here on the MRI. Um, we'll just focus on the, the medial-sided injury. So you know, the, it was opening up uh, only in 30 degrees of flexion and not near extension. Uh, so it was just a superficial MCL injury. So again, uh, uh, you know. Uh, over a period of time, as we evolve our techniques and we get more experience, from a conventional open long incision, we tend to go percutaneous. And as I mentioned in my earlier slide, the superficial MCL um, uh, augmentation or reconstruction landmarks are very crucial to uh, avoid any uh, abnormal load biomechanics in the subsequent uh, years. So uh, even though one may take a smaller incision approach, we need to make sure that we get the the uh, fixation points very accurate. It's an unforgiving, uh, uh, you know, uh, side of injury. Yeah. So this is how we do that. And you can use various uh, methods. You can use a screw or an anchor to fix it. Uh, as you can see here, uh, the, the tibial side, you use the same incision as the graft harvest. And this is the post-operative, uh, you know, stability that you achieve. But obviously, we need to protect it with uh, brace in the long run. And in chronic cases, uh, some form of osteotomy would do the job. So in summary, recent uh, anatomic and biomechanical studies have uh, improved our understanding and uh, attention. Uh, and also, uh, subsequently, there have been evolving techniques and rehab programs to try and improve patient outcomes. Thank you once again to the uh, Arthroscopy Society of Nagpur for the invitation. Uh, thank you, sir. I'm inviting uh, Dr. Satish Sonar on the talk managing lateral side injuries. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, the lateral corner injuries are uh, many times uh, uh, get ignored or sometimes uh, are untreated and that can lead to the uh, graft failure of ACL and PCL. So the uh, proper uh, diagnosis and management of lateral corner injuries are very important. So the incidence of uh, posterior lateral corner injuries has uh, uh, risen because of the high velocity motor vehicular accident and also in the athletic traumas. The PLC injuries are frequently encountered along with ACL or PCL, and they are rarely uh, isolated injuries. So the important structure in the PLC are lateral collateral ligament, popliteofibular ligament, popliteus tendon, you can see there, and the popliteofibular ligament, and also the posterior lateral capsule uh, also act as a uh, virus uh, uh, force on the lateral side. The static stabilizers are LCL, patellofemoral ligament, arcuate ligament complex, and the fabulo uh, fibular ligament. The dynamic are the muscles along the posterior lateral side of the knee. Those are the two heads of biceps femoris, IT band, and the popliteus complex. The LCL is a static stabilizer, and it originates just proximal and posterior to the lateral femoral condyles, and it attaches roughly 8 millimeter Mm, posterior to anterior border of the fibular head, just below the styloid process. So the popliteus tendon function as a dynamic stabilizer on external rotation while the knee is in hyperflexion. So in the athletes, uh, the hyperflexion stability on the lateral side is mainly provided by the popliteus tendon. The in, it inserts approximately about uh, 
1.5 to 2, uh, 2 cm anterior and distal to the LCL. So, the, whenever we are reconstructing the uh, PLC, the uh, two tunnel femorals are very important because LCL and popliteus have a different uh, source of origin. Uh, the popliteal femoral ligament originates from the myotendinous junction of the popliteus muscles and it attaches about 1 mm distal and 0.5 mm anterior to the tip of the styloid, just uh, behind the LCL. The other structure, as I uh, mentioned, are the IT band, two heads of biceps femoris, uh, mid third of the uh, lateral capsule. So the IT band uh, provides uh, uh, a varus strength in the excessive uh, uh, exten uh, in the extension of the knee, while the two heads of the biceps provide the dynamic stability in the deep uh, flexion along with the popliteus tendon. Uh, the coronary ligament of uh, lateral meniscus uh, which extend from the popliteal meniscal fascicles and it plays uh, a very important role in the hyper extension. So the biomechanics, the LCL gives maximum stability in 0 to 30 degree of the uh, flexion, varus stability while the popliteus and the popliteal femoral ligament are more important in the flexion from 60 degree beyond. So the PLC is the primary stabilizer of external tibial rotation in all flexion angles from zero to a deep flexion. So the, we all know the LAP, LAPRAD has done an extensive work on these uh, lateral corner injuries and uh, he has uh, mentioned in his uh, uh, paper in the American Journal of Sports Medicine in 1999 that uh, the ACL graft will fail if you have ignored the PLC if there is a combined injury. And because of this significantly increased load, the author recommended reconstruction and or the repair in early three weeks of the PLC. The PLC and not PCL is a primary restraint into the posterior tibia translation in full extension. So in the extension, uh, recurvatum test, if it is positive, that means the PLC has gone along with the PCL. So you have to reconstruct the PLC also. Isolated PCL reconstruction will fail if the PLC is ignored. The combined sectioning studies uh, done by Laprad has shown more uh, posterior translation at 90 degree if PLC is also damaged. Uh, the clinical test, we all know the most important test for uh, Mm, diagnosing this uh, test is a dial test. We make the patient prone the, and we assess uh, the external rotation of the tibia at 30 degree and 90 degree. In the isolated uh, PCL injury, that uh, it will be a 10 degree more external rotation at 30 degree, but not at 90 degree. But in the combined, there will be more than 10 degree external rotation at 30 as well as 90 degree. Another test just which uh, I have mentioned this the external rotation recurvatum test. In this case, we hold the patient's knee in extension and if there is a PLC injury, the, the tibia will go automatically into the external rotation. The posterior lateral drawer test or also called as a Huxton's test and it is done at a hip in 45 degree flexion and knee at 90 degree. And we externally rotate the tibia 15 degree and then do a, a test to see whether there is a more uh, posterior lateral translation. So here you can see there is a 90 degree flexion, 15 degree external rotation. And you can see there is more translation, posterior drawer as well as posterior, uh, trans posterior lateral translation. So another test is simple uh, varus test we, which we do at 20 and 30 degree of the flexion and it is uh, more specific for the lateral uh, collateral uh, ligament. The reverse pure shift test uh, with the patient's hip and knee at 90 degree of flexion we apply the valgus load in an externally rotated uh, tibia and at about 35 to 40 degree the, there will be a click and it automatically get uh, reduced or the tibia comes into internal rotation. And this happens because the IT band act as a, uh, from uh, flexor it become an extensor because of uh, the uh, injury to the posterior lateral corner. So 
there will be click at about 30 to 40 degree flexion and this is a positive reverse pivot shift test. Uh, investigation, uh, mainly the X-ray, the stress X-ray is uh, uh, done at about 20 and 30 degree of flexion and for the PCL you can do a posterior uh, drawer uh, stress test. MRI is more specific and it will uh, uh, give us a diagnosis whether the popliteus is also torn or there is a uh, injury to the arcuate ligament complex also. And treatment, the poor functional outcome for non-operative treated grade 3 PC PLC injuries with the persistent instability and degenerative changes have been uh, reported. So we cannot ignore the PLC. Increased forces on the PCL and uh, ACL reconstruction will be there if the PLC is not treated uh, in the case of injury. So the primary repair for complete uh, fibular collateral ligament and popliteus tendon avulsion without mid-substance injury have been performed within two to three weeks. If the injury is beyond three weeks, you have to reconstruct the ligament. The primary repair can be done only in early three weeks of the injury. The Stenard et al. have shown almost 37% failure in repair as compared to only 9% in the reconstructed group. And the another study by Levy et al. showed 40% failure if, the, if only the repair of the PLC is done beyond three weeks. So if you want to do a repair of uh, PLC, it should be done within three weeks of the injury. In chronic injury, that means more than three to six weeks old, uh, lower extremity alignment should also be checked whether there is a varus or valgus and you have to correct the alignment before doing the ligament reconstruction. So as, as the laparate has mentioned, the, uh, the reconstruction should be anatomical and you have to take a lateral hockey stick incision extending from the lateral epicondyle just uh, between the tibial tubercle and the fibular head up to the girdis tubercle then do the neurolysis of the common peroneal nerve and you will always get a, a intact but stretched out FCL. You put a, 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 means a stretch on that uh, FCL and you, that will automatically lead you to the its uh, femoral as well as uh, fibular insertion and then you make a 6 to 7 mm hole in the FCL footprint from posterior mid, uh, anterolateral to posterior medial. Then about 8-9 millimeter tunnel in the flat spot of the Gurdish tubercle for uh, the popliteus uh, tendon attachment and the two tunnels at the isometric point and antero inferior for the popliteus and posterior superior for the uh, lateral collateral, uh, means uh, fibular collateral ligament. So the graft is first passed from antero medial uh, fibula the posterior medial it will exit and then uh, into the uh, femoral tunnel and then both those graft from the femoral tunnel will uh, go from posterior medial to anterolateral into the uh, tibial tunnel. So that will reconstruct all the uh, two structure that is fibular collateral ligament as well as popliteus tendon. So this is the stability after immediate uh, repair, reconstruction. So the post-operative rehabilitation is very important. Knee is immobilized and patient should be non weight bearing for six weeks. The passive range, is, uh, range can be started as early as uh, uh, first two weeks and patient should achieve almost uh, 90 degree of flexion and full flexion by about six weeks. At six weeks, uh, then we'll start gradual weaning of the crutches and strengthening exercises. So the outcome, the studies by Stannard and Levy reported higher Reoperation rates in patients treated with the repair of PLC as compared to reconstruction. So, whenever the injury is more than three weeks, it's always better to do a reconstruction. The Black et al. reported that reconstruction has superior result with respect to failure compared to repair. The author concluded that the repair of the acute grade 3 PLC injuries and stage treatment of combined cruciate injuries were associated with substantially higher postoperative failure rate. Then, Moulton et al. reported 90% success rate and 10% failure rate in chronic PLC injuries treated with a different reconstruction techniques, means anatomical reconstruction of both. Another structure which is, another uh, structure which has been recently been debated in last few years is the anterolateral ligament. 
the combined anterior cruciate ligament and ALL reconstruction is associated with a significant reduction in the ACL graft rupture rates. And the uh, indications are if the patient is younger than 20 years and the, it, if it is uh, the grade 3 pure shift test, the revision ACL reconstruction or if the ACL injury is more than a year old. So it is better to add an ALL reconstruction along with the ACL reconstruction because it, it will take hardly 15-20 minutes to do the procedure but it will definitely add stability to your uh, knee in a chronic setting or in a younger patient. So you take a same hockey stick incision, uh, take a uh, middle half portion of the IT band and prepare it then pass the, that uh, below the LCL, that uh, laxed LCL and into the femoral tunnel and at about 60 degree of the flexion you uh, uh, fix it uh, uh, with the interference screw. Uh, in conclusion, the posterolateral coronal injuries are not as rare as previously thought. Diagnosis of these lesions entail detailed anatomical understanding of the anatomy of the posterolateral coronal. A high level of suspicion is recommended. The failure to address the posterolateral coronary injuries can put a stress on your PCL or ACL graft and can lead to the uh, failure of your reconstruction. The stress radiographs and MRI are very important and also in chronic setting you have to do a scanograph to see the limb alignment. The operative treatment is recommended and that is anatomical uh, reconstruction and early rehabilitation is very important. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I'm inviting uh, Dr. Sundarajan on the talk managing PCL injury. Okay. So the, I think uh, the uh, for the PCL, the anatomy is very, very important. I think all of you know that PCL has got more than twice the size of the PCL and it is important to know the bundles like a ACL. You have that anterolateral bundle and you have uh, the uh, posteromedial bundle, which starts almost from 2 o'clock to 6 o'clock position. It's a fanned out uh, ligament, which is so big uh, compared to the ACL. And also, you know the tibial attachment, it almost 1.5 to 2 centimeters below the posterior articular surface, which is very, very important when you make a PCL reconstruction. At the same time, it is very important to understand that meniscofemoral ligament, which, are, uh, which is in uh, Humphrey and the uh, Whisper, anterior and posterior to the PCL because you should try to preserve that meniscofemoral ligaments when you do on a PCL reconstruction because these also are an important stabilizers for a lateral meniscus. So it is important that most of the time uh, you have only 60 to 70 percent of the patients you will have one of those meniscofemoral ligament but that is a stabilizer for a lateral meniscus. Most often it is not torn so you should try to preserve that. When you come to the isolated PCL injuries, we have around 20 to 40 percent of these injuries are isolated PCL injuries. Um, Unless, uh, unlike ACL, we'll have a less associated injuries, uh, in, especially in damage to the menisci in contrast to the ACL, because the PCL laxity allows the tibia and meniscus to shift posteriorly, resulting in a less injuries. However, it is an unidirectional. We know that though any patient comes with the instability, then that is not a PCL, because PCL patients always, especially isolated ACL insufficiency, will have an anterior knee pain rather than an instability. So these patients will not have any rotational instability, unless they are associated with the lateral or medial sided injuries, as we had talks before. So this is a 22 years old male patient, injury to the right knee, so two weeks old. We can see that they are completely uh, torn in the uh, mid-substance. Naturally, these patients presented with just pain and swelling. Obviously, there was no instability because it's an isolated case. And this patient, we should treat conservatively. This is the same patient, MRI after six months. We can see that complete healing of this uh, case. So it's very important that all these isolated cases, you put on a posterior supporting brace, keep them non-weight bearing for six weeks, reassess, get back the movements, then reassess. Unless it goes to more than grade two or three, then you can do a reconstruction. 
Otherwise, majority of these isolated cases can heal very nicely with the conservative treatment. So, conservative treatment is possible in all grade 1 and 2 injuries and also the two-thirds of these patients as per this study had a continuity of the PCL after treating conservatively. So, significant improvement even the grade uh, 3 patients, it has come back, to, come back to the grade 2 or 1. So, if you have to treat conservatively these patients, even the grade 3 injuries, then many patients will have a very less laxity after they having the conservative management. Even though if you treat conservatively all these patients, we should not forget if these patients has got some chondral injuries. Even if it's in a grade 2, better to address that particular meniscus or chondral injury and you can address the PCL also because the chances of getting arthritis is high as per the literature if they are associated with the chondral injury in grade 2 too. So any patients, uh, can you just select it and uh, grade the access for that? So any patients with the grade 3 PCL injuries, uh, most often uh, uh, that can associate with the postolateral injuries or the middle side injuries, that has to be carefully evaluated and address that situations. Does it have the same as, uh, results like ACL reconstruction? The answer is no, because the laxity which you get, persistent laxity in the PCL is a bit higher than your ACL. Even the hamstring graft in the ACL reconstruction have a laxity. But here, you can improve the laxity from grade 3 to grade 2 or grade 1 in most of the situation, even if you do the reconstruction. So that's why the many of the patients you treat conservatively, they heal, that laxity can come to the same kind of 1 or 2. So the expectation of these patients should be explained that you can have a grade 1 laxity is possible even after doing a reconstruction. Whether to do a single bundle or double bundle, I think the, we are uh, we are known that double bundle, even though it's mechanically uh, mechanical uh, advantage, because of your putting, creating, recreating anatomy, but functional outcome, there is no huge difference between this single bundle and double bundle. So we try to do, we, are, uh, we do mostly single bundle in most of the situation. What technique to use? To use? There are many techniques had come in the literature, like a tibial inlay was very popular in the last decade. Again, I think we had come to the, again, uh, transtibial technique to do a single bundle or double bundle. And most often, we, see, we do a single bundle, that means, Basically, we are reconstructing the anterolateral bundle, which you see here, which is in the from 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock position, which resists the posterior translation. So, so this is very important that when you do a single bundle, make sure that you are recreating the anterolateral bundle reconstruction. So, this is what you see typically when you go in a scopy, you see the lax ACL. If you are a beginner, you should not mistake it's an ACL issue. So, you should do a prior test, then you know that this is a completely normal ACL which is uh, translated posteriorly that results in this laxity. So that means that the PCL is insufficiency. Most often it's a tibial sided injury. So if you see a intraoperative, intraarticular view, you should not think that it's a normal PCL because it's torn in the tibial side. That's why that laxity is in the grade 3. Then you create a septum uh, between your PCL and ACL. You go inside. So that is the anterolateral view. You come through the posterior medial portal and you debride the, uh, separate the capsule from your PCL. This is the posterior medial view which you see that, which you can see the complete uh, tibial fibers uh, detached from that uh, attachment. So it is important that to have a posterior medial view so that you have a direct view of the uh, PCL. And you use the scoop or you can, uh, any elevator to separate it from your, the posterior capsule. You can see the gentle separation can be done using the scoops or elevator. Once you see the footprint, so it is important that your uh, tibial jig goes at least 1.5 centimeter below the posterior articular surface to make an entry point. You can see this commercial jigs, this is arthrax jigs has got a 1.5 centimeter marking. So make sure that, that uh, your elbow bend of that uh, jig sits very well with the posterior articular surface and you keep in the center of the footprint or slightly lateral of that footprint. Don't come very medial so that can impinge in between the medial femoral condyle. So make sure that you go in the center or slightly later, like how we are keeping the jig in the below video. Then you make an entry point keeping around 60 to 65 degree of angle. So this is a flat entry rather than the ACL, you have a more oblique, but the PCL, you have a more flat uh, uh, tunnel, which you make it over there. So this is how you make a tibial entry. To keep the blunt end of the guide wire after putting the uh, first guide wire, then do a serial reaming because you may not have a control when you use a 10 size reamer. So always uh, try to use with, uh, start with a small size reamer, then slowly increase up to nine or 10, depending upon the size of the grab. Then you can, if you, you can make a uh, inside out or outside in technique, there are commercially available outside in jigs are available. I prefer uh, uh, 
lower anterolateral portal and do an inside out. So this is how you make a needle incision through the uh, lower anterolateral portal. Make sure that it hits in the center of the anterolateral bund of your PCL. Then once you have done that, then use 4 or 5 mm of reamer, which you can insert through the lower anterolateral portal. Keep it over the uh, footprint of this anterolateral bundle of the PCL so that you can have that cannulated reamer can have your center of your guide. The guide can go in the center of that cannulated wire so that it makes it the center of your anterolateral bundle. Then you do a serial reaming like 8 mm, 9 mm, depending upon the size. Uh, then you uh, deliver the graft. You can fix with, uh, always you try to use a hybrid fixation of the PCL, both the femoral side and tibial side, to prevent, uh, prevent the laxity as much as possible. So here, adjustable loop was used. Along with that, also I inserted a, uh, a kept interference screw for the better fixation on the femoral side. The tibial side, we can see the aperture fixation where you insert the guide wire and you use that one size more or the same size depending upon the uh, size of the graft and uh, use the, uh, you see through the post medial uh, view and see the entry of your uh, screw. You can see that, that the tip of the screw is coming inside the uh, uh, posterior surface. So that's how you fix the aperture fixation. You can add another button. Usually I use, I use a suture button or the post for the additional fixation. We can use a double bundle re uh, reconstruction uh, in isolated cases where you have the luxury of having more ligaments. So uh, I, I tend to use a double bundle reconstruction in isolated cases in all the multi-ligament situ situations considering the time factor and the graft factor, I do a single bundle reconstruction. When you do a double bundle, so you do a fixation from the outside in, uh, you insert the screws on the both the sides. So this is how you, your ACL is taught after doing the PCL fixation. Just to mention about another four slides about the PCL avulsion fixation. So this is a very common situation, especially in our, our conditions because of the dashboard injury. So you see this avulsion fracture is undisplaced. You can treat conservatively. So anything which is displaced more than 3 mm, these patients will end up with uh, laxity. So better to fix it up. But what to do with the open reduction with internal fixation with the limited posterior approach is a very simple procedure. You can go ahead between the two gastro get and put the two screws, you can come out in 10, 15 minutes time. But whenever you see a fragment like this, you should, you should be very careful that the, usually these patient, fragments are not very big. Usually these patients will have a tear of complete low wire PCL fibers also. So here you need a reconstruction rather than the fixation. So you should plan preoperatively that when you see a fragment like this, better to go uh, uh, re reconstruction rather than the uh, 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 screws. Is another patient, just a last case example of 24 years old, PCL avulsion. You can see that uh, uh, laxity, this patient presented after, uh, after uh, I think, one month or uh, six weeks' time. You can see that complete uh, posterior laxity. That is the avulsion fracture, which you see in the lateral view, completely displaced. That is the MRI uh, picture, which shows the complete avulsion with the displaced uh, uh, fragment. And you can big fix arthroscopically also, because considering that uh, time, I'm not discussing the technique here. I use the uh, both fiber wire technique. Also, I add in a free endo button and take it up. So I do a, like a hybrid fixation for the uh, in through arthroscopically. So what is the, uh, how do you choose whether arthroscopically or a, uh, open reduction? So we did a randomized study between the open reduction and an internal fixation with uh, arthroscopic fixation. It was published in KSSTA uh, two years, uh, three years before which we found that there is no uh, difference. In fact, we had uh, two complications in arthroscopic fixation than the open fixations. We had a two vascular, uh, uh, one case, sorry, one case of vascular injury in the arthroscopic fixation. So it doesn't make any difference. To conclude, all grade three isolated PCL injuries requires reconstruction. Even if it's a grade two with the chondral injury also can be considered for a reconstruction. So being through the post medial portal, it gives you direct visualization for your tibial entry so that you are protecting your neurovascular bundles. And hybrid fixations preferred in PCL reconstruction. And PCL avulsions can be fixed by ORIF with screws or arthroscopic fixation. Doesn't make any difference. Thank you very much. Nice talk, Sundar, as usual. I request you to stay there. Dr. Shreyas and Satish, please be on dais. Any questions Satish. for the faculties? Questions? So I'll have one question to all of you. Uh, you rely more on clinical and stress X-rays or on MRI for the collaterals as well as for PCL injuries? Shreyas. You rely more stress, on... Stress X-rays is only in chronic situations. 
but otherwise uh, predominantly clinical and clinical. mri yeah. so more clinical and x-ray or more on mr so uh, clinical and x-rays okay. anything else sundar or satish you want to add of course in acute uh, cases i don't do a stress x-rays you know clinically you are you know that whether it's stable or unstable so all these cases you assess pre -operative, pre operatively and also mri also will shows that you are collateral injury in any grade 3 injuries can be better assessed intraoperatively rather than the pre operatively again and acute cases what we are talking about so i we assess that grade 3 or uh, all the medial or lateral sided injuries then i again i reassess after your pcl fixation sometimes you get in grade 1 or 2 injuries uh, after fixation it sometimes can be stable especially on the lateral side but at the medial side most often if you see pre operatively grade 3 you yeah, go ahead and do a repair or augmentation or reconstruction like what uh, sri is did in chronic cases come late then always we take a stress x-ray both in 0 degree and also in the 30 degrees to assess whether it's an isolated super like in the medial side isolated superficial mcl injury or is it associated with a pol injury so depending upon that we do a reconstruction in chronic cases anyone wants to ask anything yeah so most of the low velocity uh, kd3 uh, injuries uh, i prefer to do on a single stage so uh, anything uh, which is very stable all the most of the cases are dislocated or a transient dislocation cases so we always we don't operate on the day one all of us know so we put them on a brace for posterior supporting brace in a uh, for a, a couple of uh, days like at least 10 days to 2 weeks time if you want the knee swelling to come down then we mobilize the knee then after uh, getting at least more than 90 degrees we operate on the second week or third week then we do, i do i prefer to do on a single stage reconstruction so when i do on a single stage reconstruction naturally i do a both pcl acl and uh, uh, with the collateral whether to do a repair or augmentation we do that in yeah. unstable an unstable injury in unstable injury if it's a kd4 or if i know that if it's once you do a reduction if the knee is very unstable then we i don't do a single stage then that that cases we will bring back the patient after one week to 10 days you do the address the collateral you put on external fixator then you bring back uh, after 2 to 3 months time for the second stage cruciate re reconstruction yeah tejas uh, so uh, dr sundaraj if you do it you do go for collateral first now if you are doing in a two stage okay if you are doing a two stages so of course collateral is a very important you have to address the collaterals put on external fixator You try to prevent the posterior sag as much as possible then you come back and do the reconstruction before okay. before they go for a fixed posterior laxity uh, deformity the sag. key is to prevent posterior sag whether you do collaterals or you do pcl but to prevent posterior sag in acute setting so the pcl is the central point you know that's mm. why you try to fix the pcl as much as possible so that's why i try to address single stage even if you don't do a reconstruction of the acl it's fine because many patients they don't come back for acl by the time you do address the pcl and collaterals the knee will become stable they will get some kind of stiffness so you don't get any rotator instability so dr sundar rajan i had a, i had a question for you there's a chronic pcl insufficiency the patient has an alignment varus so yes. what is your plan would you do a single stage hto with a pcl reconstruction or only a slope altering hto so we try to do a even the just i i most of the time i had combined both uh, pcl uh, high tibial osteotomy with uh, um uh, pcl reconstruction of course all of us know that by increasing the your posterior slope by just doing osteotomy you reduces your pcl laxity so you can come from grade 3 to grade 2 or sometimes yeah. in a grade 1 so if you open more anteriorly then you give more posterior slope then you can avoid it but uh, sometimes even after doing this uh, high tibial osteotomy i find that sometimes in a grade 2 laxity so i go ahead with uh, reconstruction also if you do a reconstruction i do it in a single stage and do you change the position of the tunnel when you are doing the tibial tunnel vis-a-vis -vis, say only most often i run a few a few cases but most often it comes through the your osteotomy your tunnel will come through the osteotomy even if you go come distal and make an oblique osteotomy because your pcl tunnel you have to go a little slightly 60 mm -hmm. degrees i try to minimize that degrees of pcl normally we keep around 65 degrees i try to minimize that but still somehow that uh, your entry will come through the osteotomy site it doesn't matter because you are fixing it with your plate fixation 
I fill that always with uh, with the gra I, I use aloe graph, but you can yeah. use any auto graph. So always it's not going to affect your tunnel. Sure. Uh, last question, please. Just one question for Satish. Can I ask? Please. Thanks. So, uh, Satish, I just wanted to ask you, what's your protocol for lateral-sided injuries with a common peroneal nerve? So if the patient has a foot drop, how should a person treat it? Uh, if uh, acute injury with a foot drop, uh, I all. I never do acute uh, repair of the PLC, so I will wait, uh, protect it in a brace, and uh, then after uh, uh, four to six weeks, uh, then I do a, a reconstruction of the uh, PLC along with the uh, ACL or PCL, and keep uh, the limb in a uh, brace along with the foot drop support. So when would you do an EMG NCV? When would you take a decision to whether refer it to a microvascular surgeon or you yourself do a no, uh, I will do EMG after uh, six weeks yeah. and then uh, gradually assess every six weeks uh, whether it is uh, recovering or not. If uh, even after uh, four months uh, the that, uh, injury is not recovering, then I can uh, ask a plastic surgeon to do a, a yeah. posterior tibial transfer uh, anteriorly. Okay. Thanks. Sir, sir, one question, one question. Wouldn't the foot drop with the I think, early? Yeah, the other option is because I, I don't think it, it makes any difference in the indications of the surgery of a multi-ligament injury. Of course, it is one of the indications to go and address early where you do a neurolysis when you expose the uh, lateral ligament injuries along with your, once you do a reconstruction, when you do a repair of your postolateral structure, make sure that you expose the nerve, do the neurolysis. Then by the time you know, sometimes if it is in a fresh cut, you can call your vascular uh, surgeon or whatever. Uh, plastic surgeon come and do the repair of the nerve if possible or if it is a just nerve is intact just you do the neurolysis both proximally and distally so that will help the nerve to recover faster a last question please sir uh, is there any difference uh, in the management of plc complex aditya please time in since long please okay, sir, sir. Sir, in avulsion fracture sometimes you found uh, some fibers of pcl or acl also get torn so in that situation what is your take means uh, whether you will fix the avulsion part of the bone or uh, you will go to uh, reconstruction of uh, the bone. That's why the, the preoperatively you know that uh, the x-ray, sometimes you have a comminution or you have a thin slice of the bone which I showed on one x-ray, but other x-rays I didn't show, but sometimes we see a lot of comminution in that fragment. Then that cases you have to be careful, which I showed, uh, Ali told that the lower incision, tibial incision of the PCL fibers might have been torn. So in that case, you have to be prepared for a reconstruction. So if you just go and fix that small, small fragments, that is not going to prevent your laxity. Uh, then they, uh, eventually they end up with, with grade 2 or grade 3 laxity. They will fail. And also fixation also very difficult. So you better to go for reconstruction. If the fragment is uh, sufficient to fix, then in that situation also, you will, if you get some fiber torns of the PCL, yeah, then... Because if fibers are to torn, means it is going to get, it is already stretched out uh, 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 PCL. So by fixing the fragment, your ligament is not going to get taut. Your fibers are already torn. So here, if you're just fixing the bone, why you are fixing the fragment? Whenever the ligament is intact, once you put back the fragment, your ligament is getting taut. But already that lower incisional fiber is torn. If you just fix the fragment, your ligament laxity is going to be persistent. So better to do a reconstruction in that case. I think we stop you, here. I invite Aditya for first case. Presentation, Dr. Sundar, Satish, Dr. Shreyas, please be seated on the sofa as a panelist. Even Dr. Rajiv and Dr. Amit, please be the panelist for this case discussion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Amit. Yeah. Aditya, be on time. I'll request because you are running 10 minutes late now. Okay, sir. So everyone be on time. Yes, sir. I'm presenting a case of a 21-year-old female, history of trauma, three months back, presented with instability and pain in the knee, right side. It was not protected, and from history, it was a valgus injury, knee stuck between the vehicle and the ground. Uh, on clinical examination, uh, there was mild diffusion, mild tenderness, range of movement was minus 10 to 130 degree, anterior drawer grade 3, soft end point, pivot shift grade 2, valgus stress at 0 and 30 degree, it was same, it was uh, soft, Endpoint. Dial test was negative and patellofemoral joint no positive finding. So, radiological finding. Mid substance complete tear uh, at the TBL site, superficial plus Sorry. deep MCL. 
complete ACL tear at the femoral side. This was intraoperative finding at extension at 30 degree flexion, grade 3, valgus stress. Sir, so what will be the treatment protocol for this patient? Three months post injury, 21 year old female. ACL median, MCL grade 3, ACL complete tear, grade 3. So MCL uh, grade 3 and ACL femoral ovulation? Yes, complete tear, mid substance. Uh, mid substance tear yes. and uh, grade 3. Yes, sir. Okay, so it's a. Uh, you have to address both, you know, if you, we know that whenever there is ACL with the grade 3 MCL, yes, it's sir. better to address uh, MCL yes, sir. too. So, uh, we show we do a uh, ACL reconstruction, yes, sir. then you address the medial sided injury. Yes, sir. So, if it is in a femoral avulsion, sometimes even it's in a late conditions, you can be, uh, you can restore, uh, you can repair it back if possible, because sometimes a femoral avulsion will be like a sleeve avulsion, so you can easily repair it. When it comes to the tibial sided or a mid substance, so you have to do a reconstruction. So either you augment, there is fibers are good, you repair it and do augmentation, or it's better to do a direct uh, uh, reconstruction of the MCL. At three months, uh, repair will be feasible, sir. Will it be protecting the ACL also? No, only this uh, femoral avulsion I'm talking about. If it is only okay, about ACL, you're talking about. Here it's a tibial avulsion. It's a tibial avulsion. Here it's a tibial avulsion. Oh, sorry, tibial avulsion MCL. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Here then it's a tibial avulsion. Go back to the MRI slide. Yeah. It's a tibial avulsion. Oh, it, it's, 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 and also it's a retracted. Yeah. Uh, gone gone up to the joint level, yes, so sir. it's very yeah. difficult to repair it after three months' time. Yes, it, sir. It will struck. It is struck. It will not come. Very very difficult to repair it back to the yes. tibial footprint. Then tibial better footprint. do a reconstruction. Intraoperatively, the findings were same, sir. Fibers were not good. Yeah. So went ahead directly with ACLR with plus MCLR. Yeah. Now, what will be the sequence of fixation, sir? Sequence of fixation? Yeah, yes. it, it doesn't matter uh, much for my situation. If anyone else wants to answer, please feel free. <laughs> yeah, Sundar is always there. No, so um, <laughs> the sequence of, so it will be a superficial and a POL. Uh, for me, it will be a reconstruction. Superficial. Sir, but diet test was negative clinically. Oh, sir, how will we differentiate? Because at uh, no, you said at, at thirty degrees and zero degrees. Sir, the, at zero and uh, thirty degrees. The knee uh, was opening up. Okay, but ACL is also gone. Na? So after you after you reconstruct the ACL, yes, you will get a better idea. Yes, but uh, three months old, um, you know, if the instability is just in thirty degrees of flexion, the valgus stress test is positive in thirty degrees of flexion alone. Yes, sir. Then it will be just a superficial, superficial MCL, MCL, but it will be a reconstruction, not a repair for me. Yes. If it is uh, unstable in addition in extension, then I will add a POL reconstruction component. To uh, talk about the sequence, so uh, I would just fix my uh, uh, ACL on either side and uh, then do the uh, conventional open or a percutaneous uh, you know, exposure for the MCL side. But the POL is... Uh, kind of fixed in extension and the superficial MCL component in 30 degrees of flexion with neutral rotation. There should be no external rotation uh, or it, uh, a little bit of varus would help, but no external rotation of the foot for medial sided fixation. That's why uh, either first to fix the femoral uh, ACL part, leave the tibial part, first yeah. uh, complete yeah. the MCL and then fix the tibial part. So I generally, even for multi-ligament, I start from flexion to extension depending on the structures we decide to fix. You fix at one end and then you start from flexion to extension. MCL, I don't think it doesn't make, it makes any difference, but uh, what is important is ACL also gives valgus stability. So many times when you do a ACL fixation, you freeze both on the femoral set and tibial set fixation, your medial opening has get reduced so much. Yes. Thank so you. sometimes in the grade 2 becomes grade 1 or grade 3 becomes grade 2. Yes. So that's how I reassess sometimes. If it is a, after doing ACL fixation, sometimes it's a grade 1 MCL, I don't even put a repair. I just cons uh, treat conservatively that patients. So mm -hmm. even here, the grade 3 injuries, even if it's the ACL, it doesn't, I don't think it makes any difference after fixing, fixing both ACL, femoral and tibial side and go and repair the medial side. Rajiv, you want to add something? I think I, I would like to go in the same way. First, you fix the femoral fixation of the ACL. 
then reconstruct your MCL because you want to in the neutral position and sure. varus knee and then yes. you uh, tighten the TBL, TBL fixation. I think that is the standard technique we follow here. Yeah. Yeah. Because if I will fix the ACL first, it then will be in slight external, external rotation. rotation yeah. yes. So yes. that is the reason, uh, that is the sequence of fixation yes. we usually follow. That yes. was the reason I asked. Uh, did the same as we discussed. Did the femoral fixation first, left the TBL one, did MCL completely and then fix the TBL one. This is post reconstruction valgus stability. Uh, uh, medial joint line is not opening at valgus stress. Post of X-ray. This is functional recovery at six months. Post so it was only superficial MCL. You need to say. Sir, deep, deep part also gone. POL. POL was not sir. It was okay. So in extension it was not opening. No sir, it was opening, but ACL was also gone, no sir. But dial test was negative. So, so you, how you assist on table then? Whether POL was not required. Sir, uh, after fixing the ACL one part, I just pulled it and uh, yeah, look for that. How much press? You may be pulling it too hard. Yeah, that's true. So that's but that was the point to differentiate it. whether and dial so test preoperatively also was ACL helpful. ACL full fixation with neutral rotation. That's why I think uh, doing ah. the ACL full fixation ah. and, and then, then you assess have a the good medial uh, laxity will be better. better. And then, then you can uh, decide whether you have to reconstruct UL also along with uh, uh, superficial MC. Yes. 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 Okay. But preoperatively, we can judge by dial test, sir, whether the uh, anteromedial translation is there or not. How so if it's there, it means just so very difficult to assess. Is it so easy, dial test and all to Sir, interpret? Sir, if the posterior oblique ligament is gone along with ACL MCL, the, uh, the, the translation will be quite uh, uh, so significant, sir. It won't be uh, that less as you are saying. Okay. And intraoperatively also P... Yes, th that's what I said, that, sir, after femoral fixation, I checked it uh, with the dial test again. It was not opening, so I was... TBI is yet to be fixed. No? Sir, I pulled it at the TPL side. That that's depends on your skin. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. That's what I said, sir. That I was pulling it at the TBL and then flexion and checking it again. Nice recovery. Nice output. Thank you, sir. Navid, bhai, please. More than the which will fix first. The most important is that they are addressing that the MCL is very important. That yes, is what yes. That is what that is the oh, message. The message it has to be take. No, do not ignore the grade three MCL. It is very dangerous. So yes. otherwise your ACL is also going to fail. Okay, yes, so that sir. is the message you conveying. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Hi. So, uh, Aditya, one way of uh, taking out that doubt is doing it all inside. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, again, a medial sided multiligament. Uh, a 39 year old male, uh, he's a, a software uh, company guy at a very high position. He fell down uh, two weeks before he presented to me uh, while riding a bicycle. He had a twisting injury to the left knee and when he came he had pain, swelling, instability and inability to walk and restricted range of motion. <clears throat> so on examination uh, he had uh, effusion, his range of motion was 5 to 90 degrees which was very painful. He had a posterior sag, he had a valgus stress positive, he had an anterior drawer and a latchman positive a posterior drawer positive. There was no uh, distal neurovascular deficit, no wounds. This was his x-ray. Uh, I don't do stress x-rays uh, because we are anyways uh, doing MRIs, x-rays. Stress x-rays are basically for academic purpose, at least for me. This is an MRI. So these are the relevant sections. Anyone would like to comment on this?
tibial side yeah. MCL. Yeah, so the MCL is torn from the tibial side and, all ACL and, and, PCL and the ACL and PCL are gone. So my question, again, how do we proceed? It's two weeks. Amit, can we start with you? Navit, I would like to uh, wait for one more week, at least three weeks, for the capsular uh, healing. And then uh, I would straight away go in a single stage PCL and uh, post uh, medial uh, MCL reconstruction. Okay, okay, so you are going to reconstruct all the three in one go after PCL one week? PCL and MCL is my priority. ACL if needed, if uh, ligaments permit and time permit, then. Okay. Anybody who would go in at that moment and try to repair the MCL? Usually tibial sites, usually uh, it's better to go for reconstruction. Femoral side, they heal well with an anchor. So if this patient comes so to you like three days after injury, you'll still do a reconstruction? I'll wait. So here we can go, it's only two weeks. As Amit also told, wait a week more, get some rehab ROM movements and you can go and repair MCL because it's a sterner type of lesion and it's only three weeks. You can get it down and do ACL and PCL reconstruction with MCL repair. So you will be repairing it. He's saying he'll reconstruct it. I'll repair and do ACL PC because it's only two we weeks. Can, on three weeks, uh, if it's repairable, the tibial side, we can repair it. But of course, we should wait for three weeks. Otherwise, if you uh, go on second, third day, uh, and repairing only the medial structures, and patient can land up with uh, stiffness, and again, two, three months, two surgeries. So practically, I would think uh, to wait for three weeks and whatsoever. Let's repair it. Tibial avulsion can be repaired uh, after two weeks. But then you have to stage your surgery that first you do a MCL repair using an anchor on the TBL attachment. And then after four to six weeks, then you can go again and do ACL, PCL at both one setting. And why not do all the three at one go at, at two weeks? Two weeks will be too early. There might be no, a here stiffness as it, post operatively. stiffness was there. That's uh, the reason. You uh, told five to 90 only. And painful, right. quite painful it was. Right. Any any changes? Any, any difference of opinion? So, uh, whenever... Uh, I do a repair of the collateral, I mean the medial collateral, I always augment it. Just uh, isolated repair is not uh, enough because if it stretches out with time, it can be quite challenging. Uh, yeah, I agree. Reconstruction may not be required in the early presentation. And I would do all three together. And in two weeks is fine. As I said earlier, I mean all my KD3 injuries, I assess different because all the KD3 injuries are not same. You'll have a low grade you know, islands, you have a high, high grade injuries. I usually assess some knees are very swollen, some knees are slightly swollen. Mm -hmm. They get early range of movements quickly. Some patients, some patients takes time. So, recently, it's already two, two weeks' time. So, I'm sure that knee might be quite now. The alignment looks good. That means it's a stable knee, it is not unstable. So, I get them the ROM, like Mugesh said, I would get at least more than 90 degrees movements. I put them another one week to put a range of movements, whether in house or they can go home and come back. Then after the, uh, once you get back more than 90 degrees, then I do a single stage recon. Naturally, we don't need to have a pre-op idea whether do a repair or augmentation, but it should be ready for everything. Uh, I, after doing the PCL and ACL, I reassess the quality of the tibial side. Fibers are good. Naturally, it's like a pullout. Sometimes you will be able to get it. Sometimes it's good for more than three weeks. Sometimes very difficult. Even the tibial side injuries will not come back. The fibers are strapped. Then you are already ready that with your another plan, plan B, we do on a reconstruct. Right. So, uh, no conservative management here. And uh, who would go for staged procedures? I mean, would you stage this, the three ligaments? So would no, you stage we, we go for conservative manager, management also. As I said, by the time I have three weeks, that's why I get a range of movements of more than 90 degrees in some low velocity injuries. You will not see this posterior laxity at all. By the time that knee gets get stabilized, I treat conservatively in low grade, grade the KD3 is possible. So I have. But sir, if you see the tibial uh, detachment case, of the MCL, also, that's I'm talking of this case. Only this case is fine. Because I have what the message so this to case, there's no, what I'm saying there's is that you can treat some low velocity yeah, KD3 yeah, yeah, injuries yeah. conservatively. So when there's a mid substance case. MCL, that, that, that time no, we yeah, understand. This case, yeah. This case, yeah. So, stage procedures? No? All in one go? Anyone for stage procedures? No? Okay. And what would be your graft options? 
संदीप सो विच ग्राफ फॉर वॉट सिक्योरिटी फॉर पोस्टर इयर वन एंड फॉर द एसीएल आई एम स्ट्रिंग ओके एम सी एल सो आई एल यूज द एम स्ट्रिंग ओनली फॉर द एम सी एल एज वेल सो द इप्सी लैटरल हेम स्ट्रिंग इप्सी लैटरल एवरीथिंग फ्रॉम द सेम नेम ओके अमित एनी वन यूजिंग पेरोनियस पेरोनियस इज अ वेरी गुड ऑप्शन फॉर मल्टी लिगमेंट फॉर पी सी एल पेरोनियस इज अ गुड ऑप्शन एंड इन एडिशन टू दैट कॉन्ट्रालेटरल इफ यू नीड टू रिकन्स्ट्रक्ट द एम सी एल वी कैन हैव अ कॉन्ट्रालेटरल एम स्ट्रिंग ऑल्सो एंड इप्सी लैटरल एम स्ट्रिंग फॉर द ए सी एल ऑगमेंटेशन इज गुड इफ एम सी एल देन वी कैन स्टेट अवे गो विथ इप्सी लैटरल ग्राफ्ट ओके सो लॉट ऑफ ऑप्शन अवेलेबल यू कैन यूज वॉट एवर ग्राफ्ट यूर कम्फर्टेबल विथ दिस वॉज लाइक फाइव ईयर्स फोर ईयर्स बैक uh i uh sta i proposed a, a two staged a procedure to the person and uh, <clears throat> in the first stage after a couple of days of uh, cooling down the knee i uh, advised him a mcl repair slash reconstruction i uh, am using the danish technique i'll just show you what it is and uh, plus a pcl all inside reconstruction and once we get a range of motion we do the second stage acl so my graft choices were ipsilateral hamstring for the mcl uh, which is actually the danish technique uh, uses the ipsilateral hamstring and the uh, ipsilateral peroneus longus for the pcl so when i uh, opened the medial side this is what i got uh, so the tissues were not that great i usually feel that if you have to repair a mcl it's about 10 days or so is the best time before which you should be able to repair after that it becomes very difficult so that is where we decided not to repair this rather reconstruct so this is the danish technique in which they uh, it's uh, proposed by dr martin lind uh, so what they do is they uh, harvest the semi t uh, with a open tendon stripper leaving the end uh, leaving the attachment on the pes region intact and then they change the direction of the uh, of the fibers by putting two anchors over here then you go up double the tendon a little uh, bit take whip stitches create one single tunnel on the femur uh, posterior and proximal to the medial epicondyle and then root the uh, the end part of the graft into the pol tunnel so i'll just show you what it is so it looks like this so that's the semit there are two anchors over there that goes inside and there's the femoral tunnel there we fix it with a screw and if you see that pol at the end in flexion should be lax and in extension it should be tightened so this is the superficial mcl and that's the pol there and then we repaired whatever uh, we could of the superficial mcl and the uh, retinaculum over there this is the uh all inside pcl this is the uh, tibial side the graft going in going from the posterior medial portal and that's the femoral side so that's a taut pcl there so this is what we did in the first stage then after 9 weeks of rehab uh we got a range of motion uh of 0 to 140 degrees the anterior draw was still positive the patient had no other laxity he was walking partial weight bearing with a walker and hinge knee brace so and this is his examination before the second stage so if you see he just has a an anterior drawer and that's the valgus laxity maybe a grade 1 but it, i would say it is because of the uh, deficient acl as of now so this is uh, what i saw so there were a lot of uh, fibrosis adhesions in the notch uh, in the area of the acl which was deficient the pcl graft looked decent to me i removed all this tissue using a rf is much better over here and so that's the pcl it looked taut to me so we did a uh, all inside acl reconstruction and that's the graft there it's getting cinched onto the femoral side 
and that is this post-op x-ray. And that is his four years follow-up. So this was like day before yesterday he sent me this. Pasvi sir, any comments on the technique uh, and was I just lucky? No, I think I will say patient was lucky to have found you. Ah. <laughs> should address ACL in second stage. Should we rehab and start him more activities and if he comes with instability then go in or you should just as Navid went in at uh, two months, two and a half months and did because the patient was still not doing complete weight bearing. So I think if uh, what I would have done differently is that if I'm doing the PCL, I would have done the ACL at the same time. One go only. Yeah, probably I don't uh, see much sense in delaying so, the ACL when you're doing the PCL. But I agree, sir. This was like yeah. four years back. Yeah, now, now, today, if this patient comes to me, I would have done a single stage now. Absolutely. Sorry? Yeah, you can <laughs> say so. <laughs> so, no harm if doing stage also, but PCL should be done first, given a chance. PCL and collaterals. Yeah, probably, if you're doing staged, then why... <laughs> If you're doing the PCL in the first stage, then why not do the ACL in the first stage? As he but can if, do it as he's saying no, no, four no. years back. Then yeah, if you're doing the stage, one are, if yeah. it is stage, then it will just should just be collaterals in stage one and then cruciates in stage two. But so then the sag will not affect the collateral here. You have to protect it with a with PTS, PTS brace, brace yeah. and with a PCL brace. So after surgery for PCL, always use a PTS brace for three weeks, to four weeks, well. and then you have to use a PCL brace for at least three months. That will prevent that grade one sack that comes afterwards. And then go for cola, cruciates, both cruciates. In Correct. Right. Thanks. 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 But bracing is most important after PCL. Yeah. That's what I said. No, if you do, don't do ACL after doing a PCL reconstruction, patient will not come back with rotational instability for ACL reconstruction. I agree. Plus reassess, you assess then say that you have a grade two dryer and you do <laughs> second stage. Right. Patient will not have any symptoms. Right. Thanks, Navid Bhai. May I invite Dr. Samir now? Good afternoon, all. Uh, I'm presenting a case for the anterior ligament and the PLC injury. This was a patient, 23-year-old male patient with history of uh, injury while playing kabaddi and main complaint were pain and instability. Uh, on clinical examination, the anterior drought test and the Lachman test were positive, as well as the there is the grade 3 uh, opening on the virus test in 30 degree. This was the X-ray, this is a stress X-ray. Uh, the AP standing X-ray is showing the normal alignment. There was an opening of almost four centimeter, uh, four millimeter as compared to the opposite side, which is suggestive of a grade three injury. This was the MRI finding, which was suggesting of a complete ACL rupture, as well as the rupture of the uh, popliteus tendon, as well as there was a uh, root, posterior root tear of the lateral meniscus. So this is the case, 23 year old Kabaddi player with complete ACL tear and lateral miscarriage and root tree PLC instability. Yes, Samit, what will you do in this particular case? It's three months, two months. Is there any role for uh, conservative treatment or? He has gone through rehab. His range of motion is good now and course yes. is okay. Yes. So straight away, uh, he'll go with uh, 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 PLC reconstructions by Laprat procedure. ACL reconstruction and lateral meniscus posterior root repair straight away in single stage. Right. Actually, any role for uh, repair of the PLC along with the ACL reconstruction? It, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's already three months old. So two months. Two, two, so, better to do reconstruction. So, so the repair is only indicated within the three, uh, three weeks time. Three weeks time, I suppose. So, even if you're doing a, attempting a repair, in the, suppose this patient has presented to us within three weeks. Uh, Dr. Satish. Would you like to answer, in, if, if this patient is presented with three weeks, what will be your management? Uh, if uh, there is a complete uh, posterolateral uh, tear, laxity of, I mean, tear of the uh, 
popliteus along with the fibular collateral ligament and if it is presenting before the three weeks then uh, I can go for the uh, repair of the PLC structure first and then uh, uh, immobilize him uh, uh, for... So, you will go for a stage procedure? Uh, if, if there is a complete uh, posterior lateral structure uh, uh, injury along with the ACL. Okay. Dr. Shreyesh, would you like to add something? Uh, so, for posterior lateral corner injuries, uh, unlike the medial side injuries, repair does not work. Yes. So, reconstruct very early. Uh, and that would be my uh, plan of uh, management for this case. So it will be an ACL reconstruction, lateral meniscal root repair with a PLC reconstruction. Right. So in case of acute scenario, would you like to uh, repair as well as augment or only straight no, away go if repair? You, if you see the literature, unlike the medial side, there is clear evidence that PLC repair will yes. not work. Yes. Except the, whenever there is an avulsion injury, we can repair it. Yes. And the mid-substance injuries which are there, that needs to be managed with the help of the uh, uh, reconstruction. So, uh, we will go for the reconstruction in this particular case. So, what are the uh, graft options in this particular case? Dr. Sundarajan, ACL and PLC. The same you can use, uh, like, uh, like how you use another ACL, MCL, you can use even the peroneus longus and the ipsilateral hamstring. Or you can use a uh, allograft. I, we, I do use a lot of allografts because we have allograft facility. But you can use the peroneus longus, the ipsilateral hamstring, if you want to keep it in the same side. So you will like to use the uh, peroneus longus for the ACL? ACL. Yes, ACL. Yes. And the same ED for the PLC. PLC. Yeah. Thank you. And what will be indications for uh, osteotomy in uh, patients which are presenting in uh, chronic cases? Yes, Dr. Amit. In chronic cases, uh, we can uh, decrease the, I mean, increase the slope to uh, 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 in PLC deficient knee. Uh, it is ACL plus sorry. PLC. Okay, okay. For ACL, of course, then uh, we can uh, decrease the slope because increased slope causes more. So, are you going to uh, focus more on to the alignment? Yeah, of course. We will alignment. get a scanogram done. And so, virus vargas alignment or yeah. you both to tend to increase this slope, uh, modify this First slope. of all, we will get a scanogram and then we yeah. plan accordingly. Uh, uh, both in AP and lateral, uh, we will correct the virus deformities present and uh, increase the uh, decrease the slope so that ACL is also be addressed and lateral virus will also be addressed, I suppose. This patient, chronic PLC deficient, must be working with the virus thirst key. So, we will go uh, accordingly with the given literature. First of all, scanogram, plan accordingly, then by planner osteotomy, uh, correcting the slope and addressing yeah. both the pathologies. Uh, Dr. Uh, Amit, would you like to add something? Would you like to do, play with the scope in this particular no. case? If he's a younger patient, I may do, and with virus, do only coronal alignment correction, yes. do ACL reconstruction. No need to alter the slope. Right. And the lateral compartment may get taught in later on. Right. So, but in your case, it will be all reconstruction. Yes. So there are the indications for uh, slope correction. I said uh, many of the patient with PCL and PLC injury, after the slope correction, they may become unsymptomatic and they may not need the surgery. But in this particular case, definitely we'll have to go for the uh, reconstruction. And which technique? Anybody uh, going to do another technique apart from laparides or a sling technique or the uh, anatomic technique? I routinely do the Larson's type of procedure. Okay. I don't do the laparide. There are, there are a few indications like a hyperextension of the yes. knee or a proximal tibiofibular joint disruption. Uh, but of course, uh, you know, people who have uh, access to allografts can easily do that. Um, so, uh, for me, uh, because I only use autographs, uh, I just do the Larson's for the PLC. And I your think graft of choice yes, is there are so many grafts now, both sides. Yeah, I... That should not be the so indication not to do hamstring. So, for a three-ligament injury, I will use ipsilateral hamstring, contralateral hamstring. Uh, and uh, for collateral, uh, use the two gracilis together. So, semi-T for ACL, semi-T for PCL, two gracilis for... Uh, the PLC. Two and gracilis for yeah, the... If it's a four ligament injury, uh, in present day, I will add a quads tendon. But I don't do peronia. Okay. So, do we get enough collagen with the two uh, gracilis? Because the gracilis is a very... Uh, yeah. So, six millimeter graph. gracilis and, the, also and the times length. two. 
so i mean this is just a option uh, yes. obviously if it is uh, it is a big patient then i will uh, take a cord tendon for the one of the cruciates and use the semity for the uh, the collateral dr sundarajan what was your choice of uh, reconstruction for this case or uh, this case was? So this case we have only uh, ACL. Usually I assess all the other indications. He told about the laparada, like a proximal femoral joint yes. disruption and hyperextension. So I see that the lateral opening is alone. It is not much external rotation. The dial test is not very grossly positive. It's not grossly externally rotating. Yes. Then I do just modified Larsen okay. with the leave it off. Or if it is a uh, external rotation with the grade three opening, then I do a laparada technique. I try to use a single tunnel in the femoral side because it's a lateral cell already have an ACL tunnel. So I try to use a single tunnel uh, to uh, minimize the uh, damage to the your lateral femoral condyle. So I use a single, uh, not a typical laparade, sometimes use a single tunnel in the femoral And side. how do you uh, identify the location for this tunnel? So you, so, so you, this, this is just, uh, you, you know how much distance between your uh, LCL attachment and your... It is 18 millimeters. It is 18, 1.8 mm. Yes. So, so very many times, that is, a, that is a study by, you know, cadaveric study. So many times we don't get that much big femur. You, if right. you, you, our patients especially, you have, sometimes you have a smaller space, you don't get even that. So when you make it a 10 size tunnel or 8, 9 size or 8 size tunnel, it, goes to, it is going to occupy your LCL and also your popliteal tissues so to make that central depression. So I yes. make that uh, area over there, so it covers almost that, that uh, both covering the both LCL and the popliteal attachment. Right. And uh, what is the sequence of fixation in case of, uh, if you are doing anatomy fixation? I uh, like a laparada you are talking about? Yes. So you, 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 you I fix that ACL, I mean, you, you, you prepare everything. You fix the femoral tunnel, you prepare the tibial tunnel for the ACL, then I do the femoral tunnel and tibial tunnels for the laparada. Then I fix the uh, tibial side at ACL first, then I do the, uh, I think, uh, with, uh, uh, for, uh, for the uh, popliteus is lost, the fix is lost, let it in extension. Uh, um, another is about it, you are, uh, LCL around 30 to 40 degrees of flexion, you fix it up. Okay. And Dr. Shreya? Of, co of course, before that, you fix that your femoral tunnel with your another screw. Yes. <laughs> and then before you go back to the tibial sided. Right. Uh, Dr. Shreya, uh, how will you prevent the tunnel coalescence in such uh, cases, even in the Larson technique? So prepare the femoral side for the ACL and the PLC without passing the graft. So put okay. a guide wire and have okay. a, okay. know, a landmark so you don't uh, violate or you know, coil is the tunnel. Okay, but that will prevent, uh, by not putting the graft, and before doing the lateral thoracic reconstruction, so, you are preventing the damage while preparing the, uh, damage to the ACL graft during the tunnel. So but any, any precautions while, uh, to avoid the tunnel coilage? One can also use a suture on the femoral, so I do all inside for my okay. ACLs. Okay. So, uh, you know, either somebody, uh, we, we can have a beef pin uh, sticking out of the femoral side, or use a suture. So when you are passing the PLC uh, tunnel or socket for the, uh, you know, then it does not uh, violate the ACL femoral socket. So after the preparation of the tunnel, we will pass the uh, PLC femoral graft first and then the ACL graft, right? When I both the femoral... I'm just, pass, uh, I'm just passing. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Correct. Anterior and our, yeah. Right. So there is the literature has shown there are the various studies which have been shown that uh, by altering the direction you can prevent the tunnel coalescence. So I first drill the femoral ACL tunnel. Right. And then uh, put uh, uh, scope in the anteromedial uh, portal, and then uh, drill the uh, your uh, isometric point uh, tunnel for uh, this uh, PLC reconstruction, and then see if that uh, beat pin is not coming into the uh, ACL femoral tunnel. That. That's how you can check the uh, Yes, that's a very uh, good Samir, you, Please go ahead. We are running 20 minutes late. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Dr. Tapas, right. wants to oh, add something. No, no, no. Yes. Nothing. The easiest way to do this is to do outside in ACL tunnel. So your yes, postlateral corner tunnels have to be anatomic. You can't yeah. compromise. Right. Your ACL insertion point has to be anatomic. So the and best way to do is to drill your tunnels. You are sure that uh, you are not. And then do outside in. Anyway, we exposed everything. 
right so what you did so i'll just skip through this post operative mm-hmm. protocol so we did uh, uh, acr reconstruction using the uh, peroneus uh, peroneus longus graft there was a root tear which was managed with the inside out technique and the, uh, the plc was managed with the laparis technique so we reconstructed the both the collateral fcl as well as the pop- uh, popliteus and the uh, ligament and this is the clinical outcome at uh, three months is the right side is operated good one yes <laughs> So the take-home message is: in every case of ACL, we should if they, you should always look for PLC injuries, and they need to be managed to prevent the early ACL prevail, uh, early uh, ACL uh, yeah, failure. And also on MRI, if there is any uh, signal changes on the anteromedial femoral condyle, which will uh, uh, give a clue to the PLC injury and osteotomy in cases, chronic cases with varus alignment. Thank you. I will request Shreyas to please felicitate. our speakers dr aditya and dr samir with the momento dr samir I'll also request Shreyas to please felicitate our chairpersons, Dr. Abhinav and Dr. Kiran. Now we move to our next session, that is patellofemoral session. I'll request chairpersons Dr. Aditya Bhotra, Dr. Suyog Rati, and Dr. Savket Munra to please chair the session, and Dr. Jagdeep Sir to please start his talk. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, that is the million dollar question uh, everybody thinks uh, when uh, they are uh, encountering any patient of patellar dislocation uh, so for that we have to do a clinical as well as the radiological assessment of various parameters that are uh, encountered first uh, the clinical that is uh, mm, the patterns of dislocation everybody knows acute recurrent habitual is when every time the knee flexes the patella dislocates and you cannot keep it in that reduced position throughout the range of movement uh history wise it is either fall a classical position in uh, a fixed tibia internal rotated femur and uh, quadriceps contraction so this is uh, in uh, position of the work but uh, you must assess whether the trauma is significant trauma that will cause you acute dislocations or it is a uh, Uh, there are some underlying pathologies that are causing uh, dislocation because of trivial trauma so uh, what are the functional uh, abnormalities that you can see this is uh, what we call as the j sign uh, this i would like to elaborate because there is many times confusion this is actually a uh, inverted j that uh, the track is uh, taken by the patella uh, when it is when the knee is in motion it indicates that there is patellar mal tracking so this is a uh, case uh, of a uh, adolescent girl uh, where the you can see a classical uh, j sign this is a big j sign that you uh, will appreciate in a little while from now so this case i had uh, al- also discussed with sachin tapasvi and uh, then we went ahead and uh, did a soft tissue reconstruction that is uh, by the basket weave technique we uh, did uh, reconstruction of the mpfl because in a pediatric age group we cannot do a bony procedure and she uh, went ahead and did very well so this is a classical big j sign that you must appreciate and another other are the apprehension test which you all know about 
cube angle it is uh, largely now overtaken by the uh, ct and mri measurements like tt tg distances uh, patella tilt in 20 degrees of flexion to know how much uh, patella is moving by keeping the um, uh, fingers on the medial side and thumb on the lateral side and trying to tilt the patella uh, but uh, mainly the assessments go after clinically they go in uh, for the radiological assessments of different parameters to know whether there are any structural abnormalities uh, that uh, cause this dislocation uh, quick overview of the imaging uh, mainly the x-rays but uh, MRI and CT they have now superseded imaging but uh, a quick glance you can see uh, the where the patella stands uh, by comparing it with the Blumen sets line but there are various indices to show that it is a higher adding patella by uh, knowing the insult which salivative is, which is a gold standard or its modification or black bulb pearl or CD uh, measurements uh, these are the various modifications of the insult salivati, all these points toward whether the patella is normally or it is higher riding or patella alta, what, what you call. Now, coming for uh, the track of the patella or the trochlea, uh, I would like to elaborate, take time to elaborate. Uh, this is the normal depth of the trochlea, the black uh, point. So, the line of the trochlea is behind the two. Uh, femoral condyles so this is a normal trochlea so you must must have read what is the crossing sign when uh, the trochlea moves up so that it becomes shallow this black spot moves ahead and the line is seen crossing the two femoral condyles that is why it is called as a crossing sign when it becomes still uh, more like convex then the medial uh, femoral condyle which is now become hypoplastic it forms uh, another line behind the femur, uh, lateral femoral condyle and th that is called as a double contour sign. This is this uh, diagram also explains the trochlear hypoplasia and then the double contouring. So these are uh, elaborated in the classification by Dijo where you have either the crossing sign or the double contour or the supratrochlear spurs. So the next time you come across x-ray then you are sure that the crossing sign is because of the radiographic line of trochlear sulcus that crosses the projections of the two femoral condyles. If it is a double contour sign, then the second contour is because of the hypoplastic medial facet, which is posterior to the lateral facet in the lateral view. There are other indices to know uh, the problems faced with patellar maltracking, like the patellar tilt or the trochlear inclination angle, which is if less than 12 degrees is uh, not normal or trochlear facet asymmetry or trochlear depth which is usually 5 millimeter but if it is less than 3 then it is not normal or uh, excessive femoral antiversion if it is more than 25 degrees then that may lead to uh, patellar instability. The role of CT scan is very much helpful more so in the distal uh, alignment to know the TT TG distance or the tibial tubercle or the trochlear groove distance. This distance is measured by CT scan and usually it is around 10 to 15, 15 to 20 is borderline, but definitely more than 20 is pathological. So these uh, uh, there are various studies which now come with the uh, patella instability severity score where a lot of uh, risk factors are taken into con consideration. But as you can see, only trochlear dysplasia has got two points, which indicates that uh, uh, it is uh, very uh, essential to maintain the stability of the uh, patellar tracking. And if the score is more than four, then there are very high chances that the patella is likely to discuss, uh, uh, dislocate in the years to come. So there are uh, other uh, terms that is what is called as WARFs and STED. What is that? Uh, WARFs is for the clinical presentation of a weak or traumatic risky anatomy pain and subluxation in any person or whether it is a very strong normal anatomy with instability and dislocation. So if it is a weak hyperlax individual with apprehension positive or traumatic with a positive J sign with a risky anatomy or with pain and subluxation, what is the significance? 
there are high chances that the patella is likely to dislocate because of associated all the abnormalities which make, make it vulnerable. There are few studies which uh, have come up where we m uh, measure the patella tendon with the lateral trochlear ridge distance. It uh, says that it gives a quantitative description of patellar containment and measurement to assess how well this trochlea will contain the extensor mechanism. You can uh, read the details in the uh, 2018 article. So recent advances in uh, uh, management of uh, patellofemoral instability uh, uh, as regards the indic uh, investigations is that we have now uh, developed uh, computation models which uh, incorporate the various data of the uh, patients for surgical planning of this purpose. But definitely the future would be in dynamic imaging which uh, helps us in understanding the kinematics of the patellofemoral joint and differentiate it from the patient as well as from the healthy subject. This is the recent most uh, uh, publication in the April 2022. But as of now, the take home message for all of you is uh, definitely uh, if PT distance is more than 20, it is abnormal or uh, in cell CD, if it is more than 1.3, it is not normal. You could think of uh, surgery. Uh, as far as clinical is concerned, you should uh, think about uh, abnormality in patella tracking when uh, there is a repeated fall of uh, a patient because uh, as you know, uh, in pediatric age group, uh, repeated falls, if you remove other causes of falls, then you must think of patellar instability. In adults, uh, there is a confusion sometimes that there is ACL injury or it is patellar instability. But with ACL injury, there is unlikely to be fall with trivial trauma. But if he falls down for some reason, then you must definitely think of patellar instability. Like... Uh, in Marathi, I, if I can conclude, uh, I will say, Parat Parat Parto Patela Paha. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Sandeep Biraris for his talk on MPFL reconstructions. Um, good afternoon, respected chairperson and my dear colleagues. I will be talking on MPFL deconstruction. So what I'm going to give overview of various techniques which I have come across in the literature. So uh, why we need to do MPFL reconstruction? Because it gives passive restraint to the lateral displacement of the patella. And uh, when you contemplate uh, MPFL, then that time you should know the anatomy. So as the, these three layers mentioned by Warren and Marshall, the most superficial layer being vastus medialis and the sartorial fascia, the middle one which consists of MPFL and superficial MPFL, and the third layer that is the deepest layer, joint capsule and the MPTL. So we need to be, whenever we place our graft, we need to be uh, superficial to the third layer, so in between, like you should be in the intermediate layer. So as mentioned by various cadaveric studies by Nomura and Laprad et al. So we know the uh, ACL origin is at the distal to the adductor tubercle and it is uh, uh, superior and posterior to the medial epicondyle and its width is around 15 millimeter and then it inserts onto the superior half of the medial border of the patella and it covers almost 40% uh, of the total patellar length proximally. So uh, non-operative treatment is the treatment of choice for the first time dislocators except the indications being recurrent instability, failed conservative measures, then painful subluxations, loose osteochondral lesions, etc. So there are certain uh, indications or contraindications when you not to do perform isolated MPFLR, been bony mal alignments and dysplasia. So all these uh, condition needs to be addressed on a uh, separate basis. So you need to do assessment as mentioned by Dr. Jagtap sir in a complete extension and try and check the apprehension if you are able to dislocate the patella on the laterally. Then during diagnostic arthroscopy, you might see subtle changes of MPFL rupture or MPFL injuries. So there are various graft options 
hamstrings, semitendinosus or gracilis, quadriceps, patellar tendon as well, peroneus longi, and many other. So fixation over the patella when you are planning to do so various modalities for fixation over the patella being 3.5 mm anchors, knotless anchors, bony tunnels, then soft tissue procedures like basket view techniques, quadriceps sleeve techniques, making a bony trough. Then fixation over the femur. So you need to find the isometric point. So that is shortal point where it in the lateral to lateral x-ray, uh, posterior border of the femur corresponds. Uh, you draw the posterior border line over the posterior border of the femur and then tangent on this line, 90 degrees perpendicular onto the posterior border of the Blumensatz line. So whatever is anterior to this angle will be the shortest point. So that's the point for isometric point for femoral fixation of uh, MPFL. So in these various techniques, this femoral fixation point has been the same, but everyone has gone there different modifications for the TBL fixation of patellar fixations. So when you do final tightening, knee is usually placed at 20 to 30 degrees of flexion because it gives maximum restraint in 30 degrees of flexion. And while final tightening, you should be able to see that there should be a minimum one centimeter of lateral displacement after finding final tightening. So there are various techniques. So the first one being this chassain technique where soft tissue graft is taken, which is uh, tied with the anterior superficial anterior sleeve, uh, periosteal soft tissue sleeve of the patella. Then it is rerouted over the capsule and then tied onto the medial structures. The other uh, technique being this one, where the horizontal oblique tunnel is drilled from uh, inferior part of the medial patella going towards the laterally and superiorly. Then graft is passed uh, through this tunnel and fixed onto the isometric point with the interference screw. The next one being suspensory fixation, where two tunnels are being drilled in the patella and the one at the isometric point. Then with the help of adjustable loop, graft is rooted uh, with uh, that adjustable button into the femur and both the ends of the graft uh, passing through these both the tunnels of the patella and then final tightening is done uh, as uh, when you tighten this adjustable device this is also one of the technique this is different model of fixation in the patella then another one being two tunnels drilled over the patella on the uh, superior aspect then graft is uh, shuttle through these two tunnels, then same way passed under the over the capsule, and then uh, there is a tunnel drilled into the femur, and the graft tied uh, tied on the um, lateral aspect of the femur with the adjustable uh, endo button loop. So that's the exit of this technique. Then the other uh, uh, various techniques they have taken autograft of the fascia lata from the distal thigh. Then this graft is split into two. Then later on, tunnels into the patella, fixed on the patellar side. Then they are tied into the isometric point of the femur. Another technique is soft tissue loop, so where soft it is barely soft tissue procedure. So you take two incisions, one on the anterior aspect and one on the middle of the patella. Take the graft, then pass the graft through the soft tissue and periosteal sleeve, as shown in this picture. Then tie the knots uh, with the, uh, take the stitches at the four different corners to give the stability and you can tie this remnant on the medial aspect near the adductor magnus uh, sleeve. Then there are uh, techniques where without, they have not used any anchor or tunnel, it is merely make a slit into the medial periosteal sleeve of the patella, then uh, root your graft through it, then uh, tie the graft ends with each other and shuttle into the femur. Arthrex have come with this putting the uh, swivel lock anchors onto the medial side of the patella. Then they have they provide this radiolucent scale where you can it helps you mark the uh, shuttle's point and then you tie the, the distally at, uh, I mean at the, over the femur with the interference screw. Then in cases of open physis, this particular technique was mentioned where they identify the adductor magnus tendon sleeve 
then two tunnels so one tunnel on the proximal most aspect on the medially and one anterior aspect then they connect these two tunnels pass the graft through the adductor magnus sleeve take the suture there then both the ends they shuttle to through these tunnels and tie the knot with each other so this is also one of the good procedure in children with open physis then another uh, procedure is quadriceps graft is taken passed under the vmo then it can be under the siam guidance can be inserted on the isometric point just below the physis so there are uh, in skeletally mature there are equally good results for these studies then another technique where you take the uh, patellar tendon graft from the medial most aspect of the patellar tendon uh, release it partially and then shuttle it and pass it through the isometric point then one uh, technique uh, as described by christian frink and uh, christian hoser where they minimally invasively they take the superficial sleeve from the uh, central quadriceps tendon then they reroute it through the uh, periosteal sleeve and then tie with the vmo and then insert it on the medial aspect so that is also very good technique for the fixation then this a uh, technique as uh, jagtap sir has mentioned in his talk about the basket view technique a soft tissue procedure by dr pranjal where the graft is taken then alternatingly it is passed over the periosteal sleeves on the anterior aspect of the patella then it is sutured onto the periosteal sleeve of the adductor magnus tendon so that is also good technique with the children with open physis then another technique where two all suture anchors have been passed then uh, uh, tendon is tied to this anchor and then it is fixed onto the femoral side then this one technique where with the bony ronger uh, trough is created over the medial aspect of the patella graft is passed there then again this is uh, this trough inside that trough and it is closed with the sutures then once it is tied so this can be again put into the isometric point then this one is um, someone has used tunnels with the 4.5 reamers on the medial aspect under the siam guidance using the acl jig and in they tie the graft in this fashion uh, approximately 15 mm of graft is left and it is passed into the femur so uh, what uh, meta analysis have shown that autograft is very much superior to the synthetic grafts and allografts so there are certain complications like a fracture redislocation loss of knee flexion wound complications and muscle atrophies when you rehabilitate so first week cpm is started brace is kept unlocked up to 90 degrees for 4 weeks partial weight bearing first 3 weeks then after 4 weeks strengthening exercises are usually started cycling is permitted after 6 weeks jogging after 8 weeks and full activity after 4 months so take home message it's a challenging problem for surgeons many techniques you need to choose depending upon your expertise which you want to go for majority of the complications are due to technical error and indications and algorithm for treatment are continuously evolving so ultimate goal is to restore the native biomechanics and stability thank, thank you, you very much for patient listening with the permission of chair i just want to share my three slides okay, if sir. that is okay please the presentation don number last last slide बस वन सेकेंड ओके तो थैंक यू देन आ सिंसियर रिक्वेस्ट हु एवर इज नॉट द आई एस मेंबर टू बिकम अ मेंबर ऑफ इंडियन आर्थ्रोस्कोपी सोसाइटी इट्स युअर ओन सोसाइटी देन अनदर अनाउंसमेंट लास्ट डेट फॉर एब्सट्रैक्ट सबमिशन फॉर द इस आई एस कॉन इज टिल थर्टी फर्स्ट ऑफ मे 
So whoever submits the abstract, it will be featured in Journal of the Indian Arthroscopy Society as well, all the selected abstract or whatever are presentations. And another one is Puneni course. Kindly register for Puneni course. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for such a wonderful talk. May I now invite uh, Dr. Sachin Tapasvi, sir, for his talk on the patellar instability in skeletally immature individuals. Slide. The last slide. Okay, thank you, friends, and uh, thank you for having me here. Today I'll be speaking on patellar instability in the immature skeleton. We heard a lot about uh, Dijor classification, and uh, I think it's your chance to meet David Dijor live when he comes. And he's a great orator, a fantastic person. Don't miss him for anything in your life because um, he's really an awesome person. Okay, so why do we talk about immature skeleton? So Lisa Arndt, one of our PKC orators from three years ago, had this very landmark study where she showed that most of the particular dislocations will occur in the adolescents. And what is important to understand in this adolescent age group, if you break it down further, you'll find that there are two peaks. The females peak early in less than 12, and then the males peak till about 16 or 17, which means that there are certain hormonal influences which are also very important for the same. And what really matters to understand is that a lot of the immature skeleton people who will get a particular dislocation will have majority of uh, pathonomic factors which are present trochlear dysplasia is present in almost about 88% of them, and then you have other anatomic issues which are important as well. So the unique problem is that how do you correct them, and which do you correct, because trying to do bony surgery to recreate the trochlea or to shift the tubal tubercle are not options in a growing skeleton, because they will lead to premature growth arrest. So Henri Dijur, David Dijur's father, in about 1994, give this classification where they had three groups. One was objective patellar instability or dislocation. The second was potential patellar dislocation or instability. And the third was a painful patellar syndrome. But I think now with better understanding, we have now abolished or given away this classification. And I think it makes a lot of sense for us to use this particular working classification in which type one is a first time dislocator with or without an osteochondral fracture. Type 2 is a recurrent patellar dislocation and or instability. 2A is those who sublux and 2B are those who have had more than two dislocations. And type 3 and 4 are the more syndromic ones in which you have a dislocatable patella either passively or habitually. Habitual is also in flexion or in extension. And type 4 is a dislocated patella usually associated with syndromes such as nail patella syndrome, etc. I've been asked by Mukesh to speak only on type 1 and type 2. I will not be speaking about type 3 and type 4. So the treatment for a type 1A is essentially dependent upon the osteochondral fragment which is present with it. So almost 95% of all your patellar dislocations will have some amount of chondral injury whether it is large enough to cause an osteochondral fragment or not is different. How does it occur? When the patella dislocates and it starts moving laterally, you get injury to the anterolateral part of the femoral trochlea. And after the patella moves back into the groove and starts relocating, this is the time that you get a fracture of the medial facet of the patella when the patella gets relocated and this fragment infrequently is found in the lateral gutter uh, when you go ahead and try and fish it out. So here's one such patient who, in whom you can see that now the fragment has migrated to the center of the notch. That's the defect on the medial patellar facet, which you see there. And uh, of course, such a large fragment with subchondral bone, you have to fix it. The defect measured roughly around 14 millimeters by 16 millimeters. 
And the way I normally do this in the immature skeleton is to freshen the base, remove any granulation tissue, make um, drill holes or microfracture the base, use some tissel glue, which is the fibrin thrombin mixture, lay it over and then stick the fragment on and have these number two vicral transosseous sutures, which you don't need to really worry about doing any form of implant removal. Of course, you always need to add something to stabilize the medial side. Controversy is whether you add an autographed MPFL or whether you do a medial plication in which you recreate a north-south as well as an east-west repair is what you need to figure out and do the needful. The type 2A and 2B are the ones which are more likely to keep on dislocating. 88% of them will have a recurrent dislocation and if they do so, they are at a higher risk of getting chondral injury and hence the trend is towards doing an isolated MPFL in these patients which are type 2A and type 2B. Of course, the adult-like MPFL reconstructions are not appropriate. Sandeep has done an excellent uh, review of literature for the same and we need to keep in mind the physial plate and hence you will have two types of reconstruction procedures. Either you can be distal to the uh, physial plate or within the epiphysis itself. So this is an all epiphyseal graft. You use an autograft, which is usually um, the gracilis, and you have to use fluoroscopy both in the AP and the lateral planes to prevent problems. So what are the main pointers that you will use here? Well, Kevin Shear produced this very nice study in which they looked at uh, these adolescent MPFL insertions, and if the age is less than seven, then your insertion is more distal and posterior, and if you are more than seven, it goes to more proximal and anterior. So this is one point that you need to remember. Age will guide you as to where you need to go. And the other thing is what is the safe path in which you will drill? Well, you look at the MPFL insertion and then you angle the drill distally and anteriorly by about 15 to 20 degrees and that will help avoid injury to the physial plate. So this is a CRM shot on the lateral view. You need to get a perfect lateral view. And in the AP view, as I said, you need to go distal and anterior and create a blind socket, not a through and through socket when you are performing the same. The preferred graft is to use a gracilis autograft. You can also use the medial partial strip of the quad tendon, but of course this forms more of the MPQTL rather than the MPFL type of reconstruction and hence is not that uh, preferred. Next you come to problems or options with proximal to the epiphysis and here you have two options. You can either use an adductor sling, which is a free graft which you sling around the adductor to fix it back to the patella or you can use the adductor tendon itself and then flip it over and fix it to the proximal pole of the patella. This is an example showing a adductor sling procedure where you have a graft that has been which I have swung around fixed in the patella and I'll be swinging it around the adductor insertion and fixing it back again. The preference is to do a distal to the epiphysis or the intraepiphyseal type of fixation because this is more isometric. If you use the adductor sling technique in a pediatric person, then you will find that the graft actually tightens in flexion and this may lead to graft stretching, failure, pain and stiffness since it is more anisometric. And again, this excellent cadaveric study which was um, done by Dan Green's group out of the HSS, they did show that the proximal reconstruction techniques are more anisometric and hence the distal one, which is the all epiphyseal one, is the one that should be preferred. So to conclude, if you're looking at the immature skeleton, all the type 1A, 2A and 2Bs are best treated with MPFL surgery. The all epiphyseal or the distal ones show better isometry. So those are the ones that you should prefer. You have to do fluoroscopy drilling, guided drilling to avoid injury to the epiphysis. Avoid drilling tunnels in the patella, which are going through and through because the patella can easily fracture. In a pediatric age group, first fix the femur and then fix the patella because you cannot drill a through and through tunnel in the femur especially when you're dealing with the immature skeleton unlike an adult. And please have a good conversation with the parents 
because the associated pathology like a high grade trochlear dysplasia or an abnormal TTTG will require treatment when the child attains adulthood which needs to be taken into consideration and all of you here in this room it is uh, mukesh's and satyajit's personal responsibility that all of us will meet again in september for sure and we hope to see you there again thank you so wonderful much. insight into the topic uh, i request uh, sandeep sir and satyajit jagtap sir to be on the stage Kapa sir uh, so, so, please, please stay on the stage any questions Uh, so you asked me not to speak about the syndromic patele and not at all absolutely not for a traumatic etiology you should not that should be reserved for type 3 and type 4 where you need to do an extensor extensive extensor mechanism realignment sir traumatic dislocations chronic cases any role of mpfl advancement What is MPFL advancement? Sir, uh, re-suturing the MPFL on the patella. So, like we do MPFL, the boss term, like okay. we do the so boss term. So, MPFL avulsions uh, on the patellar side, if they are osseous, yes, you can reattach them. If it is avulsed from the femoral side, yes, you can reattach them. Reattach them. In the immature skeleton, um, I think the Cincinnati group popularizes a technique in which they imbricate the medial retinaculum. so they do a north south imbrication they prepare something like an mpfl and then they do a advancement the to try bone. and do an application technique yes sir so that is what they have popularized and that is what they recommend that's the cincinnati group any other questions or we'll move on to the cases then tapes i don't think we should use tapes anywhere in the body to substitute autographs because they exhibit a completely different uh, modulus of elasticity and they are very rigid so i am not a fan of using synthetic material especially when you have good autograft that is available there could be some role say if you were trying to augment a collateral repair on the medial side but besides that i would strongly discourage use of tapes intra articular and extra articular there is no evidence to show that tapes will heal yeah so yes so my preferred is two anchors on the middle side on the over the patella yes no i don't think i will change it because almost there are various meta analyses they have shown the end result is same and uh, for the uh, synthetic tape there is hardly any evidence i mean i couldn't find any literature also yes because they there are people they have used uh, fascia lata but no one has bothered to use tapes and all sorry uh any gracilis is better results are same complaining of uh, dislocation without any symptoms uh, maybe pain or is not there only it is dislocating so should we try to postpone or do it uh, there itself so there's no traumatic history there no sir okay so then this she probably comes in the third group she is type 3 where she has a problem with her extensor apparatus you need to look at her lower limb alignment you need to see whether she is going into valgus whether she has got excessive femoral Uh, antiversion whether she's got excessive tibial intorsion then once you've sorted that out rule out dynamic instability in which they have a very poor uh, pelvis and hip muscular balance once you've sorted that out then move to causes of the knee 
find out if she has patellar alta or she has trochlear dysplasia or she has an abnormal TTTG, you'll usually find that if the patella is, is the patella dislocating in flexion or extension? Uh, uh, patella dislocates in... Uh... Because you can have the patella which is dislocating in extension and you have a patella which is dislocating in flexion. If the patella is dislocating in flexion, then that means the okay. extensor mechanism is teethered on the lateral side. So that requires a four-in-one procedure where you do an open incision, you release completely the extensor mechanism of the lateral intramuscular septum, release all intraarticular adhesions. You will do a patellar tendon like a Rue Goldthwait transfer, that is the second part. You will advance the VMO, that is the third part, and you will do an MPFL or a medial placation, which is the fourth part. And if need be, you may sometimes need to lengthen the extensor apparatus by doing a quad lengthening. That is if the patella is dislocating in flexion. If it is in extension, then you need to find out till what degree of flexion is the patella dislocatable. If it is dislocatable till almost about 60 degrees, then usually trochlear dysplasia is the cause. If it is dislocatable till about 30 or 40, then usually patella alta is the cause. If it is dislocatable till about 15 or 20, then it is usually a poor structures on the medial side which is the cause. We are already running short of time, so I would uh, like Dr. Tejas Vagela to present his case. And so, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm here to present a case, uh, an inter interesting case on patellar instability. This is a 17-year-old male, no associated comorbidities, had fallen in a pit a year back with a popping out of his patella, which was self-reduced in extension. It was treated with immobilization for two months because they started the, the primary orthopedic surgeon first did a, a patellar kneecap, and when he removed it, the patella was still dislocating, so he put him on a above knee cast, and that the patient wore for two months. Uh, then it was removed, but then the patient started having complaints of patella being dislocated, reduced spontaneously on walking intermittently with pain. The patient had inability to walk the stairs. On clinical examination, there was severe quadriceps atrophy. Uh, on inspection, there was a laterally displaced tibial tuberosity. The patella was dislocating in each flexion extension cycle. The tenderness, there was tenderness along the lateral femoral condyle. There was an FFD. Um, there was significant apprehension, so you could not measure the flexion. The patient has mild ORS. Uh, the Craig's test was negative. There was a normal femoral antiversion. A Q angle could not be measured because patella could not be centered in extension. There was no hyperlaxity. Baton was two. So since uh, Jaktav sir gave us an excellent lecture, I would first uh, like him to tell us what are the relevant uh, things that he could see on the X-ray. Higher adding patella. Yes, sir. Patella uh, in uh, skyline view, it is okay. Yeah. There is a small bony fragment on the lateral side. Yeah. Uh, deformed uh, femoral condyles, little bit. Yeah. Uh, porotic bones. Yeah. Yeah, so as sir said, rightly said, there is a high riding patella. You could also see some supratrochlear spurring, some crossing. There's hypoplastic medial femoral condyle. And uh, yes, there's a small loose body laterally. These are the relevant MRI images. Anything particular here that anyone would like to pick up or tell us? Yes, sir. So here's... Uh De jure patellar trochlear index is very yeah. low yeah. on your sagittal Perfect. and on your uh, axial images. This is a type D de jure trochlea yeah. with a high cliff. Yeah. So, sir, that's why on the x-ray we could see the mm -hmm. spurring, crossing, as well as the double contouring. Uh, sir, anyone does anyone use the TT-PCL distance rather than the TT-TG distance? Because since this is higher uh, trochlear dysplasia. 
Sachin sir, do you use TT? You have to use TTG? both. You have to use both of them. Okay. So when you have an abnormal TTTG, the TT is the tibial tubercle and the TG is uh, the trochlear groove. Yeah. There is trochlear dysplasia here. So you now need to find out where is, what is the main cause of this increased distance. Which is why then you measure the TTPCL. If there is an abnormality in the TTPCL, which is equal to the abnormality in the TTTG, that means it is abnormal position of the tibial tubercle alone. If the, uh, I'm sorry, I got it wrong. If the TTTG uh, is, if the, yeah, I said it correct, yeah. If the TTTG is say high 20 and the TTPCL is also 20, that yeah. means it is an abnormal position of the tibial tubercle. But if there is a mismatch between the TTTG and the uh, TTPCL, that means that one component of the deformity is also in the trochlear group, which is why both of them have to be measured. Right, sir. That's a very excellent take home for everyone that you need to tell your radiologist to do the TTPCL also, especially when you have trochlear dysplasia. So uh, these are the, the findings that our radiologist showed. There's patella alta, the insal sylvati was 1.36. TTTG was significantly high, it was 30. So we went ahead and we told them to get the TTT, uh, TTPCL distance also and he told us vocabulary that it is around 20, 20, 25. So it was high, so that means the, and we could see clinically also that the tibial tuberosity was placed laterally. Of course there was lateral tracking. Now, Can you play this video? Yes, I just click it. Yeah, so this is the EUF finding. Now I would like someone to, uh, Sachin sir, why don't you just, we want to pick your brains. This is in the OT. The patient is under anesthesia and you are seeing this. How would you now in your mind uh, calculate what are the things that you need to do in this patient? So this patella is dislocating in high degree of flexion, which means that his trochlea is dysplastic and he has got an abnormal TTTG, he has got a patella alta as well. Yes. So for me, he needs everything to be done. He needs the full house. He requires a distalization and medialization of his tibial tubercle. He requires a trochleoplasty, he requires an MPFL and he requires that osteochondral fragment being addressed as well. Right. Uh, sir, the patient has been walking with this knee for a year. Do you expect any cartilage injury to the trochlea also considering that the patient has... Absolutely. Used? Okay. Since, uh, I mean, I couldn't appreciate very well on the MR scans, but sure. I'm sure there was a significant degree of an osteochondral injury to his medial patellar facet and uh, he may have got a bipolar lesion on the medial trochlea now, which is normally seen only on the lateral trochlea. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Sandeep, would you do an arthroscopy for this case to before you do your open procedure? Because you have to do the full Monty, right, as sir said. Yes, arthroscopy so needs to be done. Okay, so prior to uh, doing open procedure. Okay, so for your in all your MPFLs, you do a prior arthroscopy, yes. even in these kind of frank cases. Is that the uh, the consensus with everyone from the house? Especially when you want to remove this loose body, it's easy. Yeah. You, you can do it in the, from in the lateral gutter. Sure. Better way you can use it with the arthroscopy procedure. And rather than the later on, as Sachin sir told, yeah. it's a three-in-one procedure you have to plan in this case. Sure. You can also know the status of the cartilage. Yes, sir. So, what are the plan of management? This is what we have discussed. So, this is the arthroscopy. So, as you're going in, you can see that the patella doesn't engage in 30 degree flexion, the, the whole trochlea in, in crude terms is screwed. So Sachin sir, now what to do? He's 17, he has a long life ahead of him. I would still go ahead and do the same plan. My, I mean, I'm not, uh, this is a very small video clip to see. But if the trochlea is completely smashed and is bare, then of course I would go away from my plan of doing a trochleoplasty yeah. and I would stick with an MPFL with a TTO, come back and let the parents and the family know that uh, this may not last him for the rest of his life 
and probably very early in his life he might require an isolated pfj replacement sure uh, so that's exactly what uh, we counseled the patient we went in we did the scopy we documented it we showed them to the uh, family that uh, these are the things that we have this is a very interesting thing which i think again for all the delegates to take home this is by hoge from uh, the rush center that what are the indications for a tto just recurrent patella dislocations a tttg more than 20 patella alta you could also be looking up at the contraindication so these were the steps which i followed i did a eua i did an arthroscopy i determined that i could not do a trochleoplasty i did a lateral release first i assessed it again i did a tto i assessed it again i did an mpfl so i did all the three procedures and i found it then to be uh, stable so this is how we did it the lateral side that as you can see there is significant corrosion on the on the lateral femoral condyle as well as the trochlea with the tubular tuberosity that's the tubular tuberosity completed so how to plan distalization how much distalization should we be doing anyone please okay so how much is the total width of your tubular tuberosity how much do you cut so your your tibial tuberosity is 50 mm approximately right i mean that is your uh, uh, tibial tuberosity cut so now how much do you want to distalize it further you did the cd ratio your cd ratio you you plan that it should be it should come to 1 so then how much big bare bone would you be putting distally around 15 mm roughly right and so that you can distalize it further at what uh, degree of extension of flexion would you tighten it i mean put your screws okay sachin sir how much normally at what flexion or extension do you uh, put your screws for for tto for 45 degrees okay sir okay. sure uh, what uh, they said that it should be in full extension yeah yeah because this patient we yeah so it was necessary in this case because one not only distalization we also wanted to medialize it it was laterally placed and the patient yeah so whenever yeah sure that's a valid point yeah yeah sure yeah that's a absolutely valid point i agree with you but in this case because there was significant patella alta i plan to distalize it as well and also whenever you distalize you actually medialize you cannot only distalize whenever you will distalize it there will also be some medialization i i i got your point i i got your point so anyways to cut the long story short i also added the mpfl reconstruction to this i used the standard 4.5 screws as sachin sir said i planned it 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 was below the epiphyseal growth plate quickly i just run through the thing once we finished it it was stable in all range of movement this was his post op x ray even though it was looking like a bit of varus it is actually a mild valgus that's his 8 month follow up the tto is completely united the patella looks centralized and that's his follow up the patella is now he has good flexion the patella is stable even in deep flexion we have not done a trochleoplasty but that's the the beauty of distalization the distalization engages it and also the mpfl i think is add, added like a a static restraint to prevent the patella from dislocating thank you thank you sir uh, tejas tejas one thing i prefer 4 uh, mm screws cancellous screws and i use three screws and they are not in the same plane or same line to prevent splintering of the tibial tuberosity just yes, that is my uh, Yeah, preferred method. Ah, oh, Sajin so, sir, uh, prior to the arthroscopy, your plan was different, right? But now after arthroscopy, it was decided that there will not be any trochleoplasty. But now, like even without doing trochleoplasty, still patient has got a good function. So, so in, before planning only, can would you have decided that I am not going to do trochleoplasty in this case? I don't think so because this is a type D very high grade trochlear dysplasia, and uh, the least you can do in this is to at least take out the supra trochlear spur 
which is there. So that I would have definitely done. So I've done something like a groove plasty. One of the things that will go in this patient's favor is that uh, he's already pre-arthritic or arthritic. So he's going to be stiff anyways after a while. So I don't think you can not do the trochlear dysplasia and rely completely on your TTO in case of high-grade trochlear dysplasia. So according to you, it is likely to dislocate in near future if he becomes active. Because this will be painful more. Because he is arthritic, he will he will probably end up being stiffer. So he'll be stable, but he will have some pain. Yeah. Right. So can we just again just tell us what is the groove plasty which you are talking about? So groove plasty is for low grade trochlear dysplasia. You remove the supratrochlear spur. You yeah. erase the synovium. And <clears throat> you reattach the synovium to the new groove area. So you don't elevate the cartilage flap like what you do in a trochlear plasty, but you do a groove plasty in which you allow the patella to enter. What happens in a high grade trochlear dysplasia is that the bump or the cliff is so high that the moment the uh, patella comes down, it hits and it wants to go to the side. So you just take off the cliff, you don't change the groove. May I now invite Mukesh sir for his case presentation. Thank you, Tejas sir. A 14-year-old boy with a history of fall while playing in the school a year ago had primary episode of patella dislocation, which was treated conservatively. He has similar episodes which were mainly a traumatic while running or so. And so in a year or so, he had a four times patella dislocation. So this was clinical examination. There is valgus alignment of both the lower limbs. Apprehension was positive. Biton score 4 by 9. Cruciate and collaterals were normal. Rec test negative. Q angle was around 20. This was his canogram, which is showing a bit valgus on both the sides. About 6 to 7 degree valgus. And the physis still open. That was his MRI findings. MPFL tear from the Patellar side, there was increased TTTG up to 23 mm, and the trochlear may be type A trochlear dysplasia. So, valgus with increased TTTG and recurrent instability. Rajiv, how will you? It's a four-time dislocation. In a year, four times right. dislocated. As per history, primary was traumatic. With valgus, ice is open, ETTG 23, rest parameters looks to be. So, the toclea groove is normal, I think. Uh, and there is a small, I think, loose body also, osteochondral loose body there. In the... Uh, it's not there. There was no loose body. Though there is no loose body. No, there, is no there, loose body. There, there is no loose body. Then I think I will go for because uh, is the physis is not mature, so uh, I will go for a, a physial sparing MPFL reconstruction. Alone. Alone. Okay. Doctor Tapasvi, sir, please. What was the age? Come again. One four. And how much growth is remaining? I have not calculated. Okay, so if so, so fourteen she's years. a female, correct? Male. Male. Yeah, so I think the first thing is that there is a valgus. This is a growing skeleton. I would mm. refer it to my pediatric surgeon colleague to find out how much growth is remaining. Okay. This could, if they feel that there is decent amount of growth remaining, then they will have a growth plate arrest that hemi epiphysiodesis. And I would do an MPFL and stop. I will not do the TTO right now okay. because uh, the because of risk of recurvatum if I do anything to the tibial tubercle. So growth arrest, correction of the valgus. If you correct the valgus, there will be some change in the TTTG as well because the trochlear groove will move in line. And I once they get skeletal maturity, I would assess. I am doing an MPFL now because I want to stop recurrent dislocations and prevent further chondral damage. Bilateral valgus, same valgus bilaterally on other side. It doesn't totally matter, but this side is symptomatic. If there, is, if there is symptomatic, that is why we need to tackle it. Nothing to do with the 23 mm TT 
some distal realignment soft tissue procedure it's an immature skeleton so i really don't want to do any soft tissue procedure now and uh, my preference would be to try and get the leg to neutral and find out how much growth is remaining do a hemi physiodesis and an mpfl do the least possible in the immature skeleton you can do the full lot when you have a mature skeleton okay if that's so want to add anything anyone from delegates want to add something to it so i did a proper mpfl reconstruction here with the help of grishelis graph and basket weave technique so use the periosteal sleeve there tied it with the stitches there in the labro periosteal sleeve at the at a, uh, your sala uh, adductor sulcus then did proper two strand mpfl reconstruction with the basket weave technique and as it was 20 it was unstable even after doing that i just medialize the distal part of the patellar tendon that is the rocks goldwet technique where i have erased the lateral half of patellar tendon put it below and sutured it in the periosteum there and that was the stability on table so there was no apprehension or there was no dislocation even on the deep flexion and on table rom was full so it's recently done now i don't have much long follow up about this case so my question was should we avoided that distal procedure so for Im in immature skeleton usually i avoid because what happens uh, i didn't do bony procedure okay. it was all soft tissue so after mpfl reconstruction it was still dislocated sublux then i think you can plan for this dislocation that was the reason it was added so it's like ala kata approach you do it see it and cherry check it then you can plan for the doctor tapas is should i have added or should i have left it or alignment the, correction see, would have been the, the surgeon, priority you're the best judge i wasn't there to see what was happening that is the first <laughs> thing but <laughs> i think the only thing which now is important here to understand is that when you're doing a combined distal realignment with an mpfl mm. then you have to first do the distal realignment okay and then do the mpfl okay because right. the tension in the mpfl will change after you do the distal yes. realignment so okay. here i think what one can really critique is that you fix the mpfl and you still find it is dislocating now you done the distal mm. realignment maybe the tension in the mpfl would not be mm. normal okay. but i think okay. my plan here is that there is valgus valgus is bony bone always comes first so i my preference would have been to do a hemi epiphysiodesis with an mpfl tied over the crisis and then do a definitive tto later on if she re dislocated okay thank you so i think we we'll start with inauguration now thanks mukesh so uh, can i request uh, dr sundar to please come ahead and uh, appreciate uh, dr tejas waghela for his presentation and the chairpersons as well aditya putra and saket mindra So we'll be starting with the inaugural ceremony. I request all faculties to come on the dais, please. Sandeep, yes, sir, please. Doctor Jagtap, Doctor Shreyas. डॉक्टर सतीश सोनार डॉक्टर अमित हडोले
धीरज समय रेडी ओके तो इन अ ट्रेडिशनल वे आई रिक्वेस्ट ऑल ऑफ यू टू प्लीज कम फॉरवर्ड फॉर द लाइटिंग ऑफ द समय धीरज I uh, now request Dr. Satyajit Jagtap to please come forward and uh, felicitate our IAS President, Dr. Sachin Tapasvi, please. Dr. Mukesh, to please felicitate our IS Secretary, Dr. Sundar Rajan. <laughs> Dr. Satish Sonar, to please felicitate Dr. Shreyas Gajar. Dr. Amit Hadole, please felicitate Dr. Rajiv Raman. <laughs> Dr. Jagtap, please uh, felicitate uh, Dr. Sandeep Biraris. Jagtap, sir. I request Dr. Jagtab to please say a few words. Uh, good afternoon. It is a great pleasure and honor to uh, host such uh, international faculties with us. And uh, I am very happy to see all of you together. There are very nice attendance. All were sitting. and. Uh, good uh, academic feast you all had and will be having a uh, post lunch session also a uh, short thing about the arthroscopy society we are started way back and uh, we are uh, increasing in numbers in leaps and bounds and uh, we have started for the betterment of all of you and any suggestions are welcome 
one thing I would like to tell the faculty is that we have uh, got our own uh, ETO machine installed for the benefit of all the members. I would like to tell all the members as well from Nagpur. They can take help of this ETO machine to for sterilization purposes. And we have been organizing the workshops uh, every year at least once since last uh, 10 to 15 years. And uh, I welcome you and uh, I hope we, you will keep abreast with all these uh, academic informations in the years to come. Thank you and all the good wishes. Thank you, sir. I request Dr. Tapasvi to please uh, tell us about what is IS Connect and its future uh, vision about IS. So I think uh, under the able leadership of our uh, past president, Dr. IPS Oberoi, and with our very dynamic Dr. Sundarajan, uh, I'm in very privileged to be taken over the IIS at probably its highest peak so far. The IIS wants to definitely involve more and more local talent, which is why these IIS outreach programs have been started under uh, Dr. IPS and uh, Dr. Sundarajan's uh, thought process. And I plan to take them forward and take education to all the places where probably not the big metros, but the level two cities where it is really growing in leaps and bounds. This has all been possible with the intellectual talent that we have, not just nationally, but locally. And it would be our endeavor to nurture local talent. We are also extremely thankful to our industry partners without whose help all of this cannot be possible. And uh, they selflessly promote the cause of education without having any commercial interest which I think is an exemplary action which has been, um, you know, endowed upon all of us. Um, recently, I, I mean, just a couple of hours ago, I also had discussion with uh, one of your own arthroscopy uh, society members, uh, Dr. Neha, and uh, I don't see her anymore here, but she has, yes, yeah, she's here. And uh, Neha has uh, also taken it upon herself to establish a woman's wing of the arthroscopy for the IAS. And I think she deserve a round of applause for that because uh, she's going to spearhead that. And it is like these associations which I or uh, which I think we can make our body stronger, and we should try and involve almost each and every person to for this for the betterment of education and academics. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I'm sure with your vision and motivation, IS is going to go leaps and bounds. Uh, I request uh, our Secretary of IAS, Dr. Sundar Rajan, to please speak a few words. Uh, respected Mr. President Sachin Tapasi and uh, other uh, Sandeep Joint Secretary and other faculty and other EC of Nagpur Arthroscopy Society and members of uh, Nagpur Arthroscopy Society. It is a great pleasure for us to come to Nagpur once Mukesh suggested that you have to have a IAS uh, outreach program here um, in uh, Nagpur. And this is the third program which we are doing because we couldn't do for uh, one year because of the COVID last year, which I, I after uh, becoming a secretary, I didn't do anything. But we are doing at least monthly meeting uh, virtually. And also we are doing publications of the same presentations in IAS newsletters. I think many of you might have seen in the WhatsApp group, which we are releasing every month. And I'm seeing great talent in Nagpur Arthroscopy Society. These out of these three programs, I saw very good inter case presentations with a lot of discussions by delegates. So out of these programs, three, three programs, I think this is a very excellent program. And uh, I also congratulate Vokesh for this, creating this program, designing this program very well. And we had a lot of interaction from morning. And uh, I saw all the young surgeons from Nagpur or around surrounding the Nagpur were presenting excellent cases and good discussions. And also I request you to present these cases in our monthly virtual meeting so that we can have a more reach for our national uh, uh, members of uh, Indian Arthroscopy Society will have a chance to uh, see your talent. And at the same time, it is opportunity for you to showcase your talent to become a national identity. Uh, and uh, uh, coming out of uh, Nagpur also. So it's very important that you should connect to our Indian Arthroscopy Society. I request all of you 
to become a member of IAS again because this will give you a lot of vision for you, thought process, then you'll, you'll be more national faculty uh, rather than only in Nagpur. So I want you, all of you, to go to the Indian Arthroscopy Society website. It's very easy to uh, become a member. Just uh, up upload your uh, MS certificate, then you'll get in two weeks membership. And also already told about the benefit of becoming member, that uh, you are uh, going to uh, uh, see all our uh, educational videos and webinars and you are uh, allowed to vote and uh, other um, uh, benefits. So I request if you are not a member, please be, be a member. I, uh, currently we are almost crossed to more than 3,100 members, more than any state orthopedic associations like uh, Tamil Nadu or uh, Maharashtra associations have only 2,400. We have more than 3,000. That shows that interest of the, all the young surgeons to become an uh, uh, becoming an arthroscopic surgeon, apart from your trauma or uh, arthroplasty work, I think all of them are showing a lot of interest. So I would suggest that you should become a member of Indian Arthroscopy Society. And also I thank Mukesh and the all the EC of Nagpur Arthroscopic Society uh, for doing this program on behalf of IAS. And uh, it is a win-win situation for both IAS and Nagpur. And uh, thank you, uh, uh, Pradap sir and uh, all the ECs. And, uh, at the same time, I welcome all of you for the national meeting, which we to, which Sachin also told about this happening in September in Coimbatore. So that will have the opportunity for you to explore uh, all the subspecialties of the arthroscopy. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. I request Dr. Tapaswi sir to please felicitate our senior arthroscopic surgeon, Dr. Jagtap sir. The momento. I'll request Sundar to felicitate Navid, our scientific chairman and clinical committee chairman. I'll request Shreyas to felicitate our president, Dr. Satish Sonar. I request Dr. Rajiv Raman to felicitate our ASN Secretary, Dr. Amit Hadole, please. I again request Dr. Tapaswi to please come forward and felicitate uh, Dr. Mukesh Ladda. Thank you, sir. I request uh, Mukesh to please give his vote of thanks. Hi, everyone. I'll take only two minutes. I know everyone is hungry now. First of all, I would like to thank Indian Arthroscopy Society to believe us and giving us this opportunity. Sincere thanks to President Dr. Tapaswi, sir, and Secretary Dr. Sundar Rajan for allowing ASN to conduct this outreach program. I also congratulate and thanks to the faculties, Dr. Rajiv Raman, who came all the way from Kolkata. He is called father of SAR countries as meet. Dr. Sandeep Biraris from Mumbai and Dr. Shreyas Gajjar from Mumbai. All thanks to you all guys for coming all the way and guiding us. I would like to thank all our Arthroscopy Society Nagpur team, Satish, Naved, Amit, Jagtap sir, and other members. So working collaboratively and working together for the success of this show. A sincere thanks to audiovisual guys for a seamless performance and seamless video conferencing. Grace Hospital, Dr. Neha and Ninad for providing your infrastructure to deliver the live surgeries. Hotel Redison Blue and their staff. And last but not the least, the sponsors, Arthrex, Manish and their team for helping us to come out with this program. Thanks a lot. I'll invite everyone for lunch now. <laughs>
प्लीज जॉइन अस फॉर लंच
हो जेवला जेवला
हेलो एवरी वन आई विल रिक्वेस्ट एवरी वन टू प्लीज बी इन द हॉल इफ दे हैड देर लंच वे आर अबाउट टू स्टार्ट इंटरेस्टिंग सेशन ऑन कार्टिलेज रिस्टोरेशन एंड अलाइनमेंट सो आई विल रिक्वेस्ट चेयरपर्सन डॉक्टर नावेद अहमद डॉक्टर अचिन मुरारका एंड डॉक्टर समीर देवड़मुठे टू प्लीज कम एंड टेक ओवर द चार्ज Uh, good afternoon all so we are starting with our cartilage uh, restoration and alignment session i will invite dr sushush rajan to deliver his talk he is going to speak of pre op planning of sto uh so welcome everyone for the post lunch session thank you ladda sir for giving me this opportunity so my job today is to make the hto planning easy but before making it easy let us see some difficult angles so these are the four angles that we everyone should know uh we all know the ldfa that is the lateral distal femur angle the mpta the medial proximal tibial angle but these two angles that is the mfta this is the mechanical femoro tibial angle this is a angle which uh is formed by the mechanical axis of the femur to the mechanical axis of the tibia and the glca angle that is a joint line congruence angle so uh we every whenever we see the x rays we get to know there is a varus deformity but we never objectify it we never measure how much is the varus deformity and there the mfta is very important so mfta more than 3 to 4 4 degrees is a significant varus deformity which can be symptomatic so once we know all these angles it's very important to differentiate different types of varus before uh, planning for an hto so if you see the first image uh, there is a varus deformity where the mechanical axis is shifted medially however the if we see the angles the mpta is decreased to 84 degrees normally it has to be in the range of 87 to 89 degrees the ldfa is normal but the mfta that is the mechanical femoro tibial angle is 5 degrees the normal mfta should be around 0 to minus 1 degrees if we see the second picture here uh, again the mechanical axis is deviated medially however here the main problem is not in the tibia it is in the femur so the ldfa is increased to 93 degrees so there is a femoral varus deformity and the third picture which we commonly encounter is a severe varus deformity if we see the mfta that is the mechanical femoro tibial angle it is 10 degrees there is a significant varus deformity here also the mpta is reduced to 84 degrees but what is contributing to the significant varus it is the lateral soft tissue laxity so the glca here is increased which is contributing to the significant varus deformity so it's very important to know these three to four types of varus before planning for the hto uh i think raman sir will uh, speak uh, about the indications in detail i'll just pass on with uh, the conditions where we should not do the sto we should never do the sto in distal femur deformities we should never do in if there is a significant flexion deformity if the range of motion is grossly restricted if there is a intraarticular varus uh, step which is contributing to the varus deformity or if the varus is because of the only the soft tissue laxities then we should never do the sto so planning uh, is it really required we do our hip replacement knee replacement many a times without planning also but they are forgiving sto is not a forgiving surgery so if we don't plan it properly it can lead to an under correction like this or an over correction where the mechanical axis is shifted laterally so planning is paramount the first step in planning is are the proper x rays uh, we all know that the beam should be 10 feet away however we commonly see the long leg x rays uh, if you see the second picture that is an improper long leg x ray 
what is the mistakes that we see in the second picture? The second picture, the tibia is externally rotated. How we know? Because the patella is not central. And the second point is the lateral cortical tibial hinge or the lateral tibial cortex, it is not bisecting the fibular head. That is a very important mark that the lateral cortex should bicep the fibular head. So if you see, the lateral, it is not bisecting the femoral head, fibular head. Here, in the proper long leg x-ray, the lateral cortex is bisecting the fibular head. It's very easy to, uh, even without any software or even without any hardware, we can um, uh, uh, create these three films and stitch it up. So it's, it doesn't require fancy software or hardware. So again, seeing this is a proper true long leg x-ray, that it is an improper long leg x-ray. So uh, once we get a proper x-rays, let us see live how to calculate all the angles. The first step is to take the center of the hip to the center of the ankle. That is the, our present mechanical axis. We clearly see that the mechanical axis is shifted medially. It is at a 10 to 20% of the tibial width. Ideally, it should be at the 62%, 60%. That is the Fujisawa point. Once we know the mechanical axis, let us measure the MFTA. That is the varus deformity. We take the mechanical axis of the femur from the center of hip to the center of knee and the mechanical axis of the tibia. And the angle between these two is the MFTA. So here the MFTA is around 8.2 degrees. So there is an 8.2 degrees of varus deformity. Once we get these angles, let us see how to draw the MPTA. It's very easy. We need to draw the distal femur joint line. We need to draw the proximal tibial joint line and the, ultimately the mechanical axis of the tibia to measure the MPTA. So this is the tibial joint line and ultimately from center of ankle to the center of knee, we can draw the MPTA. So if you see the MPTA uh, here is around 82 to 80, I think 82 degrees. So the varus, it is confirmed that the varus is in the tibia. Once we know all these angles, uh, let us see the final point that is the correction angle. That is the exact angle with which we need to do an osteotomy. So let us, now we need to look at the future. We have uh, looked at the past, we have looked at the present. So this is the future mechanical axis. And this future mechanical axis has to pass through the Fujisawa's point. That is at the 62% level of the tibial width. So if this is the future mechanical axis, so the lower point is the future center of the ankle. This is our present center of the ankle. The, the lower end of the mechanical axis is the future center of the ankle. So what we need to do, we need to shift the present ankle to the future ankle. Because the present ankle is in a horrible position. And how will we achieve it? We will use the fulcrum to push the center of this present ankle to the future ankle. And what is the fulcrum level? The fulcrum is the lateral cortical hinge point. That is our osteotomy level. So ultimately we need to shift our present ankle to the future ankle position through the lateral cortical fulcrum, that is the lateral cortical hinge point, just above the fibular head. So this angle is the alpha angle of correction. So here, once we have measured it, this is this has this comes out to be I think around uh, 13 degrees. So this is the alpha angle of correction. So once we get this correction angle, we can interpose these lines into the tibia. And ultimately, we can know exactly how much width of the tibia needs to be resected. So if we draw lines with the same 13 degree angles, we can exactly by with a good calibration, we can exactly know how much of the tibia has to be resected. So hope uh, everything is clear in the sense that we need to shift the present ankle to the future ankle through the fulcrum. That is the alpha angle of correction. So uh, once we know how to measure the correction, let us again see those examples. This was the first picture where the deformity was in the proximal tibia. The MPTA was reduced. The GLCA was normal, LDFA was normal. As we see, the weight-bearing line is passing through 25%. Ideally, it should pass through 60%. 
and the MFTA is 5 degrees. So we do, we plan our HTO correction around 7 degrees. We correct the MP, once we correct the MPTA to 90 degrees, automatically the weight bearing line goes through the 60% and MFTA, we achieve our desired MFTA of minus 2 degrees. Let us see the second example where the deformity, varus deformity was in the distal femur. If we do a HTO in this case, we'll increase the MPTA to 90, 9500 degrees and that will lead to a miserable patient. So here we need to do a distal femoral osteotomy. We correct the LDFA from 93 to 86 degrees and ultimately we achieve a desired MFTA of minus 2 degrees. Let us three, see the third example, which is a tricky one, where the varus def deformities are of, is of around 10 to 12 degrees, where along with MPTA, it is this lateral soft tissue laxity which is contributing to the varus. So here in this case, if we plan our normal HTO, where we correct the MPTA from 84 to 90 degrees, it, though it will lead to an under correction, it won't lead to a proper correction. If we see the mechanical axis in the second picture, it is passing the 4.4 degrees of varus is still remaining. So it is causing an under correction. So what to do now? So there are two options that we have. If we, if you see the picture D, the MPTA, if we do a massive correction of MPTA, the upper limit of MPTA uh, TA correction is around 93 to 95 degrees. So in this scenario, we can do that, but still it won't help us in achieving our desired valgus of around two degrees. So here, along with correction of MPTA, I think we have to add a, a mild distal femur osteotomy. It should not be a massive osteotomy. So if we correct the distal femur by around 2 to 3 degrees, we can get a desired correction of minus 2 degrees without deforming the distal femur. So ultimately, the take-home message is to shift the present ankle, which is in a no horrible position, to the future ankle position through the lateral fulcrum. That is ultimately what the HTO planning is. Uh, thank you so much. I invite Dr. Uh, Dr. Raju Raman to speak on high tibial osteotomy. Her talk. Thanks to Nagpur Arthroscopy Society and IAS for invitation. And my dear friend Mukesh, uh, Amit is there, uh, Jagdab sir. So I will be talking on steps of high table osteotomy, especially the medial open wedge osteotomy. So I think uh, my previous speaker, Shishruth, has explained well about this planning. So I will skip these two slides. So what is the most important point? How do you plan it? First thing is your planning and it should be your radiological planning. Once you have planned that, you will go for an osteotomy. Normally, you have a medial open wedge osteotomy or lateral closed wedge osteotomy. We have very limited indications for lateral closed wedge osteotomy now. Most of the time for varus knee, for where you are planning for HTO, we go for a medial open wedge osteotomy. And this is very important to mark your point. First thing is lower bowl of the patella, patella tendon, tibial tuberosity, and the joint line. Normally, we give 6 to 7 centimeter vertical incision or sometimes people give one oblique and one vertical incision in between the tibial tuberosity and the posterior border of your uh, proximal tibia. So once you have exposed it, the most important part is just try to dissect part of base sensorineus and superficial MCL in the distal part. And at this time, normally 4 to 5 centimeter below the joint line, fire your bit pin, guide wire, heading over the cap of the tip of the fibula. This is very important because that is your hinge point, what Susruth was explaining, and that is your hinge point. So once you have fired it, normally you should put two K wire, one anterior and one posterior. Before that, before putting your shaw, before cutting the bone on the medial part, always try to protect your patellar tendon with a small homen or a hook retractor anteriorly and posteriorly try to put your homen Nowadays, we are using radiolucent also, retractor is there. You can use those radiolucent retractor over the posterior part of the tibia and the superficial MCL so that you are not, you are protecting your neurovascular bundle. So, 
we plan for a biplanar osteotomy so the horizontal osteotomy as we used to do uh, uh, is a classical osteotomy it's a classical horizontal cut but nowadays we take a vertical cut also posterior to the tbl diversity two important point try to make at least 1 cm posterior to the anterior part of the tbl diversity this vertical cut and this step cut has two advantages first thing that it prevents excessive slope of the tibia what happen whenever you are planning for a high tibial osteotomy open wedge osteotomy there is an increased tendency of having increasing in the posterior tibial slope and that will increase your stress over the acl and most of the patient will come later on with anterior knee pain and second important part is that if you go for this step cut osteotomy you are not altering the patella height second and your osteotomy is also having a good stability also so these are the two points that preferred nowadays Uh, 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 most of the uh, uh, orthopedic surgeon prefers for a biplanar osteotomy. So let's simplify on the saw bone. This picture I have taken for a o cut. That is your horizontal cut, and this is your vertical cut. If you see, this is the lateral view. You can just like a step cut osteotomy. This is the vertical osteotomy, and this is the horizontal osteotomy. What is the most important part? You can see the horizontal osteotomy is a classical osteotomy. They try to preserve the. lateral 25% of the cortex the lateral hinge you should protect because this is important and sometime you can put your prophylactic kvr or some surgeon prefers to put a prophylactic screw also to prevent fracture of the lateral hinge and if you see it in the lateral view you can see whole of the lateral cortex should be intact and this is very important when you are planning for a st also so now medial opening so how to get exact trapezoidal opening that is very important and how will you do that so try to put your distractor or the uh, distracting caliper in the posterior part of the osteotomy and distract it as you have calculated suppose you want to uh, uh, have a correction of 10 degree 12 degree 14 degree 15 degree this markings are there the angles you have called already calculated and try to open it and we have now with the indian instruments also and uh, with uh, synthes also the wedges are also available you can put these wedges here so that you have a typical trapezoidal gap, gap here over that you can uh, plan for and once you get that trapezoidal gap you can plan for a fixation again cm picture you fire your bit pin over the head of the fibula in the posterior part first put your oscillating saw cut it and then try to distract open it medially this is very important at least 20 to 25% of the lateral hinge should be intact so once you have done it this is very important to put a alignment rod or you can use your diathermic cord to see that where your axis is here you can see it's just over the lateral tibial spine so you you have to over correct it fujisawa point was at 62% of the lateral tibial plateau but nowadays it's just lateral to the lateral tibial spine which is a good point i think for achieving a, a your mechanical a, a new mechanical axis so fujisawa point is close to this sometime when you want to achieve the fujisawa point it's over correction of the osteotomy so try to be lateral to the lateral tibial spine and accordingly you can increase your wedge and in with the caliper medial stabilization again you can use any implant either medial plate now we have radiolucent plate available two questions are there whether you will use any wedges or graft or not so normal consensus is that if you have up to 1 cm of opening no need of putting any wedge or graft 10 to 15 mm of opening yes you can put a wedge or graft there if it is more than 15 mm always try to stabilize with a bone either iliac crest bone graft or a cronus wedge all right so you can put it there you can put a long plate also now we have short plates available with a, a, a metal wedge inside to prevent the collapse and most of this patient try to rehab them properly you can start isometric quadriceps and range of motion on day one of the surgery and partial weight wearing at 6 weeks the most important step in planning for open wedge medial osteotomy open hto medial open wedge osteotomy is go for a radiological assessment as dr shushut told pro plan properly your uh, angle of correction see whether you need a hto or you there is deformities in the fibra you need a distal femoral osteotomy then calculate the angle plan it properly always try to have a good medial stabilization and rehab this patient properly most of the patient if you do this uh, medial open wedge osteotomy with uh, proper indication this patient will do pro, uh, uh, do very well in your clinical follow up thank you
Thank you, Rajiv sir, for such a lucid presentation. I would like to invite uh, Sachin sir for his presentation on algorithm for cartilage restoration. Thank you very much and indeed a great pleasure to be back with all of you again. And um, today I'll be speaking on a, sim yeah, on a simple approach to cartilage surgery. So I'm not going to, it's impossible to cover everything about cartilage in about 10 minutes, but I'll try and keep it brief. So what we need to understand is that cartilage actually is water and proteins. 80% is water, 20% are proteins. Of those proteins, we have proteoglycans and collagen. Your 65% is collagen. This is what you utilize in your uh, pharmaceutical treatment because it gives uh, your tensile strength. The proteoglycans are 35%. They give compression strength. And in these proteoglycans, you have core proteins as well as agaricans. These agaricans are made up of HA and chondroitin. And this is again where you use your clinical uh, non-surgical treatment to try and help you with cartilage therapy. So I think this is essential to understand because when everything else fails, you need to treat cartilage. And cartilage treatment becomes difficult because cartilage is avascular, aneural and has limited capacity to regenerate. So cartilage damage can either be in the form of cartilage defects, which are especially seen in young people with sports or road traffic accidents. They're involved in people who have active physical work and they usually do not have any articular degradation. You then have early mechanical cartilage problems, which are usually seen in middle-aged people. You see them in uh, middle-aged sports, sports persons as well. And they usually will have polyfocal lesions or multifocal lesions and will have early changes of osteoarthritis with um, meniscal tears, etc. And then you have the severe inflammatory type of osteoarthritis, which is typically seen beyond the sixth decade of life in less active individuals. And you know they may have high BMI like myself, and they may have OA or inflammatory changes and inflammatory arthritis as well. What is important to understand is whether it is a chondral lesion or an osteochondral lesion. Whenever the lesion crosses the tide mark, then it becomes an osteochondral lesion. And if it involves subchondral bone, then this lesion com behaves completely differently. Cartilage lesions are not uncommon. In almost about a third of patients who undergo ACL surgery, you will see some form of cartilage lesion. Or if you fail to see it, it has already seen you when you're doing ACL surgery. So please be aware and keep a lookout on all of them. What are the treatment options that we have? We have variety of treatment options. If you have an osteochondral fracture, like what we saw in my previous presentation, then we can fix cartilage. We can remove cartilage, which are essentially loose flaps. We can do bone marrow stimulation and facilitate repair. Or we can transfer tissue, which is your OCT technique or the OATS technique or the mosaic plastic technique. You can do fresh frozen allograft transfer or do what are called as mega transfers. You can use artificial tissue in the form of scaffolds. You can regenerate tissue by doing a cartilage implantation or autologous cartilage implantation. And last, when everything else fails, you can do replacement of the cartilage with the help of metal and plastic. So I'm going to limit my discussion to the commonly used problems or the commonly available techniques in our country. The first and foremost is alignment, which is why I did ask Mukesh if the first two talks could go earlier, because in this patient who has a traumatic defect on his medial femoral condyle, and if I limb, leave his limb in varus, it is going to fail which is why it is always important to correct all bone first. After you correct bone, you have to look at stability in terms of both ligaments as well as menisci, and then you treat cartilage. So cartilage comes third in the hierarchy of uh, treatment of any form of pathology around the knee joint. So again, going back to this same example, he had a, two st he had a single stage procedure in which he had a uh, osteochondral cylinder transfer along with a high tibial osteotomy as a single stage procedure. So let's look at some examples now. This young boy of 24 came with knee pain following playing cricket. And as you can see, he has this lesion in his trochlea. You can see the T1 and the T2, both stir images and on axials, coronal and sagittals. And after doing an arthroscopy, this was a chondral flap 
which was hinged. It measures about 10 millimeters by almost 24 millimeters and it had an intact hinge on the central aspect of the trochlea. So we took this opportunity, kept the hinge intact, curated out bone, harvested bone graft from the same sided lateral femoral condyle by making a trapdoor or a window, grafted it in the bed and then we fixed it with the help of biopins and his follow up MR shows good resolution of the same. So you can use your available cartilage if it is looking healthy and intact to actually fix it back and it creates good results and good outcomes. On your left is the pre-op, on the right is your post-op. It has been fit with the help of a couple of bio nails. Another example similar to what we showed, a traumatic osteochondral fracture that we see here. And again, a largest defect in an adult male this time. And again, my preference is towards using the same technique. You match the defect, see how it fills properly. And then again, I like to use the same thing. I've gone away from using screws and um, PLLA pins using simple vicryl uh, sutures, which I feel do very well. If you use metal screws, you need to remove them. You can't leave them inside, so it requires another surgery. Screws are not superior because they may cause cartilage thinning and bioabsorbable devices that we have currently are usually PLLA. They may degrade very slowly and may cause lysis and tissue reaction, which is why my preference now has to be using uh, simple sutures. Next coming to facilitating repair and here we have three main types of uh, therapies. We can do an abrasion, we can do microfractures and we can do subchondral drilling. And this is by far the most controversial area in treatment of cartilage pathology. Microfracture is usually used for grade 4 defects which are big but yet small enough. The issue is that they have to be contained. So if you use them for an uncontained defect, you will not get the kind of success that you're hoping for. And it essentially facilitates repair by stimulating the bone marrow. The key steps are to have good instruments. We need both open and closed straight as well as angled curettes because the success of your procedure actually depends upon how well you debride the tissue. And this is all about debridement. So you need to remove loose or poorly attached cartilage take it to a stable rim and then the most important part is that you have to remove the calcific cartilage layer with a curette or with a round tip burr. Once you've done that you need to create and maintain the subchondral bone and create a defect which becomes uniformly uh, sort of contained. Following that you have to come in with your microfracture awls. You need to have all the three angles because you cannot penetrate them with the same portal with using the same awl or you have to change multiple portals and then you start by creating these microfractures use a mallet for hard bone go manual on soft bone always start peripheral and then come to the center you have to do it for a depth of two to four millimeters and then at the end of the procedure you have to maintain a decent amount of subchondral bone in between them to prevent necrosis of bone you should not re-debride and at the end of your procedure, you should see good vascularity in the same. Microfracture as a technique is going out of repute. And the reason is that it is shown to be effective only for about 24 months or so. Microfracture does not have good long-term outcomes. And the reason is that you have to pick your patient properly if you are planning to do a microfracture technique. So people who are older than 40, microfracture is bad. Duration of symptoms more than a year, microfracture is bad. A large lesion, microfracture will not work. High BMI, it will not work. Someone who has poor preoperative activity levels, it will not work. And if you've had prior or prior cartilage surgery, again, microfracture will not work. So microfracture is not a panacea. It is something that should not be taken lightly. Just because you have an awl and a mallet does not mean that you should do microfractures. Hence, to improve the results of microfracture, we've now shifted away from doing or uh, using an awl and a mallet to start doing what are called as nanofractures. So essentially, we are trying to produce smaller diameter holes which reach deep below. The problem with microfracture is that it does not permeate or go beyond the tide mark very easily because of the length of the awl that we have. And hence, what is preferred is that you do a subchondral drilling by putting your drill in very low RPM 
and with the drill in low RPM with a 1.1 mm key wire and not more than that you should penetrate in the same way without causing a lot of thermal necrosis and without generating a lot of heat. You do have commercially available macro fracture, nano fracture probes as well but essentially if you want to do anything don't do a micro fracture do a nano fracture which is far more better than a micro fracture. To further improve the results you can add a matrix on top of that. So what are we doing? We are creating the same nano fracture but now we want to trap the cells underneath a scaffold which will then produce a much better healing response. So now we have these scaffolds which are now available in our country. They are biphasic scaffolds not sort of biphasic bilayered scaffolds. You have a smooth side which is the side which penetrates inside of the joint. You have a rough side which is the side which goes to the bone marrow and they have a little layer in between them to which prevents diffusion of cells. So what do you do? Again you do the same thing. You nano fracture the lesion and once you've nano fractured the lesion you come in with this scaffold which you've sized and cut. You place it there and again stick it there in place with the help of T-cell glue. So T-cell glue comes to your advantage one more time and with the help of T-cell glue you can stick it down and once you stick it down it stays in place. What it does do is that it helps trap the cells properly and by doing so you get a much better healing response. So amic is probably the way to go in the future which is what we see. You can do ACI for lesions which are not amenable to these procedures. ACI as we know produces good long term results. I think in my own personal series my success rate with, with ACI is about 70% at the end of 10 years. You should never promise them that they'll do fantastically well. The results will start dropping after 10 years which is what I've seen in my clinical practice. So a couple of good studies which show that about 70% success at the end of 10 to 15 years is what you should expect with an ACI and the advantage of course are is that you're giving highline cartilage and you can treat larger lesions but the drawback is that it is a two-stage surgery many a times it has to be done open and the rehab is absolutely prolonged leave aside the cost of the therapy in itself. So now we have this new treatment which is a single step cartilage transfer which has been pioneered now by Arthrex and a couple of other uh, companies are also following in suit. What you use is this um, commercially available uh, device to trap and filter cartilage. So essentially you shave off cartilage from an intact portion of your joint and once you've done that you collect all the cartilage in a receptacle which is then mixed with an orthobiologic like PRP or like BMAC to create a paste which is then pushed in the area of the defect and is used. So single step minced cartilage I think is coming up in a very strong way and if you see what is happening across the globe ACI is probably falling into disrepute because of you know the inconsistency because of the two stage procedure and a very prolonged rehabilitation. So I think this promises to be a good one stage technique since it will transfer both chondrocytes as well as extracellular matrix which is essentially important and the only limitation probably be, will be that you cannot put it on a very large defect size. So the future probably will be that we will start biopsying people for cartilage, synovium and bone and with this we will have a better understanding as to what sort of categorization of the patient we have. Imaging is going to play a key role because we can then pick out patients who are going to heal and who are not going to heal and probably genetic profiling is going to be the way as we start treating cartilage defects in a much better way. Thank you once again for inviting me here to Nagpur. Thank you sir. I request you to be on the stage. I request uh, Dr. Sushiruta and Dr. Rajiv Raman to come up uh, for questions. So any questions from delegates? Yeah, yeah, a very good question. So normally we do a routine arthroscopy. Two things are important. Sometimes you have a medial compartment way. You have degenerative meniscus tear also. Some flap tears are also there. You can debride those debris. Again, you can have a good view of the lateral femoral condyle and the tibial cartilage also. And what is the amount of damage you can see. So I do routine arthroscopic, diagnostic arthroscopy before doing my STO. 
सचिन सर सो इफ यू डन एन आर्थ्रोस्कोपी योर प्लान इज फॉर अ रिअलाइनमेंट प्रोसीजर एंड यू सी ग्रेट टू चेंजेस ऑन द लैटर टीबियल प्लेटो विल यू नॉट डू इट सो फॉर ग्रेट टू चेंजेस आई थिंक आई विल नॉट चेंज माई प्लान आई विल गो फॉर इट बट समाइम यू हैव अ ट्रैप मेनिस्कस सब डिजेनेटिव मेनिस्कस टीयर इज देर यू कैन डू दो प्रोसीजर एंड एट डेफिनेटली इट वर्क पेशेंट हैज सिग्निफिकेंट रिलीफ ऑफ पेन आफ्टर दैट वॉट इज योर से अबाउट दैट सर so data probably does not suggest the same if you look at the data it says that uh, if you are doing uh, osteoarthritis or if you are doing it for arthritis then you are probably better off not doing anything intraarticular it does not make a difference so as to that's what data says i do the same thing as what you do uh, <laughs> you know if you have a hammer everything looks yes, like yes, a nail yes, yes. <laughs> that is right but um, you all have a tendency to have this urge to put in a scope inside have a look and if you put your scope inside you have a shaver so you want you to do want something to it. <laughs> <laughs> so that is very but if you look at the data there is no evidence that adding an arthroscopy doing some cartilage debridement unless you're removing loose bodies does anything or changes the outcome of the procedure uh, regarding so, meniscus a degenerative meniscus tear is there again no regarding your cartilage talk uh, mosaic plasty was not there so <laughs> no no it's about case what when when will you do because you are using a matrix and the other things so you told me that don't present mosaic plus <laughs> tea because I you want to show okay so i took it I out just now you algorithm only i never told that what is my favorite cartilage restoration procedure it is a single plug mosaic plus tea or oats or you should not call it by the commercial name oct or osteochondral cylinder transfer i think is my favorite procedure to go so any lesion which can be treated with one plug about 10 11 mm in diameter my first preference is to do a oct or an osteochondral cylinder transfer my second favorite procedure probably would be to do an abrasion or the least favorite procedure would be to do a micro micro fracture actually causes more necrosis of subchondral bone and um, it is being overused because it is very simple and the instrument is available so micro fracture is not as innocent as what we feel if you want to do it properly use your correct indication don't do it in older people you will worsen the problem you might induce spontaneous osteonecrosis after that it has happened with me as well and um, use a 1 mm k wire and drill rather at low rpm rather than take a large um, what is it micro fracture all a lot of the lot of the locally manufactured micro fracture alls are also not standardized they are very thick and large and they make huge holes so try and stay away from them what about using three or four plugs more exact plasty depends upon the patient prof okay patient Yeah, like the first patient which I showed the first example, who had a largest defect in which I did a realignment surgery. He was young; he was 24. So I used two, two or three plugs. I don't remember, and I did it. Shushrut, so what's your highest cut off for doing HTO? Means you, if suppose the overall angle is, you have to attain 92 or 90. Yeah. so uh, that's what my third case was like that where the varus deformity was around 12 to 13 degree mm. i think the cut off for the mpta should be around 93 to 94 degrees okay we should not exceed that limit okay and so if you want to exceed that limit we should definitely add a dfo to it so what's the highest limit 12 degree correction or 14 degree with hto or should we add dfo after 12 so i think if you're looking at corrections which go beyond 10 degrees there is significant metaphyseal varus right so you you probably require a bifocal correction okay so at least i am not a deformity surgeon and when i start seeing all these both tibias which have got previous blounds in those people you need very high degree corrections so anything that starts going between beyond 12 degrees relook you okay. probably not selecting the correct indication as a mm-hmm. knee surgeon if you're a mm-hmm. deformity surgeon then you'll probably use a fixator or something and do it but uh, that is not my cup of tea at all Raji, what about you? You use hinge wire in all cases, or you don't use, or in selective case to prevent hinge Sometimes fractures. Sometimes in selective cases, but I think usually you should be protective. So uh, while putting your osteotomy CE in the CR, ER, that you are not crossing the seventy-five percent, eighteen percent limit from the medial to lateral part, and 
if you are dealing with a very osteoporotic bone sometimes so you can put a hinge wire over the lateral cortex so it just says if you do post op ct there is very high chance of hinge fracture so okay. i think we should put in every case hinge wire uh, i don't put it in every case sachin sir so two messages take home today right now any osteotomy 110% use a hinge wire hinge wire is your best friend no matter what you do for the femur for the tibia and second don't put any biocomposite synthetic fillers at all okay there is a good consensus paper released 2 weeks ago by sk okay. and the chances of non union are higher if you use biosynthetic materials so don't use biosynthetic materials at all either leave the gap open use allograft or use autograft biosynthetic materials is equivalent is equal to trouble strictly no raman sir what fixation device uh, do you recommend implant implant normal yeah normally normally we use the uh, i use tomofix or uh, you can use the shorter plate also now we have podu plates and smaller plates are also available so any of them you can use so all all those fancy plates are available you can use any of them you have indian plates also available nowadays so you can use any of them even a short plate is okay yeah, not necessarily yeah, a... yeah short see you are uh, uh, keeping them protect, protected we are doing for 6 weeks and i think after 6 weeks you do a next you see the uh, Uh, callus formation from lateral to medial side. You see some of the puffy uh, form callus formation of after eight weeks. So I think a smaller plate is good for me. Well, I think unless you have a here, yeah. uh, unless you have a uh, hinge fracture, uh, the smaller plates do well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry, hinge fracture. And that is, I think, this message. I think this was uh, one of the HTO webinar. Also, we saw that. Uh, Uh, putting a hinge K wire and sometimes people put a hinge screw also. Such is what is your take on that? So hinge wires are now going to be passe. Hinge screws are now going to be the norm because the hinge screws will offer a far better protection. It will make your it will protect your hinge. It will heal your osteotomy faster. And unlike Rajiv, I get my patients to weight bear full weight bearing on day one. Day one, yeah. Because we now have stronger plates, which are angle stable plates. and with these strong plates you can allow them to start weight bearing as much as possible from day one i have a question for all you three uh, what uh, do you use for your pre op uh, uh, deformity correction do you use a software uh, so i'll just need to add there's a one us veterinary company with the name brightbox they are uh, providing very cheap software as in 500 rupees per month compared to trauma cards or any other so thing. was that the same thing yes, you were using yes yes okay bright box bright box for everyone bright box yeah, yeah. bright box what software do you use no that, that's just <laughs> software for veterinary but uh, you can use on any board so it will not analyze the fever of <laughs> <laughs> Now I use digital planning, uh, so I used trauma CAD. Then I went to MediCAD. Now currently I'm on PeakMed because I can't use Windows-based computers. I'm very bad at using them. My mind is all tuned to Mac now, and I find it very difficult to use Windows-based software. So currently the software that I use is PeakMed, which is a, a iOS-based uh, platform, not iOS, whatever Mac-based platform. Sir, what is the maximum flexion deformity you accept for HTO? And any tricks to prevent the slope uh, distortion? Yeah, normally, see, when you are planning for bi-planar osteotomy, so if you do, you are planning for a neutral slope, part of a slope is there to keep it intact. Try to put your uh, distracting caliper in the posterior part so that you have a trapezoidal gap there. All right, that is important. And every time you can correct, you see in the lateral view also. You can see any time because you are uh, most of this uh, this surgery you are doing in supine position that you are over correcting or under correcting the slope or not. Thank you, all three of you. Please, please have a seat on the sofa, and uh, we now start with the case discussion. So the first case is by Dr. Abhishek Ghatge from Bilaspur. Uh, good afternoon, all of you. I would like to thank Arthroscopic Society Nagpur for providing me the opportunity. Today, I am presenting a case on cartilage restoration. This is a patient, 17-year-old boy who suffered trauma. Uh, he had a history of trauma six months back. He went to some surgeon. 
he was treated conservatively for that but it failed and presented to me with complaint of pain gritty sensation and occasional locking he had a limping gait his ligamentous lex, uh, ligamentous stability was good and no limb alignment mal alignment problem this was the x ray he had a big osteochondral uh, loose body in the intercondylar notch and there was a defect in the weight bearing portion lateral side of medial femoral condyle in the mri it was a full thickness osteochondral defect directly up to the osteo osteo uh, uh, directly up to the subchondral bone in arthroscopy uh, the loose body was taken out it was around 20 by 10 mm and this was a full thickness defect in the medial femoral condyle around 2 cm square so what are the treatment options we can offer him leave it as such age is 17 17 right? years 6 yeah. months so this old. is a classic ocd lesion that you can see here on the mfc yes, and um, i think in my hand i would probably do a single step procedure and put two plugs of oct there i would do it as a mini open and keep my arthroscopy ego aside because when you're trying to put multiple plugs especially on a surface which curves very rapidly to match the exact contour is more important rather than you know say that i'm going to do everything arthroscopically so i do a mini open i'd harvest two plugs maybe 10 mm or 110 and 18 and fill in that defect and that's all that i'll offer aci for this will be overkill if you ask me one of the reasons why aci will not do too well is because this is an uncontained defect and it is a deep defect so if one has to do an aci one will have to bone graft it and then put aci we are necessarily stretching it too far in this uh, young boy of 17 definitely two plugs are the better option i will also prefer and aci again 17 year what sir also told now results are coming 10 years follow up patients are coming with uh, more knee pain or degenerative changes post aci so i think uh, one eight two eight mm plug with two or three mm distance will do we could enough so uh actually i planned for a arthroscopic uh, but instead of uh, two big plugs i put a three small 6 mm plugs took out from the non weight bearing portion of lateral femoral condyle but sachin sir was telling that's good because if you have a slope here because you have a change of slope here so three plugs are good enough so that you can yeah three small plugs, plugs and are good uh, enough that too big three small plugs and the final stability of the plugs were good Use the commercially available uh, ACI kit. So this was the final uh, fixation of the osteochondral plugs. On flexion extension, there was no impingement of the plugs. patient was kept non weight bearing for 4 weeks passive range of motion was started immediately next day partial weight bearing started after 4 weeks full weight bearing after 6 weeks and this was the 2 weeks post op x ray where we can see the defect filled with the osteochondral plug which healed subsequently and in one year follow up there was no uh, cartilage, uh, cartilage degeneration and the contour of the femoral condyle was well maintained this was one year follow up picture patient was walking without any limb and he can perform everything thank you sir so question to rajiv uh, question to mukesh 
and show everybody so when you're doing osteochondral cylinder plugs uh, how do you want to keep them do you want to keep them flush do you want to keep them recessed do you want to keep them proud if so by how much so 1 to 2 mm proud i keep them but it should be at the um, level of the cartilage level sink yes no it should not sink it should not sink and the donor side recipient side should be at least 1 to 2 mm less than the size of the plug and the second is that if you have gaps what do you do in the middle of the gaps like there were some gaps what do you do for them I leave it like that so that's good i think there's a good message you can do nano fracture of those area in those area Uh, I think Hangoudi came to Calcutta once. He told you, if you are covering 80% of the area, it's good enough. It's good enough. Very difficult to match. <laughs> yeah. Not used. Not used. Honey comb sort of. Now after ACL, I think Mukesh is planning for this hexagonal. <laughs> Now he is not fond of round holes. <laughs> Thank you, Abhishek sir, for a wonderful case. I would like to invite Mukesh sir for this, for his next case. So again, a case of osteochondral defect, but with some different kind of defect. He is a 19-year-old physiotherapy student. He had pain and locking complaint in the knee since last seven months. Insidious onset, no, as such, no history of any major trauma. He is a recreational badminton player and he loves to do tracking and all. Examination: There was joint line tenderness. McMurray's was positive, which was mimicking me if I am dealing with meniscus. Rest collaterals, cruciates, and everything alignment was normal. So, unfortunately, I don't have his X-rays, but this was his MRI picture. It's a huge defect, which was seeing a bad subchondral edema down there. Indicating something wrong with the subchondral bone. Did a CT scan also, so which measures a defect of somewhere around 15 to 16 millimeter depth, about 10 millimeters in width. So, how to think and what to do, sir? So, if you ask me, the ideal treatment for this is fresh frozen mega allograft, which is unfortunately not available for us. But if you show this case anywhere in the world, they will all do fresh, fresh frozen, frozen allograft. Mega graft. Unfortunately, it's not available. So the next best option for us, in this case, the basic problem is the subchondral bone. The yeah. subchondral bone is not healthy, so you need a good bed on which you have to lay your cartilage. So for me, I would talk to him, and my treatment would be stage one biopsy uh, for an ACI, and go ahead and do a very thorough debridement of all the necrotic bone. size that defect so that when he comes back after a month with the cartilage ready i will do a second procedure where i'll use bone grafting in the form of a good um not tricortical bone but spongy bone harvested with a core reamer from one of the oct sets fill it with bone plugs and then lay cartilage on it so two stage for me rajiv Yeah, big defect. I think what Sachin sir told. He agreed. It's a two-stage procedure. So grafting in second stage, not yeah, in first. First stage. When you take biopsy. Yeah. No. Grafting second stage. Second stage. Mm -hmm. Grafting and putting ACI in the same stage. So we can't do it in first stage grafting. So that let it heal well. Anyone else? Any other point? Absolutely, it was normal. Yeah, normal. In his 19 years old, it was normal. What was the size of defect you told? Two centimeter in depth. Oh, this is here. Yeah. It is 16 mm depth. So this was the initial picture on the scope. All loose cartilage flaps were there, along with the loose pieces lying in the gutter, and that was the 
डिफेक्ट ऑलमोस्ट से 15, 16 मिलीमीटर एंड बाय ऑलमोस्ट 10 एम एम तो स्टिल यू कैन प्लान फॉर आई थिंक दिस सींग दिस डिफेक्ट 15 मिलीमीटर यू कैन प्लान फॉर आई थिंक सींग से फर्स्ट स्टेज वन स्टेज मजाक प्लास्टी आल्सो 16 एम एम डेप्थ हाउ मच लॉन्ग प्लग विल यू टेक हाउ मच लॉन्ग प्लग यू विल टेक सो व्हाट आई डिड आई डिड फर्स्ट स्टेज बोन ग्राफ्टिंग आई डिड सम माइक्रो फ्रैक्चर्स इन दैट सबकॉन्टल बोन एज वेल with the help of long k wire took out the graft and snugly fitted it and malleted it so that it fits well and that was the op picture after i put the graft in that defect the cancellous graft you put cancellous in the graft base. i just okay. punched it in uh 3 months strictly non weight bearing for him that was 3 months post ct scan showing some union but some still some gap was there should we wait at this stage or should we go ahead because my question ki if we do secondary bone graft would this have been shown the same but we have already done acr now so putting an acr here is again risky because again your subchondral bone is not good so i think the treatment for him again is to again debride hmm. pack bone grafts again come back again later and hmm. then think of cartilage anyone else want to add something I think now your defect is around five or six, six or eight millimeter like that. Yeah. That so is have, uh, hardly yeah. anything, but here but the yeah. small defect was there deep in the subcondyle. It was healing over there. I think I th- we can plan for a cartilage procedure again. ACI is a no because uh, uh, in this case we can plan for a cartilage procedure after three months or four months. That's what I did. I yes, I'm sure. So there is a void in the depths. Yeah. Uh, probably will it not be better if you do a small mini open you see the defect do a more thorough curettage do, do more thorough grafting hey, yeah. so this was his pack it even better just at 3 months in front, front of the so. condyle i think so you did arthroscopically yeah, yeah, i just was yeah. just to see so that uh, i didn't put another bone graft and did because i thought that again in the cancellous bone it will heal well so this was the picture and when i sorry and when i sorry So when I opened it, it was there was no defect as such because that was deep in. So I did ACI as a second stage at the end of three months, and kept him strict non weight bearing for another two months, then partial weight bearing and slow rehab. Now he is eighteen months post op. OT radiation. so 18 months post op he is absolutely painless doing all activities he is a student in physiotherapy college in mumbai but i told him that i won't allow you to run of one unless i have another mri at so i went in and get an mri done at 18 months post op we showed some hypertrophied area and something going somewhere there so what to do now means he is totally asymptomatic painless and all and that was his reluxcopy at 18 months i think it's fantastic little hypertrophied that will occur because but uh, some issues going in the subcondyle bone soft hair soft hair but and again. some issues are going in the subcondyle bone wait and watch i think follow up yeah that's the only thing but neglected <laughs> follow up what, what to predict this <laughs> so i think i have similar cases like this uh-huh. i have two of them and they started failing around 5 to 7 years how to deal with them sir so the problem is in the subchondral bone so unless so, until you so how to tackle that subchondral because you don't know what was what is the reason for that damage subchondral bone insufficiency so in these cases it could be a primary vascular insult in the subchondral bone it could just be a uh, impact trauma which is sustained which he doesn't remember mm-hmm. which causes a uh, temporary song like procedure song like event and then progresses like this so probably we should have done regrafting again and waited yeah i think so because unless and until you have good subchondral bone no matter how much cartilage you lay upon it it will not stay for a very long time and i remember these two patients very well they were doing well 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 they used to compl- they started complaining of pain i could see i did mr scans they were looking fine and then again pain MR scan again and everything had to come off 
There was nothing left there. So I spoke to Christopher Aguilaret as well, one of the good mm-hmm. cartilage chaps, and he said, okay, the problem is with subchondral bone, you can't do much, which is why the world is now going away from doing ACI and going to a fresh frozen allograft for that very reason. So we don't have that here. The OT ready? Yeah. One's no, but if your OT is ready, we can skip it, no issues. Yes, Sajin? You wanted to ask something? We'll start with life surgery? Okay. So now it's one year follow up. Okay. 18 months. 18 months. Huh? Do we have time? Third case, Laga? You all are Next one. We'll go live. We'll, we'll go, go live. live. Yeah. Hiraj. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Uh, good afternoon. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Hi. So. I, I believe the history has been presented, history and examination. Uh, no, no, you'll have to present that. Can someone put the slides of the okay. second patient on? So, uh, Naved, I think Mukesh uh, or somebody was going to present. Yeah, yeah, we uh, have it. We'll just put that on uh, the screen first and then we'll uh, come to you. We can see you though. Okay, so I'll just start. So, uh, I invite the chairpersons for the next session, Dr. Sandeep Biraris, Dr. Rajiv Raman and Dr. Neha. He's a 30-year-old guy who works in an insurance company, had a road traffic accident five months back, injured his right upper distal radius, underwent surgery for that, and now complaining of pain and instability. Next slide. So, next, please. Please. Ah, so, that is his Lachman. Please, go ahead. Anterior drawer. Next, please. The alignment was normal, x-rays were looking pristine clear, MRI, alignment. next slide. So it's looking like a bit intact ECL, might be partial tear to full thickness with normal meniscus. So the plan by Shreyas is all inside ACL reconstruction. Over to you Shreyas. Yeah, thank you Mukesh for the presentation. So I've just uh, started the hamstring graft harvesting. I'm just about to open the sartorius fascia. I don't know if you're able to see it. Oh, we can see it. Okay, great. Still is me. So, uh, outside picture, uh, cameraman, can you just move a little? So we're just opening up the sartorius fascia. I can see the gracilis. Uh, uh, mixed up, please. So what is the plan here? You are going to harvest both? No. Uh, semi-tea if it's of good quality. Quadruple semi-tea. Actually, we are not able to see clearly. Uh, can you just ask a cameraman to focus properly? Okay. 
Can you see any better? Yeah. Okay. So I've just caught the semi T and I'm just going to cut the vinculae. So any tips here to identify uh, which is gracilis and so which is semi So the gracilis is more proximal uh, and thinner and the semi T is broader and uh, slightly distal. So once you lift the gracilis, because of the common pest uh, attachment, you can identify the semi T underneath it. I'm just trying to separate uh, the gracilis from the semi T. So I've got the semi T in my hand. So have you done diagnostic arthroscopy already? Uh, so no, I haven't. So that's a good point. Um, but I did the EUA and the you know the ACL was torn. The knee was unstable. Tendon stripper, please. Wet, wet it, please. So I use an open tendon stripper because I don't detach it uh, from the pest. Till later. And you don't pass, uh, pass ethylon loop around no, the no, tendon? No, but I will detach it. So scissor please, the suture cutting scissor. So I'm just going to remove the muscular. So the semi-T is here. It might be a 7.5, looks like. Although the leg is slightly bigger, but the graft is not similar, but we'll see. Because we can always go back to the gracilis if you feel that it's not adequate. Uh, two Langenbergs, please. Inside knife. So the assistant is just holding it close to the periosteal attachment on the tibia, so I can take as much length as possible. And I can get a little bit of periosteum for whatever it's worth. Okay, so there, there it is, we've got the graft. We'll just go on to the preparation table to get an idea on the diameter. Knife, please. So, um, so I don't know whether you can see it, but I don't think this is going to be a, a good diameter graph for a gentleman of his size. This might just turn out to be a seven on quadrupling it. So I'm going to take the gracilis uh, right away. So we'll come back. Rohit. Tushar. Can I have the uh, Langen back, please? Um, forceps and uh, mixed up. Even the gracilis is not of great quality, but we'll take whatever we get. So just doing some blunt dissection.
releasing the wind kill Tendons triple. Can you guys see the quality of the gracilis? Very thin. Mm, it's very thin. And there's a more adhesions in the inner part, so I'm not able to get it completely free. Because the risks of uh, gracilis pre-amputation are quite high. Yeah, it's not free yet. Alice? Yeah, I can see. Tushar? Like this. My scissor, please. Still is. Okay, tendon stripper. Tendon stripper, moist gear. Okay. okay, so at least we can double it, if not quadruple the gracilis. Um, Langenbeck, scissor, uh, suture scissor. So in such situations um, where the graph diameter for the size of the patient uh, would not be adequate, and which is generally uh, around 8 in a male and 7 to 7.5 in a female, I will augment it with an internal brace. In 
इनसाइड नाइफ प्लीज तो चलो Dr. Shreyas, yes. Yeah, any particular reason why you use a open tendon stripper? Because I don't detach it f unless uh, I remove the muscular tissue. Just uh, way I have kind of been trained and doing it. These are minor things. I don't think they have much of a, you know impact on the outcomes. So it doesn't really matter. So uh, we'll have one camera at the back to show us the graft link preparation. Uh, so we'll quadruple the semi t. Uh, can you see the graph master table? Can we have the inside knife, please? Uh, sure, sir. Uh, Neha, can you see the uh, graph preparation station? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Very well so well. if you see the length, so for all inside again, you know the the important thing is calculation, uh, and you know there are various ways of doing it. But generally speaking, for males, I go for 250 graft. What is and your preferred diameter? So eight in a male, uh, average male, and uh, seven to seven point five in a female. Okay. If it is a stout male or is if it is an athlete, does it change your graph diameter? No, it has to be proportionate. You don't want to overstuff the notch. Okay. So yeah, so we've kind of got it. As I said, we might just double the uh, gracilis, and we will quadruple the semi t. So we'll just prepare it. So we've taken two tight ropes. So one can use a tight rope RT on the femoral side and a no button tight rope and a you know suture disc or a ABS button on the tibial side. I use a tight rope RT uh, on both sides. So we're just going to prepare that and also the internal brace will be um, you know uh, added within the strands of the graft because you know some uh, there's some concern that you know strong sutures can abrade. Um, the cartilage and so on. So we'll just see that. We'll keep one video on for the graph preparation and the other one I'll just do a start a diagnostic arthroscopy. Okay. So uh, can you... Is one camera on the knee, the landmarks? Yeah, I can see. So two high portals, AM and AL, and a low anteromedial portal. So pretty standard. I do vertical portals. Stroke art. Okay, so we are in. Uh, can we switch this light off, please? Uh, can we see the camera picture, please? Yeah. The arthroscopy. I'm just, I'm just going to insert the arthroscope. Okay. Um, can I just get you to hold this with the clamp side up? Yeah, okay, great. So can you see the arthroscopy image now? Yes. Okay, I'm just going to focus it. Okay. So a diagnostic round. Um, can we... Uh, so uh, recording is short right. Is not... Is it long right? No. Can we start the recording from there? Okay. Still images on the left, right? No, again, it's not. Tissue complex uh, is involved. And again, where no, dial right test, uh, uh, in, huh? in, especially in chronic. Okay, Goss, please. Oh, God. You got it. Yeah. So I think. Uh, White balance, please. Done? Okay. So, uh, patella, lateral facet, medial facet. Trochlea, 
for teletrochlear articulation. Once the recording button is sorted, please record it. Going on to the lateral gutter, lateral synovial fold, coming on to the medial side, on to the medial compartment. Can I have a Venflon, please? Venflon. Needle your Venflon. Oh, I'm good. That's fine. Little bit, okay. Knife, please. Needle out, please. So, if you are planning to do meniscus repair uh, beforehand, if you have decided, so does it change your portal placement? If it's a lateral meniscal repair, I'll have a slightly higher AM portal. For medial, it does not change. So I try to visualize the blade to just make sure that I don't damage the cartilage. Trocar, please. Making sure my access is okay. Can the table height go up, please? Can I have the shaver, please? It's in the pocket there. No, I'll tell you when to stop. Please, table up, please. No problem, it's okay. So we'll just, uh, if it goes up, it'll be better, if possible. Okay, great, thank you. Can we pump, use the pump, please? Clamp up. Yeah. Clamp, please, yeah. Pump, please. Three thousand and yeah, oscillation. Okay, good. Just take a little bit of the fat pad off. Okay, we we'll leave it here. Can I have the probe, please? Probe. So how often you do pie crusting? Only for ACL. No. No, prior crusting only for root repair, okay. most often. Okay. Can I have a probe, please? Arthroscopy probe. So while we are looking for the probe, uh, vaguely the capsule and the peripheral part of the meniscus seems intact. This little fold is kind of a giveaway that you know the meniscus is intact. The femoral condyle, tibial plateau looks fine. We'll go back in the posterior part. So there's no ramp lesion. I will probe it, but uh, in the interest of time, I'm just going to carry on. Okay. We found it. Pump, please. Yeah, so the meniscus is intact. There is no undersurface tear. And uh, posterior horn is intact. Okay, can you hold the probe, please, for me? We'll go on to the ACL. So we go lateral to the ligamentum mucosum. So there is a ACL tear here near complete femoral side 
while we are here. Certain lateral joints open up well, and this is one of them, more or less. So again, uh, you know, the, it seems to be intact. Can I ask you to hold the probe, please? We do a figure of four, just to check. Thank you. And uh, yeah. So the posterior horn. I mean, we look f more uh, carefully here because of the pivot shift. Sometimes you can see an incomplete undersurface tear. But there's nothing here today. So the meniscus looks fine. So does the cartilage. So we go on to the preparation of the ACL. Can the table go fully down, please? Fully down, table, height down. Shiver, please. Again, a way to assess the ACL in figure of four, so you can see the PL bundle better if there is a partial tear. So, okay. So, table f is fully down? Okay. So, I just need to take the fat pad around the ligamentum mucus. So, can I have the shaver, please? Okay. Can you uh, continuously pump, please, while I... So I, uh, I do very little fat pad removal, whatever little is required for me to visualize. Uh, although I liked uh, Mukesh's uh, technique in the morning, a trans patella portal, patella tendon portal, it really gives a very good bird's eye view of the ACL footprint. So then we just go on to the, so I, I will preserve as much remnant as possible, uh, at the same time ensuring that I don't compromise on my vision for the bony landmarks. Can we hold the scope, please? We're going to flex the knee to 90 now. Yeah, and can we please hold it here? Fantastic. Shiver from you. Okay. Do you use pump for all your knees? No, only shoulders. And hips, not for knee. I have this uh, irrigation tubing, yes, use? which is a hand operated. So, you know, we can control the pressure. Otherwise, one can have a superior lateral portal, you know, the very standard we are doing. Can we please pump while the we are sucking the knee out? So, okay. Uh, so this is fine. I'll put the shaver back. Can I have the radio frequency probe, please? Radio frequency. Thank you. So we're just going to pump, please, uh, if there is any bubble. So I do like to see the posterior edge of the uh, lateral femoral condyle. And in a majority of cases, the stump is attached to the PCL. So, you know, you're not taking a lot of remnant ACL off. So that's the posterior edge. That's the bifurcate ridge. So I, I like to go for that spot. Can we, uh, and, uh, yeah, we'll do that. So can I have a microfracture owl, please? Again, there are various ways of finding this spot. And uh, so I just, no, I'll do it manually. So just talking you through the uh, summit of the posterior uh, edge of the lateral femoral condyle coming in line. This is the bifurcate ridge. The, the residence ridge is up here. So I don't go too low. Uh, depending on the diameter of the graft, I decide. So this seems to be a 7.5, 7 on the femur, 7.5 on the tibia. So I just mark it and then I change the portal and put my scope in the medial portal to just see if that is satisfactory, whether it lies in the center of the footprint. So more or less it does. Maybe a touch anterior in terms of the uh, tight rope pin insertion, but we can always modify that. 
So then I, I go back, put the scope in the lateral portal again. Can I have the Venflon, please, needle? So now I make my low anteromedial portal, visualizing the medial femoral condyle cartilage to ensure that I don't violate it because that's one of the problems in doing a second portal or a low AM portal. So my needle is coming here. It is far away from the femoral condyle. At the same time, I want to make sure that the trajectory is parallel to the floor. At the same time, I'm not skirting. So this is a little unacceptable. So I'm just going to go a little more medial uh, for my insertion. Again, checking the femoral condyle. We have plenty of room, so. And then just coming back here. Yeah, so this seems to be an acceptable trajectory. I won't uh, skive of the uh, footprint. So I accept that. And one second, one second. Okay, now can we take that off, please? Thank you. Good. So I make a slightly liberal medial portal because for suture management, I, I need a, a portal and also for graft passage. I just make sure that I come above the meniscus, which it is, so I don't uh, damage it. Can I have a trocar, please? So again, checking the trajectory seems fine. Can I just borrow the shaver again for a second? Thank you. Now, can I have the tightrope drill pin, please? So you can see my microfracture owl mark. Now, uh, can we hold the scope, please? Uh, so because my portal is vertical, I go with the pin being vertical. Okay. No, no, no. No, we need to stay here. Can you just hold the leg? Please don't let go of the leg, the landmarks. So knee flexion, how much is it? Is it? I, I have not uh, done the drilling yet. I'm just taking, inserting it. I'll just talk you through it in a second. Can we, is go or under darling, please? Yeah, shorten it. I'll tell you how much. Can we shorten it till here, please? You don't want the uh, tightrope drill pin too long, otherwise it bends as you insert it. So I go to around 115, 120 degrees of uh, flexion. Okay. Uh, I have used the TKR foot rest to give me that idea. Can we put this in, please? Okay, so I'm just inserting this. I must say my low anterior medial portal is a little bigger than what I would have liked, but the capsular portal is not too wide. The skin uh, cut is a little more than I would have liked. Okay. So at this stage, uh, so this is the mark. Uh, can we have a hammer, please? Can you come around here and hammer, please, for me? So what I do is I just engage the, because the, another worry is that as you drill, a minute, uh, you, you can skive off. So what I do is I just rest it in, gentle hammers, please, gentle. Just engage it, very good, till the tip of the tightrope pin is where my landmark is. Keep going. Yeah, okay. Can you please come around? Now I'm going to hyperflex the knee. In a, wait, 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 please, wait. Somebody has to hold the scope. One second. Can you hold the scope, please, for me? Okay. So just slowly, if we hyperflex, that's it. Just keep it here for me. Thank you. Great. So I have not missed the point. You can see it? Yeah. Okay. So can, uh, can you take the pump, please? Just be careful of the equipment. Yes. So if I need some vision, pump please once. So we're just measuring. So this is uh, 20. So I so what I like is two centimeters in each socket. So I drill five millimeters more for the final tightening. So that's 25, yeah. And then I come out. 
Okay, thank you. Then we use the depth gauge, the dedicated depth gauge. Can we pump please once? Thank you. Just trying to find the far cortex. So just trying to negotiate my depth gauge within that. Now we need to, the, high, the flexion, let's see, one second. We need to just make sure the flexion is correct. Yeah, can you press down? Uh, can I have the shaver? One second. Ruit? I'll take it. Then. Thank you. So you have not drilled through the lateral cortex yet? No, no, I have drilled. The pin went through. What happens is, uh, if it doesn't match, then uh, you know we won't get the depth gauge crossing. Okay, so I can see my part there. Can you take the shaver, Tushar? Okay, depth gauge, please. Yeah, thank you. Pump, please. Yeah, so it's going through. But yeah, maybe I'm going to, Sandeep, maybe I'm just going to drill again. Uh, Can I have the pin? I thought, but I thought it is, normally so. I use a pneumatic, so this is a cordless, so obviously heavy, but I thought I had gone through, but uh, I'll just do it again. Oh, same drill pin, Vapis Lagao, please. Tushar. Thank you. Can somebody hold the scope, please? One second. Is the table fully down? Height? Okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Just watch your finger, please, Tushar. Yeah, it's gone through this time for sure. Depth gauge, yes, please. Yes. Curate next in a second. Tushar, pump once, please. That, yeah. So it's a 45, which is good for males. I like that. Can I have the beef pin, please? Beef pin on hand. Thank you. Okay. So I'm just going to go to the graph master and do some measurements, and I'll talk you through. So Tushar, can you please wait here? Thank you. So can we have the camera on the graph master? I'll just talk you through the graph preparation. Can you see everyone? Yes, yes, we can okay. see. So this is a quadruple... Zoom, zoom in, please. Yeah, please zoom in. Yes? Yes. Okay. So this is a quadruple semi-T. There is a tightrope RT button on the femoral side. There is a tightrope RT button on the tibial side. I mounted it on the graph master. This is the fiber tape uh, to uh, the internal brace concept. And as you see here, it has been incorporated within the strands of the um, quadruple graft and the doubled gracilis. And uh, I'll talk you through each step. So the first thing I do while it's mounted is to make sure that the tapes are not caught within the 
uh, the sutures. So, you know, it is sliding well yes. because that's one of the concerns. And then we measure the size of the graft, marker pen and ruler, please. So you have double the tape? No, the tape is single. It is here, uh, Sandeep. No, yeah. I mean, uh, the, both the loops are on one side. You mm -hmm. have looped the tape. Yeah. So the femoral RT button, uh, I yeah. you know, it's a built-in. So it, okay. it comes pre-mounted. Uh, this is the second generation, so you know it's pre-mounted. And now I'll just check the graph length. So if you can see, it is a, a 62 millimeter graft, right? Yes. And these uh, stay sutures uh, for the graft link are, are at 15 and 20. So 20 is what I want on each side. But that is always, uh, you know, adjustable because that's the advantage of using an adjustable device on the femur and the tibia. So there are 20 markings here. And then while we are here, we'll just measure the diameter. So the sizer has been mounted and you can see there's a 7.5 mounted on this. So 7.5, it is tight on the tibia. So we'll, we'll try eight on the tibia. Yeah, so eight flip cutter, please. And on the femur, we will just see what the sizing is. So it will be 7.5 here. Yeah, 7.5 on the femur. So 7.5 femur, eight tibia. Now we are going to remove the um, graph from the femoral side to mark the socket length on the tight rope button on the femoral RT. So can you see everyone? Yeah. So it was 45 millimeters. So uh, my assistant has kept the button longitudinal so that we get the accurate uh, depth and 45 is here. So, you know, this is the marking. Can I have a moist gauze, please? Okay. Saline soap gauze, yeah, okay, good. So, any questions on the graph link before I go back to the arthroscopy? No, I think so far no okay, questions. Okay, good, okay. So, you know, always check, check, double check. So, this is a 7.5 millimeter low profile uh, rima. Now, on the femoral side, um, the original technique for the all inside is to do an outside in uh, and I have transited from the conventional way to the all inside. So on the femoral side, uh, you know, whether we've been using a fixed device or an adjustable loop device, we were always drilling sockets and not tunnels, unlike the tibia. So I have retained that, um, you know, step and I just use a low profile ACL reamer to make a socket from inside, rather than doing an outside in. But, uh, you know, there are dedicated jigs, as we know, for an outside in. So and no flip cutter for femur? Femur, no, yes. And as, uh, you know, we discussed today, and Sachin mentioned that when you're doing a PLC with ACL, we can do an outside in on the femur. So I'm just going in. Again, one important thing is to make sure that we don't sky off the medial femoral condyle cartilage. Can somebody hold the cartilage for me? Rohit, please, thank you. So I'm just going to have a look, whatever I can. But I think I'm far away, so I'm, and again, I just gently negotiate it inside the joint. There it is. Now, I'm just going to, so the depth is 45, and I just want 20 in, in each socket femur and tibia, and five millimeters is for the final tightening. So I'll just go in till 25. So that's 25. Thank you. Can we straighten the knee now, please, and shaver? Thank you. Straighten the knee, very good. So you're just gonna clear up the femoral socket. 
before we move on to the tibia so we have a bridge of bone and i'll just take the little bit of fat pad off which tends to swell up just anterior to the acl not otherwise okay now we will just swap switch the portal uh, can i have the tunnel rasp first please socket rasp before we accurate uh, please thank you just to freshen up the edges to prevent any graft abrasion front and back okay great so i'll just swap the portal now to see where my socket is can i have a trocar please gauze please to clean the scope thank you so i'll just try and give you the so obviously there is a good bridge of bone posteriorly uh, and uh, you know we are in the center of the footprint yeah i have not removed too much of native acl so th the vision can sometimes be little challenging but we are happy with that now we move on to the tibial side so can i have a radio frequency please so i just tend to mark where i have to uh, enter with the flip cutter so again you know we all most of us know about it but the landmark i use is the posterior edge of the anterior horn of lateral meniscus and just a couple of millimeters anterior medial and center medial to lateral so this is going to be my point for the flip cutter so can i have this light on please thank you can i have the careful yeah careful yeah okay so we've we shall hold this please so can you see the flip cutter jig the footprint jig zoom out please camera man zoom out please thank you zoom out yeah yes so, okay uh, you know we all have our preferences i keep the angle to 60 degrees and you know we and this is the collar which we embed in so that when we retrograde Uh, drill with the flip cutter we don't accidentally make a sock a tunnel uh, of a socket so mm. i'll just show you that so we just go in and uh, i go through the low am portal because then it gives me a good trajectory so the laser mark i want to just come in the center of the laser mark Great. tushar can you please hold the thing for me good so that seems to be fine i'm just going to now push the sleeve of the jig in and uh, lock it okay can you guys see it? and on the tibial side my socket is at least 45 so you're showing that so can we keep that please tushar focus on that thank you pump take the pump please uh what you mentioned socket is 45 can you elaborate on that no yeah if you see there is a marking on the sleeve okay yeah so on the outside there is a 45 socket i won't uh, make too big but i just get an idea So what I do is, so you, one can go with a flip cutter, but I tend to go in with the beef pin, and I'll give, tell you the reasons. So just let me come in first, then I'll talk you through. Once the drilling noise is over, right? So we are exactly where we want. Yes. Now the reason I use the drill pin first is, if I want to change, I can do so because with the flip cutter, if you're wrong, then there's no way you can come back. So that is one reason. Secondly, I create a track. and i know the arthrex guys don't want to listen to this but i create a track so that the flip cutter tip doesn't become blunt so i i can use it for a few cases so you know my trajectory is fine can i have the flip cutter now please thank you
and you know in Nagpur you have the ETO machine, so it you can reuse the flip cutter. So uh, let me talk you through to the flip cutter. Um, right? Can I? Yeah. So can you zoom out? You can see the flip cutter now. Yes. Uh, Rohit, can you hold the jig for me, please? Thank you. So the flip cutter has this pin which can be deployed with this. Uh, so you can see now it's deployed and when I push down it is straight. So you insert it like a pin and then you deploy it and you drill retrograde and there are markings and there is a grommet here on the outer side which again corresponds and two laser marks correspond to a centimeter or 10 uh, millimeters. So I just, I'll go, go in, I'll take the jig from you, great, and I'll go in with the flip cutter. Again, we are right where we want to be. Can you hold this, please? So at this stage, I we've got the outside view. Have you got the outside view of the knee? Yes, so, yes. Okay, so I'm just removing the jig. I'm retaining the sleeve. Okay, and uh, while we are here, Langen back, please, and a hammer. So I showed you that there is a collar on the sleeve. So you don't make a, a tunnel out of a socket. So uh, you know, I'm just trying to hammer that collar all the way till it is flush. Especially in soft bone, you know, we tend to sometimes blow out. And then my grommet, so once I deploy the flip cutter, we've checked the mark, mark right? Let me just uh, go back and check the mark. Size, eight, yeah, perfect. So eight. Can you pump please once? Yeah. So I just I just withdraw the till the tip reaches the tibia, and then I I put my grommet flush with the sleeve edge. So now I will take 25 millimeters. So that is one centimeter. That's two centimeters, and that's two and a half. So 25 uh, on either side. Then I just go in same way. And then we just uh, straighten the drill apart and then we just withdraw it, the pin like so. And can I have the radio frequency please? So we haven't, so one of the other concerns while using a flip cutter is that you can, uh, you know, you can take away the remnant. So here we are trying to be as gentle as possible. I am just going to ensure that I can see the opening of my socket because the graft is pass retrograde, unlike uh, when we do tunnels where we pass it anti-grade. So I have to ensure that the mouth of the socket on the tibial side is clear to allow the entire 20 millimeters to go inside. Can I have the shaver, please? So we've retained the remnant. Just created a socket on the tibial side. Just clearing the mouth. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So now can I have an artery forceps, please? Don't pump, yeah. So that's the tibial socket. Uh, there's a bit of fat pad, so I just need to shave that off. Can I have a shaver, please? One second. Slowly pumping, not too fast. Okay, thank you. Artery, please. So, for su because we have to pass two sutures since we are passing the graft retrograde on the tibial side, 
I just want to make sure that there is no fat pad caught between that and I use a cannula just to ensure that the two sutures don't have a bridging fat pad between them. So I use this passport uh, flexible cannula. Yeah, okay, press please. Okay, can I have a trocar please? So the cannula is here, inside on the medial side, it's just covered with some fat pad, but I use a trocar to make sure that, you know, I'll just shave off that little fat pad blocking the mouth of the cannula. Can I have the RF, please? Cannula, please, Rohit. Yeah, so now the mouth is clear, as so. And it also protects the medial femoral condyle. So can I have the pin without the suture, without the knot, please? So first I pass the tibial side of the suture. And there is, uh, can you see the outside view? Yes. Okay, so there's no knot here. So I just pass it from the sleeve, anti-grade. Pump please once. Okay, suture retriever, please. Retrieve the loop of that suture for, through the passport cannula, like so. Okay. Then I remove the, the sleeve on the tibial side. Can I have a mosquito, please? So the tibial side of the suture is passed. Now we go on to the femoral side, like the conventional thing, with the knot. Can I have a suture with the knot, please, for the femur? The knot at the eyelet, please, knot. Thank you. Great. Uh, Rohit, can you pull on this? Good. So again, I'm just trying to visualize the cannula to make sure that I don't go through the loop of the green suture, which has been passed to the tibia. So, yeah, I'm below it, as you can see so. And then we hyperflex the knee to deliver it. Hyperflex, please, Rohit. Thank you. Good. Same, not too much. Yeah, good. So, yeah, hyperflex to deliver it out on the lateral femoral side. And uh, can we have an outside view here, please? Can you see, guys? The yes. outer side of the lateral thigh. Yes, yes. So, you know, roughly if you're horizontal, parallel to the ground, you'll be in the center of the uh, anterior posterior width of the thigh. And 45 is kind of a confirmation that we have been horizontal. We've, so I just deliver the eyelet. Can I change gloves, please? Okay, straighten the knee, please. Can you give me a seven and a half also and uh, seven, eight, eight also. Thank you. Left side, left. Seven and a half please, left, left. Thank you. Okay. So we've passed the femoral suture, which is white color, and the tibial suture, which is green in color. I'll just show you the image here on the cannula. Yeah, you can see that? Yes. Can you please hold, Tusha? Good. So I just do another check to make sure there is no, the suture is not caught with each other. Okay, so once I confirm, I remove the cannula because this is an eight millimeter diameter cannula, so the graft will not pass through, but uh, Arthrex has a 10 millimeter as well in case you, one doesn't want to remove the cannula for graft passage. 
So that's done. Tushar, watch. Um, yeah, so can we see that again? Tushar, hold. Okay. Yeah. Fine. Tushar. Thank you. So now we are going to, we have gone on to the graph station. We have taken the graph and we are going to pass it shortly. A pump, please. Okay, can you hold the camera for me? Good. Now, have we got the outside view of the graft? Thank you. Have you got it? Can you see, guys? Yes, yes, we okay. can see. So now, through the femoral side, so this is a tightrope uh, RT2 where you have tapes rather than sutures. So we're just going to pass that through. Okay, can, so now my assistant is just going to pull slowly, slowly. He's going to deliver the tapes out of the femoral uh, lateral cortex. Thank you, I like so. One second. Okay, there you go. Okay, now tape. Yeah. Can you see the outside view all, as well as the arthroscopy view? Hello, guys? Yes, yes. Ah, okay, so we're now passing the tightrope button, flipping it through. So we're going through now. You'll see the button coming across. Okay, till the, lay, till the mark, which is 45, slowly, slowly. Very good. Okay, great. And can you hold on to that? And again, this morning Mukesh showed a, a good way to ensure that the button is flipped. So I do the same thing. I swap the portal. I go on to the anteromedial portal. Yeah. Pump, please. Thank you. And I make sure that my button is flipped. So I, I visualize the socket and I give it a good pull from the outside. And, you know, it seems to be deployed. So then I go back to my anterolateral portal. Okay, great. And now, uh, can we hold? So please focus on the outer, outside image as well. So what we are going to do now, can you see the outside image? Guys, you, you can, can you see? Yes. Okay, so we've got the tightrope RT with the tapes and we've got this fiber tape by itself, which is the internal brace. Now there has to be differential uh, shortening, you know, because you don't want the tapes to be slack in the joint. So uh, can we hold this? Isko tenna loose karaita, they short karna. So I, uh, my, uh, the nurse holds the, uh, the tightrope RT with the tapes, which can be shortened, and I hold the fiber tapes, the internal brace. So as my assistant is shortening the tightrope loop on the femur, I, I tend to take the slack of the tapes as the graft is going in. Can you see the outside image? Yes. And we go till the 20 <laughs> millimeter mark on the femur. That's it, stop. So I can see that. And I've left that for the final tightening uh, at the end. So we've kind of shortened the fe femoral side. Now we are going on to the tibial side here. So tibial socket is here. So we are going to go there. Can we hold that? Can we have a Langen back, please? Now we just need to focus on the outside image. Can you see the outside image? Yes. OK. Rohit, can you hold this? Yeah, that's it. So I'm just going to now deliver the tapes through the tibial side in an anti-grade fashion. So I've delivered the tapes, okay. And now I'm just going to deliver the button through it. And the buttons come out, as you can see here. Yes. Okay, sir. great. Now relax, please. Thank you. Uh, can you please hold this? Thank you. So now I'm just going to make sure that the slack is taken off the tape on the tib on the uh, tibial side as well. So just hold this, please. Hold, Rohit, please hold this. Okay, so I've taken that. Okay, mosquito, please. Now I'm going to cycle the knee. Great. So we are just going to disconnect the scope from the sheath and cycle the knee a few times. 
सो तुम्ही जस्ट फक्त टेन्शन मध्ये धरून ठेवा हा खेचायचं नाही ओके कॅन यू सी दी आउटसाइड इमेज गाईस येस सो आय एम जस्ट मेकिंग शुअर आय हॅव द नॉर्मल हाय और सिमेट्रिकल हायपर एक्सटेन्शन अँड आय एम जस्ट गोन टू सायकल द नी नाव अ फ्यू टाइम्स Can we have the lights down here, please? Thank you. Great. So we'll look. Drill. Okay. So on the the tapes, the fiber tapes can be the. So let's just get the arthroscopy view. Just hold this, please. so we have not fixed the tibial side but you can see on the arthroscopic view that there is no notch impingement right yeah and it is right in the acl footprint on the tibial side okay now uh, coming back to the outside view two langen backs please rohit yeah rohit aapko zyada khinchna hai good so uh, you can see the uh, outside view we can see yeah so the tapes can be differentially fixed in maximum hyper extension so that they don't uh, restrict flexion uh, with a suture anchor a, a slightly economical way is that i just use it through the rt button so i'm just going to show you that way because obviously cost is important in our setups so what i do is that blue leading suture i have removed it and i just pass the tapes through the the vacant holes so to shall hold this please hold, hold good can you see that so and the the good thing is that this the end of the or the tail of the fiber tape is uh, you know uh, is very rigid so it passes through the eyelet very easily okay so can we hold that now i'm going to differentially tighten it okay so uh, that's it great so abhi tum ye dara tushar can you flex the knee to 30 degree great so i just shorten the are you guys seeing the outside view yes yes okay so the knee is in neutral Th- around 25 to 30 degrees of flexion and i just shorten the tight rope button on the tibia yeah thank you fantastic can we just wipe it dry so they can see it better can we focus inside yeah guys yes. you can yes. see that yeah. yeah so this is provisional tightening i've not done the final now i fix the tapes so the assistant hyper extends the knee and i i fix the tape in hyper extension on to the tight rope button yeah you can see that are you are we retracting adequately for the audience to see yes we can yeah, see so now, now and the leg is also in neutral rotation and maximum hyper extension yeah so i'm just going to tie then can we have a new mop please or a gauze thank you yeah so i'm just fit tapes you just need three knots you don't need six like the fiber wires so three knots and then i just cut it can i have a tape cutter please you can use a knife or a dedicated cutter can we retract so the audience can see better thank you yeah great so we're just passing it through the cutter and uh, just leaving a little bit of the tail so that's cut could you guys see that yes we can okay see. so now we tighten the tibial we fix the tibial side so around 25 degrees of knee flexion neutral rotation um and now i'm going to fix the tibial side of the tight rope
Kato, please. Do we need to uh, take these uh, knots? So, because it's an adjustable loop, one of the criticisms is that it will uh, loosen up as the, you know, the knee flexes and extends. So, if you tie a knot, you have converted an adjustable loop into a fixed loop. Right? You've used the advantage of the adjustable loop so that if you have a shorter graft, you can, uh, you know, and also you don't want, you want sockets than tunnels. So, can, can I have the Langen back, please? Let's show the audience the tibial side fixation. So, do you do it on the femoral side as well? Yeah, good point. Uh, I don't, but uh, one can do so. So, you can see here the, the tight rope tapes and the fiber tape has been fixed onto the tibial button. Now, at this stage, I also check the... Yeah, so the Lackman is fine. And, the, you know, the hyperextension is there. We can fix the tape independently with a suture anchor. Now, I'm just going to wash the knee out and then do the final tightening. Pump, please. Shiva, please. Thank you. Keep it, keep the shaver away from the graft. Just washing the knee out. Okay, and uh, one second. Can, can we put the lights off so that, yeah. Okay. Can you have a gauze please to clean the scope? Looks a little blurred. Thank you. Okay. Pump, please. Okay, so just to show you again that there is no notch impingement. Okay, it's right in the footprint. And now we do the final tightening, which is the advantage of the adjustable loop. So we'll flex the knee to 90. Have you got the outside image? Yes, yes. Okay, so we are now flexing the knee to 90 to do the final tightening. Can I have the probe, please? Pump, please. Okay, good. So can we do the one second? Yeah, final tightening, please. So this is a, a, a nice advantage of the adjustable loop devices. So can you pump, please, pump, Rohit? Good. So you see it's nice and taut, and the tapes are within the strands of the hamstring autograft. They are not outside, so the concern with abrasion of the cartilage uh, is eliminated. So this is an all inside uh, uh, internal brace augmentation of a hamstring autograft uh, using the graft link uh, technique. You're pretty much done. I'm going to just wash the knee and close. Any Thank questions, you. please uh, fire away. Mukesh? Sandeep, yes. Rajiv, yep. Sachin, any questions, if he's still there? He's here. So what about tying the knot at the... Uh, femoral uh, side? Femoral side, yeah, to knot pusher? Y yes, Rajiv, one can definitely do that. Mm. I don't do it. Mm. Um, I'm not sure how much difference it makes. But yes, that would be an added <laughs> benefit to ensure that uh, there is no few millimeters of... Uh, loosening of the adjustable loop. And what are your indications as for internal bracing? When do you plan for internal bracing? Uh, young patients, uh, smaller diameter grafts, um, that's pretty much it. Revision surgery. Your role, your indication for ALL in primary? Sorry, my indication for? ALL in primary ACL. Um, Primary ACL would be a hyperextension of the knee and um, a professional athlete involved in pivoting sports. That's it. Okay. Yeah, Dr. Shreyas, uh, you, you have tightened this uh, graft finally in 90 degrees of flexion. So my question was, will it hinder the extension or uh, will it achieve a full range of motion? Yeah, do you want me to show it? Uh, I can do so now. Yeah, just. Normally, yeah. uh, final tightening so we do want it the, 30 degrees uh, of flexion or sure. so. Sure. 
Is the outside view of the leg good enough for me to show you that? Or? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So can we put Rahit? Right. So I will show you. So while we are in 90 degrees flexion, we can see that it is going into complete flexion. Are you able to appreciate that? Yeah. Okay. And also it's going into uh, a normal hyperextension. So we haven't over constrained the knee. Okay. Any, any more clarifications or any doubts? Is, does that answer your question or demonstrate? Amit. Yeah, so we, have, uh, we got the message that finally, though uh, normally we tighten the knee at uh, final fixation at 30 degrees of flexion. Yes. So by tightening at 90 degrees, it doesn't hinder. My question to Sachin, if, sir, yeah. your comments. No, no, this is a very nice technique that he has demonstrated. However, I have uh, not much experience of doing uh, all inside ACL. I am happy with my standard doing a full socket on the tibia. No, no, every, everybody. And so far, I have not seen the need to change in any way, but uh, I am not used to retensioning at 90 degrees, certainly. Okay. But this is a different way of doing it. It's a different graft. It's a closed loop system, which has got, uh, you know, it's all here. Uh, Dr. Gajjar, one question. How do you resist yourself from over-tensioning with graft? Because you have the capacity to go on tensioning it. How do you resist it? Yeah, so the, the so I think in a way that answers the question at whether in 90 degrees is it okay to do so. Because in extension you can over-tension the graft and shorten it. Whereas in 90 degrees flexion you will leave a little bit of uh, physiological slag. And um, also we have the five millimeters of play to ensure that, you know, we don't uh, leave a loose uh, intra-articular portion of the graft. Nice demonstration, Dr. Shres. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, the entire Grace Hospital team, Dr. Pankaja, anesthetist, um, Neha and Ninad, and the entire OT team, uh, my assistants, Rohit and Tushar, uh, the nursing staff, and everybody. Thanks very much. It's a wonderful setup. And it was a pleasure and thank you for this opportunity. I'm just going to close up. Thanks, Shreyas. Thanks thank a lot. You. Excellent demo. So we'll be closing here now. I sincerely thanks all the delegates who came all the way from Bhopal, Raipur, Bilaspur, Akola, Amrauti, Yavatmal, and all other places, Bhilaidur. Without participation from you guys, this would have not been possible. And I must say, it was a good interactive audience. So hope to see you all again soon. Thanks a lot to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your help. I'll request all to join for GOOF photograph. <laughs>